Time and adversity are like a huge blade. They cut through the old and new civilizations. And now in this wasteland, human civilization survives. Huge fortress walls have been erected, but order continues to erode. There was a lot of human technology before the disaster. So why is it all gone now? Why is the whole legacy of the past civilization gone? Of course, there is no way that absolutely everything could disappear. These technologies, like firearms that are far more powerful than they appear at first glance, are in the hands of the few inside these high walls. When disaster strikes, survival is a prerequisite. This new world is filled with danger and cruelty. Everyone who lives outside the wall inevitably comes face to face with the breath of death. But also of those who live inside, not everyone knows peace and satiety. Now, as in ancient times, people must risk their lives to gain sustenance and earn from fate the right to live. What for them outside the walls is their first weapon in the face of danger? What can they counter the inevitable painful demise from the clutches of the creatures that have filled this world and from the deadly hunger that has swept over the human race like a wave? Do you wish to unlock your shackles? The forest outside the wall. The time is nearing evening. The simplest game trap with bait inside is placed on the ground. Bad luck. Before the prey arrived, it rained acid rain. If this guy doesn't bring any prey today, he and Liu Yuan will starve to death. Even an ordinary sparrow will do. At that moment, high in the air, the hunter heard the wing flapping of a large bird. Oh great, the sparrow has really flown in. Compared to before the disaster, the sparrows have been greatly transformed by various mutations. Now they look more like crows. However, because there are no longer any survivors of the catastrophe, the name of the bird remains the same. Suddenly, a bird flying in the sky noticed a human silhouette below it, standing motionless in place. At the same second, the sparrow changed its direction of flight and rushed towards the silhouette at a great speed. Noticing that the bird had detected him and was heading for him, the guy snapped out of his seat. The sparrow swept its sharp claws past the young man as he managed to bounce and dodge the attack. Running up to the trap he had recently constructed, he immediately grabbed the cast iron ladle designed for catching game in his hand. Taking the weapon in his left hand, the guy turned to face the bird of prey and rolled on his feet on the slippery ground for a couple of meters by inertia. The sparrow immediately flapped its wings and pounced on the young man like an arrow. The predator was much faster than the hunter had expected, and so he didn't have time to react in order to dodge perfectly. Despite the fact that the bird had caught his right arm with its claws, inflicting a rather deep wound, the guy still managed to hit the raptor with a cast iron ladle with a swing. From the power of the attack he delivered, the sparrow flew back a few meters, falling to the ground. While the bird tried to roll over from its back, the young man, putting his weapon behind his back, immediately pounced on the enemy. The very next second, he grabbed the predator by the neck with his hand, pinning it to the ground with all his might. With a clenched fist, the guy broke the sparrow's cervical vertebrae, killing it instantly. With a relieved exhale and rubbing his cheek with his hand, the young man is glad that after waiting all night, he has finally gotten something. It's not too late. And so, slinging his prey over his shoulder, the hunter decides to just head to Lao Wang's store to sell the bird. Judging by the catch, he will be able to exchange it for about a couple days' rations. But no sooner had he taken a couple of steps than the young man's head began to splinter. Falling to his knees and writhing in pain, the guy, trembling, doesn't understand why this is happening now. Usually it happened at midnight, but this time it's much earlier. This has been happening regularly since the day he escaped from the wolves. People in town said it was just a headache, but he knows everything. It's not a simple pain. It's a feeling of pure chaos. As he starts to fall into oblivion, the guy realizes something is wrong. Wait, what's going on? Surprised to open his eyes and look at his hand, the young man can't understand why he's still conscious this time. As he falls to the cold ground facing the sky, he notices the sun's rays breaking through the purple clouds. Covering his face with his hand from the bright light, the lad rises to his feet and sees something majestic before him. Ahead of him loomed a huge dark palace. As he got closer, the young man noticed something strange. Despite the dazzling brightness of this place, this particular palace was enveloped by an unknown dark matter. In front of the guy are huge wooden doors leading into the unknown. Who knows what lies behind them? Without a shadow of a doubt, the young man pushes them with his hands. Inside, he sees a most magnificent structure. All the walls and columns are made of dark marble decorated with gold engraving. Placing his right hand on the hilt of his dagger, the boy cautiously began to look around this strange but beautiful place. There are dark wood cabinets all around, and in the center of this room stands a small round table with a typewriter on it. It is from this table that the most ominous aura emanates. What is this machine and why is it here? 
How and why did the guy get into this mysterious dimension in the first place? While he was trying to find answers to these questions, his head began to ache unbearably again. Suddenly, high in the sky amidst the pouring acid rain, a loud thunder rang out and a red thunderstorm flashed in the distance. The stranger sitting behind the tree at this time smiles eerily. This man saw among the trees a guy lying unconscious with a huge sparrow in his hands. Waking up, lying on the ground, the boy slowly opened his eyes. He was surprised that he had regained consciousness so quickly this time. Realizing where he was, the agitated young man raised himself sharply. This is really bad! The rain was getting heavier, so he had to get out of here quickly. As the young man shaking himself off rises from the ground, an armed man approaches him quietly from behind, stepping out from behind the trees. Swinging his bone dagger, the man yelled loudly, demanding that he hand over his prey. The next second, the man tasted the cast iron ladle the guy had used to smash him in the cheek, knocking out a tooth. As the guy runs away from the scene, covering his head from the rain with a bucket, the man holding his cheek doesn't understand how this happened. Why was he the victim? What has this dude been through? He's so strong and his movements are so fast. Suddenly, a window with a task popped up in front of the fleeing young man. An unknown force demanded that the loot be handed over to a stranger. As he tries to figure out what the hell is going on, he stares at the strange apparition in bewilderment. Nothing like this had ever appeared in front of his face before. The poor man, who recently received a severe blow to the face, is holding his cheek as he tries to hold back his tears. The moment the thunderstorm flashed, he turned around and saw a monster with a cast iron ladle, standing right in front of him, blood thirstily staring at him. While the victim is screaming hysterically, the friendly guy, holding out the dead bird to him, wonders if the man needs that sparrow. Sobbing with fear and looking at him questioningly, the frightened man shouts that he really wants that bird. Here you go. Shoving the sparrow into his hands, the boy muttered grudgingly. The delighted man, no longer holding back tears of joy, stares enchanted at the bird in his hands. A window popped up in front of the young man standing next to him. An unknown force informed him that the task had been completed. At that second, in another dimension, where the dark palace is located, a piece of white paper flies towards the table standing in the center. As it flew up to him, the paper itself fit into the lectern of the typewriter, securely locked there. The machine immediately printed a test on the sheet. It said that for completing the task, the guy was rewarded with a basic skill copying scroll that allowed him to learn other people's abilities. After reading the same thing in the window hanging in front of him, he wonders what the skill could mean. Could the guy really use it to learn other people's skills? Such as hunting? Or maybe survival? The man sitting next to him interrupts his musings. Taking the boy by his cloak, he tearfully thanks him and marvels at what a good man he is. Turning his attention back to him, the guy took a strange look at what he was holding in his hands. No way! You'll never get it even if you want it! He shouted, snatching the sparrow from the hands of the petrified man. In the next shot, the guy is already running off into the trading city with the loot on his shoulder, leaving the dazed man behind to fend for himself. Holy shit! What kind of person are you? This world is definitely going down the drain. A couple of hours later, a guy leisurely approaches the settlement, carrying a huge sparrow on his shoulder. There is a majestic wall with a small market town in front of it. The people living in the small settlement in front of the city wall live poor like most other people in the world. After entering this town, the young man still continues to walk slowly, unhurriedly, to the merchant's shop. A crowd of stout men watch enviously as the guy arrives with a good catch. The gray-haired man, whispering in his bald comrade's ear, remarks that this kid has come in with the loot again. As he passed them, the young man put his hand on the hilt of his dagger, preparing to stab his assailant if necessary. As they get closer to each other, incredible tension begins to build. People are willing to kill each other for food in this world. That's why strength is almost the only way to survive. Noticing the man looking at his prey, the boy glared at him with disdain in his eyes. Just as the gray-haired man decided to start a fight with the brat, he was grabbed from behind by a bald comrade by the shoulder. He asks the man to forget about it and not to contact him. The guy passes on without conflict while the two men stare at him embitteredly. No one dares to go near that young man. He's sick in the head. Once past this tense situation, the hunter walks deep into the settlement. Turning in one of the alleys, he enters a merchant's shop. Throwing the sparrow on the counter with a clatter, the lad asks the merchant how much he would give for the carcass. The frightened merchant asks the young man to be careful. The man asks from now on not to throw his prey so carelessly on such expensive glass. The guy gave the merchant an irritated glance and tisked unhappily. While the merchant weighed the bird, 
the young man wandered around the shop with not much interest and looked at the assortment. Putting the weights on the scale, the merchant finally learned the final weight of the sparrow. After drawing Xiao Su's attention, the merchant told the hunter that the weight of the prey was 3 kilograms and 600 grams. Taking the bills in his hands, the man, under Xiao Su's surprised gaze, begins to run his fingers over them at lightning speed. Finished, the vendor says that market prices are good now. Sparrows are 200 a kilo, so that makes a total of 700. The irritated young man immediately says it's too little too late. Adjusting his glasses, the merchant looks at the boy unhappily. With one deft move, moving the knuckle count, the man says the maximum he can give for this bird is only 800. There really isn't enough meat in the barrage, but everything has a price, and they have to live by the rules. Suddenly slipping his fingers between the knuckles of the bill and pressing them against the rack, the irritated hunter explains that it's almost winter and sparrows are scarce these days. Below 900 is out of the question. The stubborn merchant folded his arms and shook his head, unwilling to agree to such unfavorable terms. A second later, Xiao Su is already on the doorstep of the shop, preparing to go outside. The dumbfounded merchant asks the guy where he's going. In response, the hunter explained that he was going to go to Old Li and ask him for his price. Blocking his way, the man asks the guy to wait a bit. Maybe they can come to an agreement. The merchant kindly asks how much he wants to sell the bird for. Xiao Su looks at him blankly and says he'll find out the price first, and then they'll get back to it. Didn't you just say 900? 900 is 900? You don't want to delay Liu Yuan's tuition fees. With a friendly smile, the merchant agreed. He didn't say this to the young man, but the whole thing is that someone from behind the wall came to him today to buy a game. He can't let old Li take advantage of that. Frozen in place and holding the sparrow in his hand, Xiao Su asked the man what he said at the end. You don't want to delay, right? Having said that, the broadly smiling merchant fell silent. Looking at him emotionlessly, the guy asked his interlocutor to continue. Sweating with nerves, the merchant once again asked the young man what his price was. 1,200, Xiao Su said slyly, squeezing the dead sparrow in his hand contentedly. He demanded the man answer only yes or no. If not, he would go to Old Li. A couple minutes later, the merchant was already counting out bills to pay the well-deserved fee for the goods. After counting to 1,198, the merchant noticed that he had run out of bills. Crumpling them in his hands irritably, the man gives the money to Xiaos, explaining that it's all he has. After turning around and counting the money, the satisfied guy tells the man not to worry. As the sobbing merchant breathes his last breath, Xiao Su explains that he can return the money tomorrow. Holding the bills in his hands, the young man notices something interesting in the assortment. Pointing his finger at the annoyed merchant's head, the guy asks to get the jacket hanging on top. It's just right for Liu Yuan. The merchant, folding the jacket neatly, asks Xiao Su if he would like to buy one for himself. He knows the price. It would only cost 490 for him. The worried man explains that he doesn't carry jackets that often, so if the guy doesn't buy one now, he might get sick in the winter. Saying that he wasn't cold, the young man asked how much the anti-inflammatory drugs cost. The seller explained that one capsule costs 210. This medicine is taken for three consecutive days. He could give three capsules to Xiao Su for 620. He would also give him one dose of iodine as a gift. Looking at his wound left by the sparrow, the boy asked the merchant to forget about it. There are usually no inflammations in winter. After giving the jacket to Xiaos, the man asks the next time he catches a sparrow not to kill it. There are noble people outside the wall who want to keep it for fun. The boy agrees, but warns that it will be more expensive. Early evening, the hut where Xiao Su lives. Pulling back the curtain, the guy steps inside. Upon entering the hut, the young man greets his younger brother, writing something in a notebook. The boy is very happy that his brother is finally back from hunting. Taking a seat next to him, Xiao Su asks his little brother how his homework is going. Yuan replies that everything is fine. However, he feels that listening to the school teacher is not as useful as following his brother on a hunt. The boy asks the brooding fellow when he can watch him on the hunt. Without looking him in the eye, Xiao Su explains that he could be killed at any moment while hunting. Wouldn't it be better for him to go to school and study physics and chemistry than to hunt? Knowledge is the most important thing. 
The thing is, in this trading town, no matter how messy things are, no one will harass the teaching staff. Resting his hand on the ground and slowly standing up, the guy thinks it's a shame that teaching costs so much. Otherwise, he would have been happy to go and listen to it himself. Heading towards the campfire, Xiao Su tells the boy that he saved some of the giblets before selling the sparrow, and so they can be used to make soup. As the young man took the giblet roll in his hand, his excited younger brother noticed a deep gash on his arm. Putting the meat in the heated ladle, the guy explained that it was just a scratch. After a while, dinner was ready. Xiao Su carefully poured the soup into the plate with his chopsticks. Holding out the giblet soup to the boy, the boy asked him to have a good meal. Pushing the plate away with his hands, Yuan says he won't. After all, it's brother who has to eat, he needs to recover. When Xiao Su replied that he wasn't hungry and asked him to just eat some soup, his brother tearfully said again that he wouldn't. And it wasn't some scratch at all after all. The boy had heard that two days ago, someone had died of an infection. Not understanding what the tears are for, the older brother angrily threw the bowl of soup on the table. He asks Yuan to understand that they cannot shed tears in this world. This world hasn't believed in tears for a long time. Xiao Su asks his brother to look at these people around them. What if someone comes at night and stabs them to death because Yuan doesn't eat enough? The guy sent him to school because the boy has an aptitude for it. And if he does well in school, he won't have to go into the wasteland early in the morning to earn a living as a young man. After these words, the younger brother sat down resentfully at the table with his head down over his bowl of soup. Trying to hold back tears, Yuan began to eat the giblets with his chopsticks. Patting his frustrated brother on the head, Xiao Su observes that usually when they go out together, the boy is pretty darn smart and cunning. But as soon as they get home, he acts like a crybaby. The boy asks Yuan to have a good meal and then try on the jacket he bought him. Looking at him, the boy asked where his brother's jacket was then. Dodging the question, Xiao Su smiled happily, explaining that he wanted to rest. As he lay down on the bed, the situation he had been in today in the forest immediately came to his mind. What was this palace he had seen today? After thinking for a bit, the boy fell into a sound sleep. Abruptly opening his eyes, he realized something was wrong. As he stood up and looked around, he realized he was back in this strange dimension. Rising to his feet, Xiao Su noticed that the dark palace had reappeared. Without a moment's hesitation, the young man immediately headed for the huge doors which this time were completely open. Stepping inside, the boy looked around. Indeed, everything was the same as it had been before. As he approached one of the walls, he stretched out his hand and tried to touch it. As expected, this palace is almost completely intangible if you exclude some elements. Is it really all in his head? Turning around, Xiao Su slowly headed towards the center of the room. As he approached the typewriter, the young man noticed a piece of paper that wasn't here last time. Taking the sheet, he flipped it over and realized it was the basic skill copying scroll he was supposed to receive for completing today's task. Then, glancing at the typewriter on the table, something interesting caught the guy's eye. The keyboard was engraved with many hieroglyphics such as justice, integrity, honesty, trust, friendship, and goodwill. Does this place insinuate that Xiaos needs to be a good person in a world where morality is an unacceptable luxury? No. Rolling the sheet in his hand into a scroll, he realized that this was definitely not going to work out. Deep in the night, a girl dressed in white walks alone down the street of the settlement. Carefully pulling back the curtain, she quietly enters the cabin. Once inside, she sees a long extinct fire and a carefree Xiao Su sleeping on the bed. Feeling the sharp knife at her throat, the girl froze in place. When she saw the armed child, she looked at him, trembling, horrified. Sister Xiao Yu? With a surprised look at the girl, Yuan uttered. When the boy removed the knife from her throat, Yui wondered why he was still awake. The child, answering nothing, looked at her with disdain. Leaning toward him, the girl asked where Xiao Su was. She had heard rumors that the boy was injured. Slipping the dagger into its scabbard, Yuan walks over to the table, saying that a sparrow has wounded his brother in the arm. Clasping her hands to her chest, the girl glanced worriedly at the young man lying on the bed. Xiao Su sleeps quietly, lying facing the wall, and does not react in any way to the fact that an intruder has entered the hut. Reminding Sister Yu that she was eight years older than his brother, the boy sitting at the table explained that that was why she didn't need to get so attached to this guy. The girl is very offended by his words. After all, she thinks of them as brothers. Unable to find the words to answer her, the child simply turned away grudgingly. Still standing on the doorstep, the girl says it's time for her to go home and asks Yuan to tell her brother that she stopped by when he wakes up. Yui then turned around and walked out of the hut. When the boy lost sight of her, 
He rose from the table and headed for the exit as well. Sitting down on the threshold of the house, Yuan took out a dagger from its sheath and began to observe everything going on around him. Don't constantly bully Sister Xiao Yu. She's having a hard time as it is. A voice came from the hut. Glancing at his brother who had risen from the bed, Yuan explained that this girl was not clean. He saw her smoking the other day. Cigarettes are only given out in factories outside the walls. Maybe she got it from some savage. It seems to him that she got close to Chao Su because the latter could always hit prey when hunting. Who's clean? The boy said, chagrined. After getting out of bed, the young man explains to his brother that if one wants to survive in this world, he cannot stay pure. It's all imposed by life. He asks the boy to just keep his distance with her, not bully her. When his older brother approached him, Yuan agreed. While Xiao Su takes a seat next to him, the boy asks his brother why he is awake. Can't he really sleep? Looking up at the starry sky, the young man explains that he has a lot to think about. He tells Yuan that maybe he has some abilities too. He's not quite sure about that yet. He'll have to try it later to be sure. After these words, he fell silent and looked thoughtfully at the night sky. In the city, they say that some people have special abilities, but he didn't believe it before. Only after meeting Liu Yuan did the guy believe it a little. The day they went hunting together, the boy wished with all his might to strike his prey. As it is, its ability is luck. However, having made a wish, the opposite effect will follow, and there will always be some minor illness or calamity. The younger brother sitting next to him points to the sky and shows Xiao Su the shooting stars. An odd number of stars fell that night. Taking the boy's hands in his own, the boy asked him not to make any wishes. It might come true again. Continuing to look at the firmament, Yuan asks his older brother why the shooting stars are flying so fast. What if someone is too late to make a wish? Putting his hands behind the back of his head, Xiao Su said that there's nothing to think about. They fly fast because they don't want to hear any wishes. The next day, rural school. The teacher standing at the blackboard says that the next topic of the lesson will be about technology in the age of civilization. Holding a book in his hand, he asks the students if they know what the term technology means. While his classmates are chatting, Yuan, yawning, replies that he doesn't know that. The annoyed teacher asks them to be quiet and listen carefully. Xiao Su watches the lesson with interest from the window. Leafing through the book, the teacher is going to explain to the children by example what technology is. As the lesson came to an end, everyone in the class fell silent when they saw someone's head sticking out of the window. The teacher closed the book with a slam. A man announces lunch break, advising the students to go home and eat. Immediately after these words, he abruptly shifted his gaze to the window. But Xiao Su was already gone. Standing against the wall of the school, the boy noticed a teacher approaching him. Standing in front of him, the man said that from this day forward, Xiao Su could stand and listen to the lesson by the door. However, he was not allowed to enter the classroom. Admiring such generosity, the young man bowed to him. Raising his head, the boy smiled happily and thanked the instructor. Food cooked in a cast iron cauldron is ready. Having poured soup from this cauldron into his bowl, the teacher blows gently on it so as not to burn himself. At this moment, Xiao Su holds out a cigarette to the man, thanking him once again for letting him stand at the door and listen to the lesson. When the surprised instructor accepted the gift, the boy added that the man had allowed him to listen to the lesson at the door, and so he had to show his appreciation since he hadn't paid the tuition. Taking out a small box, the teacher lit a match. Inhaling the cigarette smoke, the man leaned against the wall of his school in satisfaction. Smoking a cigarette, the teacher remarks that, in their troubled times, there aren't many students who listen as attentively as Xiao Su. He asks the boy why he enjoys attending class so much. The young man thoughtfully explains that learning something new is never a bad thing. Also, teachers are the most respected in this troubled world. Pointing his finger at the vegetable garden, the boy says that no one would dare steal, for example, the vegetables in the teacher's yard. And even though they grow right here, that statement made the man cough. Turning to him, Xiao Su says that he has been bothered by one question for a long time. With a glance at him, the instructor asks him not to be shy and to ask. The kid reminds the teacher of what he said in the last class. Before the disaster, there was a lot of technology available to mankind, right? But why did it all disappear? Lack of offspring? The interlocutor replied briefly, exhaling another puff of cigarette smoke. Since the catastrophe period, humanity was lucky enough to survive. They just didn't have time to worry about learning. A surprised Xiao Su remarks that it was always possible to retain some information, wasn't it? It couldn't be that absolutely everything could just pick up and disappear. 
Nodding sadly, the teacher said that the boy was indeed right, except that this information is in the hands of a few, and these people are behind this high wall separating them from the wastelands and the rest of the dangerous world. An indignant Xiaosu asks the man why then people don't tear down that wall. Most beasts are afraid to attack a group of humans, and as long as they live together, even without this wall, the wolves wouldn't dare to make a move. Not to mention that destroying the wall would allow a lot of technology to be released so that civilization could be rebuilt. The teacher explains to the young man that as long as there is danger in the wasteland, the stragglers will live at the Wall of Refuge. There will be plenty of cheap labor at the wall, and the consortium behind the wall will keep it from collapsing. How can stakeholders behind the wall abandon this natural class barrier? Putting out the cigarette with his fingers, the man decides to leave the half to smoke next time. When the teacher said it was time for them to go to class, he noticed that the guy immediately blocked his view from view, so the teacher could safely hide his cigarette. After buttoning his jacket, the teacher said that he would go and change his clothes, because his clothes smelled like smoke. It wouldn't be good if the students could smell it. Standing behind him, Xiaosu noticed that the man didn't really care about it when the guy just inhaled that smoke. The teacher didn't even tell him to step aside. At that moment, an unknown force announces the beginning of a new task. The pursuit of knowledge is never easy, but what you learn, you will teach in the future. A few minutes later, upon entering the classroom, the teacher went straight to his workstation. When all the disciples had settled into their seats, they saw Chao Su standing on the doorstep. Coughing a little, the teacher tells his students that this afternoon will be a survival lesson. He warns the children not to think that danger is far away. Their parents are protecting them now, but when they become adults, they will have to learn to protect themselves. After a few minutes of the lesson, the instructor moves on to another topic and suggests talking about what to do if you encounter a wolf pack in the wild. Pointing his finger at one of the students, he asks him to tell him what he should do when he encounters wolves in the wild. The surprised Xiao Su, still standing on the threshold, gestures to ask if it was him who was just asked. Thoughtfully lowering his head, unless you're really lucky enough to encounter wolves in the wild, the guy advises trying to pick an upland area. When the young man set about the high ground with an open view and a tailwind, the teacher nodded contentedly. A place like this would be a wonderful cemetery for you, and all according to feng shui, shouted Xiao Su joyfully, showing a thumbs up. The teacher skewed in surprise at such a strange and pessimistic answer. After these words, there was a sepulchral silence in the classroom, and everyone present looked at the boy with shame. As he stands there, the young man can't understand why the task was not completed. He didn't seem to have taught him anything wrong. Trying to dilute the atmosphere, the teacher coughed a little. Realizing that the man was waiting for an explanation from him, Xiao Su continued speaking. He explained to the teacher that he had probably never seen a wolf, let alone a pack. Even with one wolf, there was little chance of survival, so it was better to find a good place for a grave right away. Astonished at such a statement of thought and his experience, the man looked in surprise at the guy standing in the aisle. From then on, he allowed the young man to sit in the classroom and listen to the lessons. However, from now on, the survival lessons would be taught by Xiaosu himself. Looking at him admiringly, the boy thanked the teacher for the opportunity. At the same moment, the assignment given out recently ended. As a reward for completing the task, an unknown force gave the guy one unit of strength. Looking at his arm, Xiaosu actually felt an increase in muscle strength. It seems that the palace is not just a figment of his imagination. It really does have a special power. The strength value of an adult male was three units. Xiaosu used to have two and a half units. But if he adds the reward to the one unit he just received, that works out to more than the average adult. This way, his chances of survival in the wild will be even better. He was distracted from his musings by his younger brother walking home with him. Yuan questions the guy about why Mr. Zhang allowed him to attend school and offered to be a survival teacher. Maybe he wants to make Xiaosu his successor? Upon reflection, the guy replies that it's unlikely. Most likely, this man just doesn't have enough cigarettes. While his brother stares at him incomprehensibly, Xiao Su leans over to him and explains that being a teacher is not a bad thing. When he becomes a real teacher, he will pass the position to Yuan. Turning around and spreading his hands, the lad added that after all, the wilderness was more native to him. He's always like that. If he has something good, he immediately passes it on to Yuan. The boy looks sadly at his older brother. Xiao Su continues to pursue the same line. He explains to Yuan that it is good to be a teacher and that he must study hard and develop himself every day to become a worthy and intelligent person in the future. Noticing his brother lagging behind, the guy turned around and asked what was wrong. Holding out his little brother's hand, he asked him to keep up. 
Running up to the young man, the boy apologized and said he was on his way. Holding hands, they headed home together. Walking to their hut, the two pass a crowd of armed men who have come out from behind the wall and are heading into the wasteland. One man, nonchalantly pacing beside his companion, resents being asked to go to Mount Jing, even though he wanted to take a few days of vacation. With a glance at them, Xiao Su realized that these people were mercenaries. The man walking next to the disgruntled man says that they should first run into the merchant Wang and try to find someone who can show them the way. So they're going to Jing Mountain? This group of mercenaries from behind the wall don't have enough combat experience. Isn't it just suicide to rush into the wasteland like this? Trying to ignore them, Xiao Su walks further, passing by the armed girl. When she was behind him, the guy turned around dumbfounded. This girl, she gives off the vibe of a wild beast of the wasteland. Looking after them, Yuan asks his older brother if he thinks Merchant Wang would recommend him as a guide. Everyone in the market town knows that the guy is familiar with the wilderness. Xiao Su explains indifferently that one can usually enter the Jing Mountain area on one's own two feet and leave with one's feet forward. Whoever wants to go, let them go. But the young man won't go. There is something strange about this group of people, and so it is best to avoid them. Late afternoon, commercial city in front of the wall. Pulling back the curtain, Xiao Su and his younger brother walked back to the hut together. Concerned Yuan asks the guy how his arm is. Is it okay? Turning around, the young man says that everything is fine, but the worried brother asks him not to lie to him. He noticed even yesterday how Chiao Su was trying to hold on through strength. Relaxedly stretching, the boy asks his younger brother not to worry. He's not going to play with his life. Did this Ren Chiao Su really escape from the wolves alive? A puzzled voice from outside suddenly said. Hearing this not far from their home, the brothers turned around abruptly. In that same second, they ducked and began to act quieter grabbing their daggers. After hiding, Xiao Su looked out through a gap in the wall. The head of the mercenary squad asks Wang Fugui what he meant by saying that this guy is sick in the head. Calming him down, the merchant explains that it's fine and it won't hurt. This young man is not that seriously ill. Here they are already at the place. This peddler Wang had actually brought this group of mercenaries to his house and decided to set Xiao Su up with these people. As he approached the entrance, the merchant asked the guy to step out, saying he had guests. A tense Yuan asks his brother what he should do now. Xiao Su asks him to stay home while the young man himself goes outside to solve the problem. Hanging a cast iron ladle behind his back and then pulling back the curtain, the enraged guy walks out to the uninvited guests. Congratulations, Mr. Wang. Your father and son are safe. Six kilograms and six hundred grams, he shouted, suddenly grabbing the merchant's hands. To be smart is to pretend to be dumb in time. Without realizing what just happened, everyone in the room stares at the weirdo in a daze. One of the mercenaries asks Wang Fugui what kind of father and son this guy is talking about. Maybe he meant capital and interest? After realizing that this was some nonsense, he yelled at the merchant, saying that this schizo was definitely sick. What the hell did he just say? Grabbing the merchant by the scruff of the neck and pointing his finger at the young man, he yells that this dude is definitely sick and Wang says everything is fine. The mercenary threatens the merchant with death if he continues to lie so brazenly. Blowing off steam, the man walks out of here while Wang tries to stop him, explaining that Ren Xiaosu might be sick, but not that sick. Xiaosu, do you want me dead? Sobbing, the merchant shouted, looking at the indifferently whistling guy. After these words, the merchant ran off with the mercenaries, asking for time to find the right man for the job. The head of the squad gave him until dawn, and insistently asked for no such shit. A mysterious girl armed with a sniper rifle had been weaving behind the group the whole time. Turning around, she looked at the crazy guy standing behind her eerily but with interest. Noticing Xiao Su looking at her, the girl averted her gaze and walked on. Not realizing what it was, the guy just stares after her. Suddenly, an unknown force alerted Xiao Su that the necessary skills would be learned randomly. This means that his special ability copying skill works randomly, not by his will. As soon as there is an ability that can be copied within its range, the skill is activated. And now is the moment when the young man crossed paths with such a person. Randomly copied skill. Firearms. You want to learn it? Learn it! Shouted Xiao Su, dumbfoundedly looking at the window that popped up in front of him. At the same moment, he found himself in a dark palace. The skill data began to load. The guy began to receive such information as firearms care, checking their performance, wielding and other useful skills. 
These are all firearm skills, so he can really copy someone else's skills. Training success. You have mastered advanced firearms proficiency. When Xiaosu heard this, he was stunned. Wait, wasn't what the typewriter printed out to him back then a basic level scroll? Why did he study the advanced skill? There are two types of skill copying scrolls. A basic level scroll allows you to learn any skill up to an advanced level. A master level scroll allows you to learn the advanced and master skills of others once the wearer reaches an advanced level in one of his own skills. He also has a chance to study the target's supernatural abilities. It turns out he can even learn other people's supernatural abilities? Is that even normal? The guy gets to wondering what was the firearm's proficiency of the girl he copied the skill from. When the unknown force informed him that her level was perfect, the young man was greatly surprised. This girl is perfectly proficient in firearms. But why is she serving in a private army? There was really something wrong with this group of mercenaries. Brings Xiaosu to his senses with a strange sensation. Tugging on his older brother's cloak, Yuan wonders to the guy why he's been looking at this girl's back all this time. On whose back? Asked a rather familiar voice from a neighbor's shack. The boys turned around and saw Yu's sister. A surprised Xiaosu asked her what she was doing in his neighbor's house. Fixing her hair, the girl explained that she had switched with a family of three who had lived here before. In the future, she would move here and live with the boys in the neighborhood. Snuggling up to Xiaosu, Yuan remarks that this girl spent a lot of money on this. And after all, she used to live in a stone brick house. Brother, you're still a virgin, right? He inquired, whispering in the guy's ear. Grabbing his younger brother by the head, Xiao Su reminds him that the boy is old enough now, and so it's time for them to talk about this aspect of his education. A perplexed Yuan doesn't refuse and allows the boy to ask him about it if he doesn't know something. Still holding that little guy by the head, Xiao Su bids the girl a friendly goodbye and walks into the hut. The boy tells his younger brother not to talk about it anymore. They are barely afloat right now, so there's no need to try to connect them to Sister Yu. But at that moment, the young man notices something unusual. Yuan, pointing his finger under the chair, notices that there are two potatoes and what looks like pills hidden there. It's probably to treat an arm injury. Taking the jar of medicine in his hand, Xiao Su confirms that it is indeed an anti-inflammatory drug. He reminds his little brother how last year he had a run-in with the wolves and was injured. That time, too, someone had secretly planted some pills on them to keep him alive. The place where the pills were planted is exactly as it is now. He was trying to find this man. Yuan remarks that it couldn't have been Sister Yu who did this. After all, she didn't know about his injury last year. At that moment, a woman's scream was heard outside. Grabbing the girl's hand, the stranger, congratulating her on her housewarming, holds out a cigarette to her. A startled Xiao Yu says she won't do this kind of thing again. After starting to tear her clothes off, the man laughingly shouts that she will have nothing to eat and drink if she doesn't do such things. And who will give her cigarettes to feed her addiction? Realizing where this situation was going, Xiao Su immediately jumped out of the hut into the street. An unknown force has given him a mission again. The purpose of this new mission is to help. The irritated guy mused aloud that even without this assignment, he would have helped. In the same second, the young man snapped out of his seat and pounced on the pervert, pulling out a dagger from behind his back. The surprised man looked fearfully at his opponent attacking him. With a sly smirk, the bastard can't believe the little kid with the bone knife wants to stab him. In one motion, the man pulled a sharp sword from its sheath and held it out in front of him, showing that it was made of iron. But while he was flaunting his iron sword, Xiaosu had already run up to him and chopped his weapon in half with a sharp movement, also breaking his dagger. How is this possible? shouted the dumbfounded pervert, looking at the stump of his metal sword. At that moment, the guy threw his broken bone knife out of his hand. Abruptly grabbing the man's hand in which he was holding the broken sword, Shiosu delivered a lightning-fast punch with his second fist into his ribs. While his opponent is trying to recover from last night's attack, the cold-blooded guy runs behind his back without letting go of his hand. Not a moment later, the young man had his arm around his enemy and grabbed the man's head, sealing him face down into the ground with all his might. Somehow remaining conscious after such a blow, the pervert can't understand how this brat can be so strong at his age. Pinning the bastard to the ground, the young man asks Sister Yu who it is. The frightened girl said that the man was a foreman at a coal mine. A man was stabbed alive in a shopping town last night, and this man has claimed responsibility for it. Turns out that poor guy had a habit of saving money, and so it turned out that he owed the casino, and so this pervert decided to finish him off. The angered Xiao Su picked up a severed pointed piece of metal from the ground, 
Preparing to slit this man's throat, the infuriated guy fixed him comfortably. At that moment, an unknown force again gives the young man a new task. The goal is to leave the enemy alive. With a sharp movement, Xiao Su ripped open the flesh of the man writhing in agony, inflicting a deep wound in the kidney area. Getting to his feet, the guy explained to the man that he had about three minutes to spare. If he goes to a clinic in a market town and gets stitches, he might be able to survive. Trying to stop the blood with his hand, the man struggles to get to his feet. As soon as he stood up, he immediately rushed towards the clinic. Since both tasks had been completed, two basic skill copying scrolls were given as a reward. Also, since Xiao Su now lacked weapons, he automatically started the side quest. The first building should be the rescue of Sister Yu. But the young man can't believe that leaving the enemy alive was also a full-fledged mission. How did the damn palace make the decision? An agitated Yuan asks his older brother why he just let him go. What if he recovers and takes revenge on the guy? He's not a good person. Xiao Su, in turn, grinning, wonders to the boy if he still thinks the clinic in their trading city will heal his wounds. With a relieved exhale, Yuan was glad to see his brother so ruthless. Looking at the ground, Xiao Su noticed the wreckage of his knife. Raising the hilt, the guy glanced at the girl standing nearby. The frightened sister Yu with the torn dress is still trying to forget the recent attack. Can you quit smoking? Looking at her, the young man inquired. Grateful for the rescue, the girl began nodding her head vigorously. Xiao Su explains that these cigarettes are not highly addictive, but as he knows, they put addictive poppy seeds in them. Stabbing a broken dagger into the ground, he tells her that the merchant Wang had told him that the proportion of poppies there was very small. That is why a girl can quit smoking if she wants to. But I want to make something clear. Even though I'm very handsome, it's impossible between us. Xiao Su dazzlingly says, while holding his head and praising himself. Not realizing what it was just now, Sister Yu froze in place. Looking at the guy still standing in that ridiculous pose, the girl calmly mouthed that she was treating him like a brother. Ha 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 ha, that's it, how embarrassing! The young man laughed awkwardly, rubbing the back of his head. Grabbing his little brother and running back to the cabin, he accused him that it was because of his foolish talk. Looking after them, Sister Yu smiled and laughed. That night, Xiao Su once again found himself in a strange, dark palace. The keys on the typewriter keyboard began typing some text at breakneck speed. A side mission has been opened, and that's kind of interesting. Walking over to the typewriter, Xiao Su immediately snatched a piece of paper from it. The assignment stated that the side quest was given because the guy was now short on weapons. Taking a look at the scroll, the young man remarks that getting a weapon would be really nice. However, something about this assignment is disconcerting. To unlock a new weapon, you need to receive 100 sincere thanks. Thanks can also be used to exchange them for items. While he was reading this scroll, the typewriter started typing some text again. An acknowledgement was received from Li Xiaoyu. There are still 99 more to unlock the weapon. A commendation from Li Yu? The palace is quite accurate in its judgment. Xiao Su is glad that he saved a person who wasn't emotionless. Too bad you can't collect negativity instead of gratitude. In a few minutes, the whole town would have been filled with negativity towards the guy. It is deep in the night. Yuan sits at the table, guarding his brother's sound sleep. Liu Yuan, say thank you to me! Xiao Su suddenly shouted, jumping off the bed. The boy sitting in class is dumbfounded and asks what happened to his brother. So suddenly he was a little frightened. Giving him a nudge, Xiao Su told him not to worry and to hurry up and say it. Thank you for always taking care of me, Yuan said sincerely, lowering his gaze. At the same moment, the palace reported that the thanks from Yan Liu Yuan had been received. With a sly smile, Xiao Su didn't expect it to be so easy. Leaning across the table, the guy leaned over to his little brother and asked him to say it again. Not understanding what else he wanted from him, Yuan grudgingly thanked him again. But this time, the puzzled Xiao Su didn't get anything. Pointing his finger at his younger brother, he accused the boy of not being sincere when he said it. He asks to be sincere when he says such things. Sincere means, from the bottom of his heart. He asks Yuan to do it again. The boy shouts out words of thanks. The disgruntled young man standing next to him explains that his brother put little feeling into it and asks him to say it again. When Yuan bowed and uttered an extended thank you, Xiao Su explained that it was still wrong. He should be feeling emotions. When the younger brother tears up demonstratively, the guy remarks that this was exactly what was needed and asks him to try again. 
Several hours passed in such vain attempts to obtain a sincere thanks. A weary Yuan wondered to his brother if this was his ability. If so, it is not good for the kid's voice. The doomed Xiao Su sitting next to him realized that after half a night of work, he had only received one sincere thanks. Moving back to the palace, Xiao Su walks frustratedly over to the typewriter table, realizing that he should think of something else. Suddenly, out of nowhere, two silver coins fall on this table. Trying to figure out where it came from, the guy bent over them and looked up. Taking the coin in his hand, the young man examined it from all sides. One was engraved with the symbol of a heart. Flipping the coin over, he saw what was written on the back. I am grateful to you for being with me all my life, for giving me the courage to be who I am, grateful for sharing my destiny with me. For the flowers that bloom and fall, I will cherish them all. Suddenly, something strange appears behind Chiaosu's back. Turning around, he sees a small vending machine, shrouded in dark matter like the rest of this palace. As he gets a little closer, the guy tries to figure out what it's for. He's never seen one of these things before. After taking a closer look at the vending machine, the young man notices a small hole for coins. He decides to try to put one of his coins in there. At that moment, some kind of black jar fell out of the vending machine. Taking the jar in his hand and reading the label, Xiao Su realized that it was some kind of medicine. I'm just wondering if you could tell me what it's for. As he wondered this question, he abruptly began to be transported back to the real world. Once inside the hut, the boy was still sitting next to his little brother. However, this time he had that jar of medicine in his right hand. With a surprised look at him, Yuan asked what kind of magic this was. Why did his brother suddenly have a small bottle in his hand? This medicine bottle only has the word cure written on it. Is it a cure-all? Dipping his fingers into the ointment inside, Xiao Su realizes that he has no choice but to try it out. Clasping his eyes, the boy brought the unknown substance to his wound left from hunting a sparrow. Without delay, the young man begins to dab this medicine on the wound. Smearing it, Xiao Su realizes that what he's doing now is reckless. What if it's poison? After all, the character for medicine also means poison. After all, every medicine can become a poison in a large dosage. But as soon as he touched his skin with this substance, the boy realized that the wound no longer hurt. Anti-inflammatory medicine needs to be taken three days in a row, but this cream works in one sitting. One anti-inflammatory drug costs about 200. Then the cost of the ointment, if you round it up, is about a hundred million. The young man must think of a way to get as many thanks as possible. The next day, early in the morning, when the two came to school, the stunned teacher asked them what was wrong. My brother wanted to. Yuan, who looked like a dead man from lack of sleep, began to speak. Starting to squeeze his younger brother to make sure he didn't say too much, Xiao Su explained that there was nothing wrong with them, and they just didn't sleep well. The teacher asked the boy, if he had thought about what he was going to say today. After all, today was his first day as a teacher. A confident Xiao Su asked the man not to worry. They need to find a way to collect a whole bunch of thank you coins. But how to do it? Walking over to the teacher's desk, the guy asked the kids to stand up. As the students rose from their seats and greeted the teacher, Xiao Su had a brilliant thought. The first thing he started the lesson with was to ask the children if they thought it was difficult for teachers to give lessons. Everyone can sit in the classroom, but the teacher stands all day. Then shouldn't the students thank their teacher? The puzzled children agreed with his statement. Then they all looked at Mr. Jang sitting on the back desk, awkwardly adjusting his glasses. Then from now on, instead of greetings, you will thank your teacher, Xiao Su said seriously, thinking in his head what a genius he was. Raising his hand, the boy suggested that everyone try it right now. When he announced the beginning of the lesson, the students stood up and bowed and thanked the teacher. The bewildered Xiao Su can't understand why nothing is happening at all. None of these little brats even sincerely thank their teachers. Scratching the back of his head, the boy annoyingly recalls the old wisdom that nine times out of ten, life doesn't go according to plan. Now that it's turned out this way, he'll have to think of something else. Evening came. Drawing something on the blackboard with chalk, Xiao Su is still leading the lesson explaining that today they will talk about basic wilderness survival skills. The students look at him annoyed because this dude talks too much and still hasn't finished the lesson. At this time, the teacher tells them that rabbits in the wild don't attack people, but they are about as tall as a man's shin and have great strength. When Xiao Su asks to be more careful in the wasteland, one of the students interrupts him. 
Raising his hand, the boy reminds the young man that the sun is already setting. If the teacher doesn't finish, it will be dark outside, and it will not be safe to go home. Agreeing that safety was paramount, Xiao Su concluded the lesson. The students thanked the teacher again and immediately ran out of the school in a crowd. At this moment, in the dimension where the palace was located, a few coins fell on the table. The delighted fellow was happy to see his efforts paying off. Because of such a long lesson, the students are grateful to him. He is so touched. Walking home with his older brother, Yuan asks him in the future not to further delay lessons like this. An indignant Xiao Su objects, saying that he's willing to give his life to education. What's wrong with sticking around a little longer? Looking at him irritably, his younger brother says that the boy can't go on like this. He will ruin the youth of this country. Xiao Su smacks his brother on the head with the palm of his hand and tells him that he doesn't understand. He still believes that the coins he received are the sincere gratitude of the disciples. Ignoring his brother's ramblings, Yuan, pointing his finger, asks him to look over there. The group of mercenaries that had recently come to their hut at night was walking in front of them. Apparently, they've managed to find a guide. Isn't that old man Liu? Wang, the merchant standing next to him, interrupted him with a disgruntled cough. You heartless little wolf, I recommended you such a good job. I'm surprised you didn't take it, the man said, adjusting his glasses. Xiao Su asked the merchant how he knew that this job would be really good. The merchant observes that the boy seems to be ill-informed. There are poor and noble people living behind those walls, but the poor can't get out of there. These mercenaries who have free access outside the asylum must be noble people. After thinking about it, Xiao Su realized that this high wall seemed to be blocking not only the people outside, but also the people inside. Those inside the walls have a hard time getting out, but those outside are desperate to get in by any means necessary. Tapping the pensive lad on the back, Merchant Wang adds that he has heard from their staff that they are looking for a good guide from the trading city to take him behind the wall so they can utilize his services. Smiling, he asks the young man when else he had such a great opportunity. Yuan asks his brother why he shouldn't talk to those guys in the group again. Xiao Su is much better than that old man Liu. Turning around unhappily, the young man tells the boy to call it a day and tells him to just go home. Walking further down the street, the boys notice Sister Yu standing nearby. The indignant girl tells the man that those earrings are worth a lot of money, and he can't give her so little money for them. When Xiao Su approached her, he put some bills in her hand, explaining that she did not need to sell anything. He would pay for the three anti-inflammatory pills she had brought him. While the girl tries to understand what this means, the young man explains that he was going to buy the medicine anyway, so his sister can take the money. He does not reject her kindness, but in the future, they should not be so polite to each other. If it wasn't for the medicine she gave him then, the guy would probably have died. He asks Yui not to worry. Punching himself in the chest, Xiao Su promised that now, as long as he had meat, he would make sure she had soup. Yuan walked over to his foolish brother and whispered in his ear that he had misspoken. Meat is usually eaten with soup. How come while the guy is eating meat, Sister Yu is eating soup? Besides, they don't have meat at home right now. Agreeing with his point of view, Xiao Su asked to be allowed to say differently. In the future, if I have a full bowl of soup, you'll always have a basin to wash it in. The young man said suddenly pointing a finger at the girl while his junior watched in embarrassment. Smiling happily, Sister Yu agreed. Then from now on, she would do his dishes and laundry for him. At this point, desperate, the woman fell to her knees asking the doctor to help his family. Kneeling on her knees, she says their family can't survive without a medic. Looking at her with disdain, the doctor can't understand the point of going to the doctor if they can't afford it. At the same moment, walking back into his room, the man slammed the door in front of the doomed woman. Xiao Su asks Liu Yuan to remember this. In front of him is their reality. Noticing that acid rain is approaching, the guy suggests his brother hurry home. As they both ran into the hut, Yuan remarked that it seemed to be very easy for doctors to get thanked. They kept thanking the old doctor when he was still here. It's just a pity Xiao Su doesn't know anything about medicine. When he looked away, he asked what kind of nonsense his brother was talking about. Suddenly it hit him. Wait a minute! He may not know how to heal, but he can learn. If he becomes a doctor, he can make money and accept thanks. That's like two birds with one stone. Early the next morning, a market town. Sitting against the wall, Xiao Su doesn't know what time the clinic usually opens. But it wouldn't be unreasonable to come early. It's been a long time. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. Isn't it about time he opened up? 
Suddenly, the front door of the clinic opened. Stepping outside, the doctor stretched and yawned. Glancing to his right, he was stunned at what he saw. Bouncing away in fear, the doctor asks Xiao Su what he's doing squatting here. The guy looks at him blankly and asks the man to mind his own business and ignore him. The doctor turns around and looks at the young man and tells him that if he wants to see a doctor, he must bring money. Without it, he can sit here all day. At this moment, the palace notified the guy that the target skill would be learned randomly. When the scroll was used, the palace informed him that the deception skill had been randomly selected and asked if the young man wanted to learn it. What the hell? He's here to learn medicine. What's the point of learning deception? This random skill is too random. This dude is so disgusting that he has a skill for deception. The doctor, holding some document in his hand, noticed Xiao Su standing in the doorway looking at him strangely. Looking at him with horror, the doctor remembered the young man. He seemed familiar to him. Isn't he a well-known violent fellow in town? What did he want with him? The man didn't mess with him. Squatting down again, Xiao Su asked the palace what level of medicine this doctor had. His strength answered him that based on the target's information, the target didn't have any medical skills. The enraged guy can't understand how this quack can be a doctor with no medical skills. So you've been making money from cheating all these years, shouted Xiao Su, throwing his cast iron ladle, which he had brought with him especially for such occasions, at the man. Bursting into tears, the doctor asks the guy not to talk nonsense. He wasn't fooling anyone. Taking his ladle, the angry young man walks out of the clinic. Looks like he'll have to think again about how he can become a doctor without learning medical skills. Looking at his arm, Xiao Su notices that the wound he recently received in the hunt is already almost completely healed. That's right! He can heal cuts with that cream! Walking into his house, Xiao Su notices Sister Yu and asks what she's doing here. The girl explained that she saw that the clothes the guy was wearing were torn, and so she came to mend him. Walking over to his younger brother holding a bowl, the young man asked what it was in his hands. Yuan told him that Xiao Yu's sister had prepared porridge for them. Grabbing his brother in a chokehold, Xiao Su asked the one why he still hadn't said thank you to his sister. When the boy bowed and thanked her, the girl asked Xiao Su to stop beating his brother all the time. In response, the boy explained that Yuan could be spoiled with him, but could not be spoiled with other people. Taking a second bowl and sitting down at the walk, Sister Yu poured more porridge and said that the boys needed to eat more as they were still growing. Xiao Su looked at her in surprise. They had never been told that they were growing. Holding out a bowl of porridge to the boy, the girl asked why he was frozen. She asked him to take the food and sit down at the table. A couple minutes later, both brothers are sitting at the table eating lunch. Looking at the clothes that Sister Yu has recently sewn, Xiao Su notices that she is very good at sewing. He suggests that she come and help them when they open a cut treatment clinic. The surprised girl asks what clinic he's talking about. The young man replies that she will find out when the time comes. Night came. Xiao Su lay down in bed, preparing to move to another dimension. Closing his eyes, he feels a headache. After opening the palace doors, the guy decides to see what he's gotten over the past few days. Yesterday, he traded his thank you coins for a bottle of black medicine, and now he has three left. One thank you equals one jar of black medicine. One jar is enough for three people. In this case, one to three is clearly the right solution. The more black jars he buys, the more coins of gratitude he gets. He may be able to unlock his weapons faster. After thinking it over, he decides to get some sleep. In the morning, Sister Yu and Brother Yuan see Xiao Su off, asking him to be careful. He's telling them not to worry. As the saying goes, he who gets into trouble will get all the bumps on his head. And the tall trees, always the very first to be blown around by a strong wind. Xiao Su needs to make sure people don't think he's trying to trick them. The man who was pounding out rocks with a pickaxe asked the guy in surprise what he was doing. The protagonist didn't answer immediately, continuing to cut small blades of grass. He then looked back and gave his interlocutor a caustic look. Xiao Su had to give the appearance of an herb picker to avoid being suspected. The boy whispered to his interlocutor that it was not a weed, but a medicinal herb. He explained that if this ingredient was added in different proportions and boiled, the resulting remedy could be used to heal wounds. The hunter then said that it was because of this that he had healed from his previous injuries. The man was surprised and asked if the boy had not endured all this through sheer willpower. A while later, a crowd of gawkers huddled around the protagonist's shack. There was smoke coming from the thatched roof and the holes in it. Xiao Yu was squatting beside a dish warming on the fire. The guy grinned and grinned at the acquaintances standing outside. People on the street looked suspiciously at the hunter and discussed what was happening. It had been a while since Xiao Yu started pretending to boil herbs. 
He irritably wondered why no one had asked him what he was doing so far. At some point, the guy's patience broke and he ran outside, pointing at one of the men standing off to the side. The troublemaker looked questioningly at Xiao Su and pointed his finger at himself. The protagonist nodded his head and told the man to come over. The man moved awkwardly toward the hunter, listening to the taunts of his friends in passing. Xiao Yu tightly wrapped his arms around the poor guy's neck and ordered him to ask what the guy was doing now. With some consternation, the man complied with the request and asked a question. The protagonist smiled defiantly and pointed to a cauldron nearby that he was making an herbal medicine that not only had anti-inflammatory pain-relieving properties, but also healed wounds quickly. Then he explained that he used to hide his skills from others. However, now the guy realized his mistake and decided to share it with everyone. Xiao Su announced to the public that he wanted to open a clinic to treat cuts and minor injuries. This announcement caused mixed reactions. Many were convinced that the hunter endures his injuries through sheer willpower, and he was incapable of treating anyone. After that, the totally uninterested men turned around and one by one started to leave. The guy realized that this situation was not normal. Looking to the side, he saw the terrified worker still standing nearby. After examining the poor guy's body, the guy noticed that he had a shallow wound on his arm, which was bandaged. Xiao Su grabbed the man's hand and pulled it to the side, asking if the man wanted his excellent medicine. The frightened worker immediately refused. However, the protagonist immediately pinned the screaming man against the wall and took out a vial of medicine. He said that he was now ready to cure the patient for free as an exception. After the drug was applied, the terrified worker ran away in terror. After waving at the poor man, Xiao Su walked back into the shack. Liu Yuan asked his brother why he was giving out free medicine. Gritting his teeth, the protagonist replied that it was the only one. He realized that it was always difficult in the beginning, but those who achieve great accomplishments do not pay attention to such trifles. The next morning, as usual, was completely unremarkable. Xiao Su walked out of his house and met a merchant right at the entrance. Such an unexpected encounter made him tense. The boy asked Old Wang what he was doing here so early. Just in case, the hunter explained that he had not been out sparrow hunting lately. However, the merchant was utterly delighted. He happily asked if it was Xiao Su who had cured Teitu in the eastern part of the trading city yesterday. Without waiting for a reply, Wang Fugui asked the man if he could sell him the medicine. The guy shook his head and said that he worked without intermediaries. The old man said that in that case, he could only buy a couple of jars. However, Xiao Su noticed that his interlocutor was not injured at all. Wang Fugui shared with the boy that yesterday, Tetu felt that something was wrong and wanted to know what the ointment he was given was. The worker decided to taste it. The protagonist was surprised that this black medicine could be taken internally. Immediately, the merchant's eyes shone, and he said that as soon as that man tasted the black ointment, he fisted with his wife all night. The old man again tried to get information about the sources the protagonist used to obtain this ointment. Xiao Su replied that it was his inheritance. Then the guy looked at his interlocutor and asked why he needed this ointment if he was already a bachelor. The merchant replied that the boy didn't have to worry about that. Xiao Su nodded his head and said that the price of familiarization was 600. The old man immediately took out the bills without a second thought and handed them to the guy, at the same time thanking him for the favor. At the same moment, the system counted Wang Fugui's gratitude. The satisfied merchant turned around and headed for his home, while the protagonist stayed behind with mixed feelings. Meanwhile, a small group of people had gathered near the huge gate this time. Wang Fugui, keeping his eyes on the vial he had bought, walked over to the people in clean business clothes. He then held out the medicine to a man in an expensive jacket standing across the street and said he had brought the very thing. Meanwhile, Xiao Su unfolded the signboard he had hand-drawn. He finally managed to open his own cut clinic. But no sooner had the protagonist finished with the registration of his new place of work, as immediately near heard moans. Three of the wounded men approached his house. They were bleeding and barely able to stand on their feet. Nevertheless, the troublemakers walked past the shack and headed towards the clinic they usually went to. Xiao Su glowed with happiness when he saw his first customers. The system immediately activated the task of rescuing the three patients. Realizing that these idiots weren't going to stop here, the protagonist slapped his hand on his face and apologized to them. Then the guy abruptly snapped out of his seat and caught up with the departing men. On the move, he knocked down the stunned poor people who didn't even have time to realize or react in any way. The weakened workers weren't a big problem, 
and after a while the protagonist dragged them to his hut. One of the wounded men looked at the guy in horror and asked what he wanted. Xiao Su explained that the doctor they usually go to was a quack. And only in this clinic can these people save their lives. After saying that, the guy called Nurse Xiao Yu over, saying that they had their first patients to treat. The girl went outside and looked at the wounded. She wondered if the poor people had been caught in some kind of group fight. One of the men with a deep cut on his shoulder explained that a boiler had exploded in their factory. He added that the three of them were lucky to escape with minor injuries and were able to make it here on their own. A large number of workers simply died on the spot. Xiao Su thought that in the current times, no one would run to save the injured person for free. Rather, the reverse would happen, and people would wait until you died to take everything you owned. The protagonist turned to Xiao Yu and said that she should first disinfect the needles and sew up the wounds. The girl looked uncertainly at the guy, and the guy explained that it was about as uncomplicated as mending clothes. Xiao Yu nodded her head and began heating the needles to red hot. Then she brought her trembling hand to the skin of one of the patients. The people standing nearby watched the process in horror. After touching the tip of the needle, the man wailed in pain. He looked at the girl with crazy eyes and said that he understood what such sterilization methods were for. However, the needle needs to cool down first. Xiao Su defended his partner. I said that she was very new as a nurse. Then he opened a jar of medicine. Hunter looked at his patient and said that his drug was very valuable, but he would charge the same amount of money as a doctor in a clinic would charge. Plastering the client's wound, Xiao Su said with a smile that usually a worker in this position received two or three thousand a month, so he should be able to pay six hundred for his life. The man agreed and asked to be a little gentler with him. Meanwhile, one of the wounded men began to take slow steps toward the exit. After the protagonist noticed this, the patient started to run away. Xiao Su was surprised that the guy wanted to escape so easily. The second customer also took a few steps towards the exit, but immediately the protagonist grabbed him from behind. Xiao Su told Xiao Yu to sew up the second man's wound while he caught up with the third man. After the worker was placed in the hands of the nurse, the protagonist quickly ran after the third patient. Wounded, the workers couldn't run very far. A few blocks later, he stopped to catch his breath. Nevertheless, it seemed to the man that he had managed to get away from there. But suddenly, a heavy hand fell on his shoulder from behind. The man turned around in horror, unable to believe that he had already been caught up so quickly. Standing behind him, Xiao Su said in an orderly tone that it was time for them to go get treated. A couple minutes later, the protagonist entered his cabin with the last patient on his shoulder. Sometime later, the last employee went through the same procedure as his co-workers. The system announced the completion of the task and increased strength and agility as a reward. At the same time, the wounded were surprised that the medicine had already started working and the pain was almost gone. Meanwhile, the protagonist was surprised by a new assignment. According to it, it was necessary to cure 10 patients. It seemed to be a whole chain of quests. That same night, the situation in the town became very aggravated. The settlement was attacked by wolves. The news greatly alarmed the residents. Xiao Su realized that not everyone would survive the night. A frightened Liu Yuan asked his brother if the wolves would come to their trading city. The hero shrugged and said that these creatures were smarter than one might think, so they were unlikely to risk coming here. Surely this time the wolves must have been attracted by the smell of blood from the ruined factory. After all, the trading city would probably be protected by people from behind the wall. Suddenly, Liu Yuan asked his brother how he survived the last encounter with the wolves. Xiao Su sighed heavily and thought that sooner or later he would still have to talk about it. But suddenly a beeping sound was heard not far from their house. A man near the gate beat frantically at the bell and shouted that the enemy had been discovered outside. Approaching the roof of the house, Xiao Su wanted to pull back a piece of cloth to see what was going on. But then he stopped and looked excitedly in that direction. Liu Yuan asked his brother why he was so worried. Suddenly, the main character asked what would happen to them if one terrible day the wall collapsed. The frightened Xiao Yu looked at the guy and asked if this could really happen. Xiao Su calmly replied that he could not assume, however, nothing in this world was eternal. Suddenly, the massive iron gate rattled open. A detachment of heavily armed men entered the settlement. They were all well-equipped and had modern weaponry. Liu Yuan asked his brother what kind of weapons these people had. In response, Xiao Su told the boy not to ask too many questions. The child irritably asked if he had any status in this family. The older brother replied that the boy shouldn't think too much and should just get on with his life. The masked soldier reached out and said that because several people had died in the factory, they would now have to kill wolves all night. 
His fellow soldier asked his partner to stop complaining, because it was an order from above. The protagonist closely examined the rifles the soldiers were armed with. Thanks to the skill he had acquired, he knew everything about these weapons and would be able to use them immediately upon receiving them. The group spread out across the plaza and headed toward the factory. Xiaosu looked thoughtfully at the people leaving. Then he told his younger brother that he would go to his sister's house for a while tonight and return home in the morning. After that, the protagonist headed towards the exit. Liu Yuan excitedly asked his brother where he was going. However, the guy didn't answer and promptly ran towards the departing soldiers. Meanwhile, the teacher was shaking his whole body and getting very tense. He was squatting and trying to go to the toilet. However, something was not working. At the same time, Xiao Su was moving quickly through the streets. Suddenly, the teacher saw a guy rushing over. He wondered greatly what this boy had forgotten outside at this late hour. Running outside the settlement, the protagonist towards the factory. The guy remembered that the factory manager was armed with a pistol, but was still attacked by the wolves. There was a high probability that the director didn't have time to draw his weapon, not knowing that the monsters would come for him. Xiao Su really hoped that the gun was still in the factory. Meanwhile, black acrid smoke enveloped the buildings of the production hall. The protagonist ran into the main building and stopped on the spot in horror. Right in front of him amidst dozens of corpses was a part of an armed squad. Directly across from them was a pack of huge gray wolves, watching with hatred for their victims. For the time being, both sides stood without taking any active action. The military realized that these beasts were not afraid of bullets at all. Behind the armed men stood men in civilian clothes who looked nervously at the inaction of their defenders. Suddenly, one man's nerves were frayed. A man in a business suit pushed the soldier, ordering him to shoot. The guy in the bulletproof vest shot out of fear. His bullet hit exactly on target, piercing one of the nearest wolf's paws. However, the monster didn't seem to pay any attention to this at all. The wolf just looked at the man angrily and growled even harder. Suddenly, the entire pack in a unified rush pounced on the stunned humans, who were caught off guard for the first few seconds. Some of the military men only had time to scream before huge, tenacious paws clawed at them. The guy who shot first was the closest to the wolves. The next moment, his head was torn from his body with a loud crunch. Realizing that it was urgent to leave here, the protagonist headed for another building. Running through the empty workshops, Xiao Su assumed that the private army was fighting wolves and all personnel had been recalled, so this side of the factory should be safe. Approaching one of the walls, the protagonist stood still and listened. There was absolute silence all around. Then the boy examined the bodies of the men. Judging from the nature of the wounds, the wolves had killed them with a single blow. Xiao Su was once again glad that he had avoided meeting those monsters. Right in front of the guy was a view of a huge building. He decided he needed to get in there and check out the surroundings. After bouncing off the production boxes a few times, the guy jumped onto the ladder leading to the roof. Climbing up, he kept his balance and looked around again. Xiao Su could feel a little freer now. Still, he had to hurry, for being here was becoming more dangerous by the second. The protagonist threw a hood over the top in case he still encountered living people. He then took out his dagger and prepared it for battle. Jumping up on the spot, Xiao Su fell under the glass and flew down. Once on the ground, the guy squatted down and surveyed the facilities. Now he was finally inside one of the plant's most key buildings. There were also quite a number of corpses around. This time, however, there was a suspicious pattern to the pattern of deaths. It looked like there had been a battle here, but for some reason, all the bodies were pointing in the same direction. That's when Xiao Su realized that in a critical situation, people run to safe places or wherever the weapons are. This hypothesis was confirmed by bodies located all around the perimeter of the staircase. After descending a few floors, the guy came to a place whose presence raised many questions for him. Directly in front of him was an armored metal door. It was an emergency shelter. There were many corpses of workers near the closed entrance. However, the door was locked, which was very suspicious for a situation like this. Intending to figure out what was going on here, Xiao Su knocked on the door a couple times. Suddenly, suspicious sounds started coming from the direction of the shelter. Meanwhile, the man on the opposite side pressed a large button on the wall. At the same moment, the huge sealed door came into motion. The passage had not yet had time to open all the way, but the lad immediately burst into the shelter. In front of him, he found a man with a gun in his hands, his hand on the button. The man expected the army to come for him. However, instead he saw a stranger. Before the hood flew off the protagonist's head, the man with the gun recognized the unexpected guest as Ren Xiao Su. The man pointed his gun at the thief, saying that he had heard of the smart and agile man from the market town. Xiao Su stood in a half-crouched posture and did not move. 
he recognized the man opposite as the factory manager named Wang Dongyang. Without putting the gun aside, the frightened type pressed the big button again. After that, the sealed door moved again and closed. Seeing this, the protagonist realized that he was about to be trapped. Now he was left one-on-one -on -one with a man who had a serious firepower advantage. Xiao Su closely examined the gun in his opponent's hands. His attention was drawn to the fire mode displayed on the weapon. Suddenly, the boy spread his arms out to the sides and greeted Wang Dongyang. However, the armed type was scared and said that the boy couldn't come any closer to him. Then Xiao Su asked why the principal was here alone. After the manager didn't answer, a realization came to the protagonist. He looked angrily at his opponent and realized that he had run in here first, then closed the door without letting the others in. The frightened man with the gun ordered the poor man to stop asking too many questions and instead take him to town. The manager said it was the only way to keep the boy alive. The guy grinned at such a strange suggestion and asked what would happen if he told everyone about how the manager had ditched all his employees to survive on his own. Wang Dongyang grinned, not understanding what the guy's tactics were. Then the manager shook the gun again and shouted, Does the brat think he won't have time to kill him? The director assured the guy that he would just wait for the army to come, because support always comes for people from behind a wall like him. Suddenly, Xiao Su got into a fighting stance. He then asked his opponent if he didn't realize that his weapon was on the safety lock. Just then, Wang Dongyang looked at the gun and noticed that he had forgotten to change the firing mode. The protagonist pounced sharply on his opponent that second and took his arm to the side, blocking the path of the weapon. After disarming the manager, Xiao Su delivered a powerful elbow strike to his enemy's stomach and threw him back. The factory manager barely had time to rise to his feet before a blade was immediately thrust into his stomach. At the same instant, Wang Dongyang realized that he had lost this battle. Out of his last strength, hoping to keep him alive, the manager said that if the fellow would let him go, he was willing to show him where his property was hidden. The boy boldly parried this pathetic ploy, saying that Wang Dongyang should first tell everything he knows. Hearing this, the factory director grinned. He felt that this brat was still inexperienced. In order to survive, Wang Dongyang had to stall until the private army reached to his rescue. However, Xiao Su understood his opponent's intentions. He asked if the manager really thought he could last long with his lungs punctured. Without waiting for an answer, the protagonist said that he would ease the choice and decide Wang Dongyang's fate. In the next instant, the guy stabbed the bastard's chest with his blade. He then withdrew his blade from his defeated opponent, and the helpless carcass collapsed to the ground. After making sure his opponent was dead, Xiao Su squatted down and searched his pockets. The guy was happy to find two extra pistol clips in the factory manager's pants, which were just in the right place. After that, the hunter left the shelter. After a final look around the workshop, he decided that he had to get out of here as soon as possible before a team arrived to rescue Wang Dongyang. For a while afterward, the panting protagonist piled into the house. Liu Yuan ran out to his brother and was glad that he was unharmed. Xiao Su replied that he was fine and asked if the military had returned. The younger brother, examining the protagonist's arm, said that part of the squad had returned with wounded fighters. The boy also explained that the returning groups took with them the corpses of their dead comrades and wild wolves. As it turned out, the remaining unharmed groups continued their journey through the plant. After drinking the hastily prepared drink, Xiao Su realized that firearms still had a deterrent effect on wolves. This meant that against a private army with guns, the monster's chances of victory were still too low. Suddenly, two SUVs pulled out of the gate with armed men sitting on them. Arriving in the center of a neighborhood, the military disembarked and ordered all residents out into the street. The awakened workers were reluctant to come out of their homes, asking what had happened. One of the armed men explained that a large reward would be given to anyone who told who left the trading city today. Zhen Xiaosu and Liu Yuan were among the last to emerge from their huts. The protagonist tensed as he heard the military's demands. The guy realized that it was probably about him. Before leaving the factory, he disguised the wound he inflicted on the manager, as if he had been killed by a wolf. A normal person wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Most likely, the military found out that Wang Dongyang's gun was missing. It was very unusual for them to make such a fuss over a missing gun. Suddenly, a hand went up in the crowd. A man said he saw someone coming out in the middle of the night. When asked by the military man who the person in question was, the teacher said it was Ren Xiaosu. The man turned around and pointed his finger at the protagonist, saying that he had seen everything with his own eyes. 
Such an incredible act of betrayal shocked the guy to the core. The commander of the military detachment ordered his subordinates to search the suspect. But as soon as the armed men got close to the boy, a merchant appeared out of nowhere. Wang Fugui reminded him that Mrs. Luo had asked from behind the wall to keep an eye on this boy, and he should not be treated like this. The commander of the armed squad asked what it was all about. But the merchant replied that they should go to Luo's boss for all the information, because he could not divulge this information. The military man thought hard. To cross the road to such a man was a very rash thing to do, but still, they failed the mission. Therefore, the military man said that even if it was one of the boss's men, it was a serious matter, for the culprit must be found. He also explained that he would still have to make it up to Mrs. Luo in the evening. The two armed men immediately took the protagonist under their arms. There was nothing the boy could do about it, and they could only wait meekly. Liu Yuan suddenly ran out of the shack with a knife. He realized that his brother was involved in something, so he looked threateningly at the soldiers and shouted that they couldn't come here. Xiao Su realized that this could all end very badly and ordered his younger brother to step back. The child was trembling all over his body, but still continued to block the path of the armed men. Only the teacher was watching the events unfold with a satisfied smirk. Finally, the boy lowered the knife and the armed men entered the shack. Immediately, they began a detailed search of every corner and object. Liu Yuan crossed his arms and prayed that these people would not find anything here. The irritated team leader asked his subordinates if they had found anything in the house. The military men replied that there was nothing here. One of them explained that the place was practically empty, and if there had been a gun somewhere, they would have found it long ago. Not not noticing the weapons lying under the iron vat, the soldiers stood up and approached the commander. The leader of the group said that in that case they were leaving here. Hearing this, Liu Yuan finally allowed himself to exhale. After that, the military gave a last look at the protagonist, who defiantly waved his hands at them. The uniformed man stepped aside and Xiao Su looked angrily at the teacher. The guy then walked over to Wang Fugui. The old man was glad that everything had ended well, but he noticed that it seemed like he shouldn't have interfered. After Xiao Su thanked the merchant, Wang Fugui said that if it wasn't for Boss Luo's admiration, he wouldn't have dared to intercede for the guy. Finally, the boy was able to inquire as to which such lady was now in question and how the man knew him. The merchant leaned almost closely to the protagonist and explained that Boss Luo is the representative of the Qing Consortium behind the 113th wall, and he is in rabid excitement about the protagonist's medicine. Xiao Su only then realized why Wang Fugui needed that medicine. The old man also said that from now on, the guy would take a portion once a month, in which case Boss Luo would guarantee no future problems outside the walls. Suddenly, the protagonist asked the interlocutor if he could talk to this lady and guide them behind the wall. The old man reminded them that dirty people like them could never settle behind the wall, and then there would be no one to gather herbs for Boss Luo. The guy realized that this mistress clearly just wanted to get some use out of him. At the same moment, the old man sighed and said that he wanted to get in it all too. Suddenly, Liu Yuan, who had been standing silent until then, called out to his brother. The boy was shaking all over, as if he was feverish. To avoid falling, the child grabbed onto the cape Xiao Su was wearing. However, even so, he was unable to stay on his feet, and after a few seconds, Liu Yuan fainted. The protagonist looked at his brother in horror and immediately rushed towards him. A while later, the baby was carried into the house and placed on the bed. Xiao Yu, who was sitting next to him, changed his bandage time after time. Xiao Su was furious that his brother had spent too much energy and emotion for the sake of saving him again. The boy talked himself out of it, explaining that he didn't want anything to happen to the main character. At the same moment, Xiao Yu wrung out another towel and placed it on the boy's forehead. The child apologized to his sister for having to fuss with him. The girl pointed out that both guys were acting like little kids, and if they weren't more mature than the others, they wouldn't be alive right now. The protagonist looked thoughtfully at the whole situation going on. He stood up and promised his loved ones that he would be sure to make sure they lived well and denied themselves nothing. After that, petty sneers and chuckles were sprinkled towards the guy. After a while, it's a new day outside. Early in the morning, Xiao Su went out for a walk to collect some water. Suddenly, a familiar voice congratulated him on something, and the guy looked suspiciously straight ahead. Wang Fugui was standing right in front of him. Xiao Su made it clear that he didn't understand what he was talking about. Then the merchant explained that last night, Yu Tong was scared to death and ran away with the money. Therefore, 
the protagonist is now the only doctor in town. Suddenly, the old man held out a box to his interlocutor. He explained that the manager behind the wall had allocated Yu Tong's house to Xiao Su's needs. After that, the merchant handed the main character a box. He explained that he had prepared a small gift for both boys, and it was something they could eat to keep their bodies in shape. The guy opened the box and found some white object inside it that looked like an egg. Wang Fugui explained that this thing was called Swallow's Nest, and he had kept this object for many years. Xiao Su looked at the item with some suspicion and explained that these sockets were rumored to be bonded by liquid. In addition, saliva is most likely used to bind the items together. The protagonist took the egg and held it out to the old man. He flatly refused to take the object, saying that it was even more disgusting than the bloody bird's nest. The merchant then put his arm around the guy, saying that he had a conversation to have. Wang Fugui explained that the guy hadn't been shopping for herbs for the past few times, so there was a chance that the black medicine would soon run out. The protagonist naively asked if the product had already run out, because it had been bought recently. However, the old man immediately shouted at the boy, saying that he didn't just buy it for someone, but for the big man behind the wall. The boy started to look away, but Wang Fugui immediately said that the brat should have respect. After all, he had gotten an entire clinic for practically nothing. Suddenly silhouetted, turns around and holds out a vial of cream, saying, then it will cost a thousand two hundred. For the first time in a very long time, the merchant didn't try to drive the price down and took the jar right away. At the same moment, the system added another sincere thanks from Wang Fugui. Then there, the boy thought that this old man was quite sincere. Lastly, the merchant said that the boy could already pack his things and move into the brick house. Some time passed, and all three travelers reached their new home. They stood near the main door with some trepidation for a few more minutes. The family then decided to go indoors and look around. The curious Liu Yuan pointed his finger at the strange banner hanging right in the center of the room. The protagonist examined the inscriptions and explained that it says about coming back to life with skillful hands. Suddenly, a task appeared in the system. The activity suggested continuing to rescue ten patients. But before Xiao Su could look around, he was immediately called out from behind. It was a married couple. The main character immediately smiled and asked what their injuries were, reminding them that coming to him was a good idea. The resident chimed in that his wife was only four months pregnant, but this morning she had a stomach ache. The worker himself was scared that something would happen to her, and he came to the clinic for advice. And that's just how hard Xiao Su's advice is to dispense. The guy thought about it and realized it would be a little more difficult with her pregnancy. Suddenly he asked who the worker wanted to save, the mother or the child. This question instantly shocked both parents. This phrase did not work very well. The main character apologized and admitted that he knew nothing at all about gynecology and it would be dishonest of him to continue fooling uncomprehending patients. He then lightly embraced both of the prospective parents and explained that they could borrow some books from Mr. Zhang at school without taking any pills. It was then that Xiao Su thought that his mission was done for now, and raising his hand, he bid farewell to the visitors, who stared at each other shockedly for a few more seconds. As he turned around and headed for the exit, the worker said that he at least felt that the new doctor was much more honest than the previous one. In the past, the clinic manager primarily promoted medicines for purchase that might not be suitable at all. Sensing that there was a big difference between these people after all, the couple turned around and even though there was no help, thanked the doctor. The system popped up two new notifications and it appeared that Xiaos had been credited with two commendations, but both of them came from a woman. In any case, the main character's expectations were beginning to come true. Now he could just give advice or tell people the right way to get thanks for nothing. From that point on, the guy decided that he would only treat what he knew. A few days later, a man came in with a deep wound to his arm. There was a commotion in the clinic. Xiao Su asked Xiao Yu to help him with the patient. Without any anesthetic, the girl started stitching the skin together. The man could hardly contain himself and shouted that it was very painful. After a while, as the hole had more or less healed, the victim was visited by his mother. They thanked the doctor and he wished them well. Lastly, Xiao Su reminded that the elderly should drink plenty of boiled water. At the same moment, the player had already saved 10 people. The system announced the end of the task and the start of a new phase to rescue 20 patients. Guy realized that the difficulty had increased 
and asked the palace what his current strength and agility scores were. The system notified that the strength index was five and a half units, the dexterity index was four whole and one tenth. Xiao Su decided that this wasn't too bad. Standing nearby, Liu Yuan suddenly asked his brother, why didn't he just try to treat their people? In response, the main character explained that he just didn't know how to do it and there was no one to learn from. Moreover, the previous doctor also did not have any medical knowledge, yet he managed to teach people and even deceive them. The guy explained that I couldn't profess the same principles. After all, now that that guy was in trouble, no one would help him. So you have to have some humanity. Liu Yuan explained that these days, many people would be happy if something happened to them. So he wondered what would become of their clinic if there was no one to help. Suddenly, the older brother turned around and walked quickly over to the boy, clapping him on the shoulder. Xiao Su seriously looked into Liu Yuan's eyes and said that they should not be allowed to replace emotions with an all-encompassing world sorrow. No sooner had the protagonist said this than someone looked out from behind the door. Xiao Su looked at the passage in surprise, for the man didn't even say anything at first. But then, the agitated stranger explained that he had a big problem. However, he wanted what they were about to see to remain confidential. The protagonist thought it was about very savory things. He said that if the visitor had a problem with his little friend, he had come to the wrong place. However, the unidentified man immediately closed the door and said that was not the case at all. He looked at the clinic owner caustically and said he would have to demonstrate it, but no one should be intimidated. This kind of strange wording made Xiao Su very tense. He tensed up and prepared for something strange to happen. Suddenly, the patient began to draw huge amounts of air into his mouth, inflating it to an unbelievable size. A couple seconds later, he made one big spit, and a bright light poured out of the man's mouth. A small purple sphere appeared in front of the protagonist's face. Xiao Su thought that this couldn't possibly be the finale. Indeed, the spherical object hung in the air for a few more seconds and then burst. In the same instant, a powerful stream of wind created a vortex just inside the room. The shockwave from the cleavage was so strong that Xiao Su could barely stay on his feet, while Liu Yuan was thrown to the corner of the room. The child was surprised by such power, thinking they were under attack. However, the protagonist saw great potential in it. He looked at the slightly terrified resident, thinking that the power wasn't very high, but it was definitely not something that could be done with a normal bubble of saliva. Xiao Su explained that in his opinion, the worker was not sick, but instead had some supernatural abilities. A surprised resident asked if it was like just taking a turn into a train out of thin air or something. The protagonist replied that it really is. The man made a very low bow and cheerfully said that he would immediately report to his parents and friends when he got home. This action also added gratitude to the quest. A short while later, the hero's first day in their new environment was over. Lying in his new bed, Xiao Su thought that people with abilities were starting to appear in small trading towns. And there was a chance that these times would change sooner or later. Yet, while the world was becoming much more dangerous, Xiao Su still had a palace. The guy had gathered a lot of gratitude today and hoped to unlock the weapon as soon as possible. Suddenly, a strange rustling sound was heard in the backyard of the house. The very badly asleep protagonist immediately got up and listened. Meanwhile, three unidentified men climbed the fence and ended up on the property. All three thieves made it safely over the fence and landed in the courtyard. Here, however, they were already waiting for them. When the thieves looked up, they found the owner of the property in question standing right in front of them. Unwilling to listen to further entreaties, Xiao Su kicks his opponent between the legs with a swing. The cowering thief, holding his stomach, immediately slumped to the ground. Trying to move away from the pain, he immediately ordered both of his underlings to attack the naked boy. The bullies instantly heeded the order and pounced on the defiant brat. However, it turned out that the guy is such an outcome of events, not at all surprised. A few seconds later, several powerful thumps were heard in the courtyard. It was then that all three thieves knelt down and begged for mercy, just so long as it was not death. Xiao Su was interested in such a peculiar action and asked who had ordered this robbery. Suddenly, at the same instant, a painfully familiar voice began knocking on the door. It was the military again, with a much more reinforced squad. Hearing the palace gates begin to bang, Xiao Su was surprised that both the robbers and the military were awake that night. Opening the door, the protagonist saw the very same officer. The man said that they had a search order. Suddenly, the owner of the establishment came out to the fighters. Most of the armed men were immediately shocked. A strange-looking boy came out to them with a cloth standard thrown over his neck. The boy was very curious, and he asked why the whole group was here so late. 
In fact, the main tactic for Xiaosu was the surprise effect. Ideally, the military should have been distracted by the flagpole and not continue their search. The captain was one of the few who made no comment on such a performance. Pointing his finger at the entrance, he once again ordered the troops to search the room. After several troopers entered the building, the officer personally pushed the owner aside. He explained to the new doctor that it made no difference when they wanted to search. Xiao Su looked at the military with strong confidence. Suddenly, the leader of the squad catches sight of the bound hostages. He asked what was wrong with these people, to which Xiao Su replied that they had been sent here to look for weapons. This overly calm demeanor of the prime suspect was beginning to infuriate the military man, as the uniform introduced himself as Wang Kunyan. He also added that if a guy wants to express his dissatisfaction, he can do so through his name by contacting Boss Luo. The protagonist also laughed, wondering what kind of threat he could be. In reality, the guy was actually greatly afraid that Wang Kunyan and Wang Dongyang would have some similarities. The boy realized that they were not going to let him go so easily. But suddenly, a few minutes later, the deputy commander announced that the hut was empty and no firearms were found in it. Wang Kunyan looked at the owner of the premises with disbelief and explained that they had never found the one who stole the gun. Until then, they would continuously search the houses. Walking not far from each other, the paramilitary squad leader patted the suspect on the shoulder and said that if he had been born behind the wall, he would have probably become a great soldier, unlike this bunch of trash. The soldiers got into the car and turning on the headlights, started on their way. The protagonist was glad that he had hidden the gun on the mountain two days ago while gathering herbs. When the car started, Xiao Su finally allowed himself to exhale for the first time in a long time. As expected, the murder had really caused him a lot of trouble. Having dealt with the unexpected attacks, outbursts finally went to bed. Early in the morning, the boy heard a strange noise that made him wake up. Dressed in rags, the protagonist and his brother walked towards the motorcade. Liu Yuan noticed that these people had only been away for a week, which was very strange for this kind of operation. Indeed, after returning, all these people no longer looked so powerful. Before they left, they were, they were clean and healthy. Now one was dirtier than the other. It was the views of all these people that changed. Judging from the mentioned charts, they shouldn't have even reached the foot of Mount Jing, which was their goal. For a moment, the protagonist realized that out of this entire squad, one person stood out very strongly. He looked at this girl who wielded the rifle perfectly. There wasn't a scratch or a speck of dust on her, just like before she came out. She really did seem to be much better than the others. And Liu Yuan, who was observing all of this, assumed that this entire group was now heading towards Old Man Wang. Most likely, in the end, his recommended guide didn't make it back. Something must have happened to him on the way. As expected, the troop arrived at the merchant's house. The girl who was ahead of them asked why the guide didn't know the roads. Because of his modest knowledge, they had been traveling for three days and even changed direction several times. The old speculator could not believe what he had heard, but at the same time he asked what was the fate of his guide. The girl explained that he had been bitten by something in the river, and when they pulled out the guide's body, he was already dead. However, something didn't add up. Xiao Su remembered that there was no river that matched the description nearby. The merchant explained to the girl that he had immediately said that he had to find Ren Xiao Su to get to Mount Jing. However, he didn't have time to work as a guide right now because he was working for Boss Luo. The woman asked if she was talking about the guy who had a problem with his head. The trader confirmed her speculation. She then asked if he was the only one who could carry so many people over the mountain. Wang Fugui confirmed her words again. A final brief pause was followed by the order to return behind the wall. The cars drove off and the peddler glanced again at the boy. The protagonist followed with slow steps into his house. Realizing what had happened, the old man rushed after him, shouting that this time the guy should thank him at all. Xiao Su turned around and looked at the merchant. Wang Fugui asked if the boy still held a grudge against him. He tried to prove that it was very kind of him to recommend the boy in the first place. The protagonist asked, how about the merchant going himself? Xiao Su said that he didn't mind drawing a map of the route so that Wang Fugui and the rest of the military could go where they needed to go. That way the old man would be able to get behind the wall. At this point, the merchant began to say that he was too old for this. Besides, as it turned out, he had a son. When Xiao Su heard this, he said that he didn't want to talk about it anymore, 
because he himself had a sister and a brother to look after. The tension point in this argument had reached a peak. The protagonist thanked the Wang Fugui family in raised tones for all their help. The old man himself did the same. Immediately afterward, the system added an extra point of gratitude to the guy's account, which he was overjoyed about. Suddenly, the quarrel was interrupted by shouts coming from behind. Turning around, Xiao Su saw the military men take the man with superpowers under their arms and lead him somewhere. The boy asked his interlocutor in horror what they wanted. In response, the old man quietly muttered that he didn't understand either. Then the protagonist thought that, apparently, the whole thing was that someone had revealed his tendency to an unusual ability. Several people came forward to defend a friend who was being taken away. However, they were immediately confronted with machine guns and ordered to step back. Wang Fugui, who was good at negotiating, approached one of the soldiers and asked what was wrong. The old man pointed out that although this man was a bit troublesome, but he had not made any big mistakes. However, the escort suddenly pulled out a gun and pointed it at the trafficker, shouting for him to shut up and move away. The protagonist picked up Wang Fugui, who almost fainted. It was completely unclear why these people had grabbed Zhang Baogan. Indeed, the only theory was that someone had found out about his unusual abilities. Suddenly, the merchant sighed sadly and stated the fact that the guy was finished. Xiao Su asked his interlocutor why he was saying that. The old man explained that he'd heard that this guy had demonstrated his superpowers last night, and his rat friends had snitched on him. Everyone outside the walls is checking out people with superpowers, fearing that they might be a threat. After saying that, Wang Fugai sighed heavily and asked the protagonist what he would do with someone who was a threat to him. The guy looked seriously at his interlocutor and said that he would have killed such a person. Suddenly, however, the merchant grinned and said that things were a bit different than the guy might assume. He heard that a psychiatric hospital for people with superpowers was organized inside. According to some unconfirmed but pretty serious rumors, various tools are used there to study unusual people. Wang Fugi reminded that if Chiao Su himself or Liu Yuan had any superpowers, then one should not let outsiders know about them. Suddenly, at the other end of the settlement, there was a cry for help. A man with an axe was fighting off the other three troublemakers. The moment the protagonist saw this attack, one man had already been killed. After shredding the body of the second opponent to pieces, the distraught axe-wielding man shouted that he wasn't going to spare those who betrayed Baugen with their cheap tongues. But at the same second, a third opponent standing behind him ran up to the man and plunged a knife into his back. However, the worker was not confused and, swinging his axe, killed the last traitor with one blow. A woman who ran into the house saw her husband fall to the ground, struck in the back. As it turned out, it was Baugen's mother. She fell to her husband's body and burst into tears, saying that if he and her son were not in this world, she could not go on living. At the same instant, the unfortunate woman, without hesitation, drew a dagger from her husband's body and cut her throat with it. Alas, Zhang Baogeng was the only child in the family, and if something happened to him, his parents wouldn't be able to survive. Someone in the crowd of gawkers remarked that the boy shouldn't have flashed his strength unnecessarily. Another said that if his father had really had a backbone, he could have broken through the wall. From what he heard and saw, the protagonist was filled with rage. He gritted his teeth and thought bitterly that this was a very finished world. A while later, Xiao Su found himself outside the city school. He leaned against the wall. A teacher stood beside him, sipping a cigarette. The boy said thoughtfully that in today's class, he wanted to tell the students how to stand up to people. The teacher looked up and said that over the years he had taught the children to resist the natural environment, so he didn't want them to think of themselves as such imaginary enemies. The man explained that he had already heard about what had happened in the city not too long ago. He explained that other people's misfortune should not concern them. Looking at the thoughtful face of his interlocutor, the teacher said that if the boy needed it, they could discuss what had happened. The protagonist refused and headed towards the classroom. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to the fact that the students were crowded around one desk. Taking a closer look, Xiao Su saw that his brother was sitting there. The boy began to hope that Liu Yuan's superpower had not been unleashed. Suddenly, a full-figured girl standing nearby told her classmate to advise her brother not to delay class. Otherwise, she would complain to Teacher Zheng. The boy replied that his word doesn't solve anything. The students unhappily asked why Xiao Su was so obsessed with learning and if he really wanted to take control of the entire school. Hearing this, the protagonist thought that he thought he thought the children liked long classes. Suddenly, his younger brother couldn't take it anymore. 
he jumped up from his seat and shouted to his classmate that his brother had taught him everything he needed to know to save his life. In turn, the ungrateful girl dare not say such things about him. The classmate immediately started backpedaling, saying that if the guy didn't want to talk about it, they could shut the subject down. Sighing heavily, Liu Yuan saw another boy looking at him. Suddenly, the classmate said that he could see that the boy was a little upset. He said that he had a dream yesterday where his father found his stepmother, but she treated him badly. After recovering somewhat, Liu Yuan explained that dreams were usually the opposite of reality. The classmate agreed and said that the boy shouldn't be upset with the other kids. Pretending that he had just arrived here, the protagonist defiantly coughed a few times and entered the office, saying that class was starting. Standing near the blackboard, Xiao Su asked the students if they knew which parts of the human body were the most vulnerable. The children replied that they did not know that. The guy said that in that case, they would start with the neck. He explained that there are about 20 cartilages in this part of the body, which are also as close as possible to the trachea. Damage to one of these cartilages could immediately incapacitate the enemy. Some time had passed since the lesson had started. This time, the boy finished the lesson a little earlier. The students thanked the teacher and went home. Standing near the teacher's desk, Xiao Su hoped that these guys would realize his good intentions. Even though it hadn't happened yet, the protagonist hoped that these kids would never have to use this knowledge in their lives. Suddenly, a merchant appeared on the school's doorstep out of nowhere. In a panting voice, he said that Xiao Su needed to pack his things. Someone called out a handwritten message to the old man, saying that Boss Luo had agreed to let the guy go to accompany the group. Wang Fugui explained that this meant that the guy would have to go on another foray into the Xing Mountains. While the stunned boy was trying to comprehend the information he had received, the merchant moved closer and said that the boy needed to be ready as the group would be leaving soon. The boy was very much alarmed by this. He wondered how this group was able to convince Boss Luo. Considering how often he heard this name, it could be assumed that this person was also related to Mount Zong. In any case, it was clear that the group must have had secret plans for this trip. After realizing this, the guy took quick steps towards Teacher Jiang to discuss something. Meeting his colleague near the school building, Xiao Su explained that he would need to go to Mount Zong. The astonished teacher asked if the guy would definitely have to leave. Xiao Su nodded his head. The protagonist was certain that his colleague had also seen the end of Baogun. He explained that all their lives were in the hands of this group from behind the wall. If their mission failed, it would be difficult for them to live in the trading city in the future. The teacher looked at the boy thoughtfully and suggested that Liu Yuan should live at the school during his absence. The protagonist immediately agreed and thanked the teacher for the opportunity. The man gave the boy a look and asked him to take care of himself. When Xiao Su went home to get his things, he met the worried looks of his relatives. Liu Yuan assured his brother that he shouldn't go there. However, the boy said that there was no need to worry about him and he would handle everything. The protagonist then held out the money to Xiao Yu and reminded her that the girl would need to buy some cigarettes for Mr. Zhang for the duration of her younger brother's stay with him. After giving away most of his savings, Xiao Su thought that even if his sister had any thoughts about the money, she could just take it and leave without hurting Liu Yuan. After all, in this scorched wasteland, for the sake of profit, even relatives can go against those close to them, though it's unpleasant to think about it. The girl smiled and said that she understood perfectly. Then she assured the boy that he shouldn't worry about anything and asked him to come back safe and sound. Immediately after these words, there was a knock on the front door. Suddenly, the system popped up a notification that shocked the protagonist. In the mission, the player had to refuse to go to Mount Zong with his traveling companions. Xiao Su was greatly surprised that even the palace didn't want him to go there. Perhaps it would really be very dangerous there. After gathering his thoughts, the protagonist walked out to the military not realizing what he was going to tell them. A girl with blue hair stood right in front of him. She explained that the boy should know who they were by now and said that he had no time to pack, for the group was leaving now. Deciding that imitating insanity would help him once again, Xiao Su twisted his face in surprise at the armed men and said, crossing his fingers, that dad's father's name was grandpa and mom's mother's name was grandma. The surprised leader of the armed group looked at the strange type not believing that this man was so sick in the head. Suddenly, one of the officers appeared behind her back. He looked at the situation with a smile and said that there was no point in the guy pretending because they had already dealt with each other. 
Xiao Su recognized the person Wang Kunyan had approached. It looks like pretending won't work this time. As long as this guy was around, he would have to go even if he didn't want to. Not knowing what else to think of the protagonist shook his head and said he wasn't going. In that same instant, the task was successfully completed. The guy received a basic skill copying scroll. Wang Kunyan, hearing such audacity, asked why this brat thought he could dictate the rules to them. However, before the bulky man could finish speaking, Xiao Su immediately walked past him and calmly said that he would go. Ignoring the shocked officer, the boy approached the leader of the group. He said he could go on one condition. Xiao Su wanted 30,000 as a reward. The woman refused him and told him that it was only 10,000. Realizing that it would not be possible to make a lot of money, the protagonist demanded to add 10 bags of salt, the same number of packs of cigarettes, and 100 kilograms of rice. In the end, the woman gave in and said that she was willing to pay 30,000. Xiao Su then added that his next condition would be that with his presence in the squad, Wang Kunyang must be absent from this campaign. The thug approached his opponent and said that he was very funny. Meanwhile, it was Wang Kunyan who had searched Xiao Su's house twice. Therefore, it was not out of the question that even on a camping trip, they might have had problems. The leader of the group looked at her approximation and nodded her head. This condition she agreed to much more easily and to the surprise of her officer, confirmed that he would not be on this trek. The main character said it was great. The guy then pointed out that although they are all members of the same team, he doesn't know whose name is yet. Anyway, all these people introduced themselves. However, the leader of the group, Luo Xinyu, clarified that they do not consider those who are refugees as comrade. The last one introduced herself as a silent girl who skillfully wielded a weapon. Her name was Yang Xiaojin. Looking at his new partner, Xiao Su said that they could now move out. As he got into the military truck, he waved to the relatives who came out to see him off. Liu Yuan was very worried and prayed for his brother. Xiao Yu reassured him, telling him that such a strong man would definitely return safely. A group of armored vehicles convoyed along a narrow forest road. Looking around, the protagonist marveled at the scenery that opened up. Xiao Su remembered that Teacher Zhang had said earlier that the remaining traces of asphalt on the roads were from before the disaster. The boy wondered what these roads looked like before the disaster. However, recently, all the vegetation had noticeably flourished. Even the cabbages in Teacher Zhang's house were taller than ever. Looking at the wild forest, Xiao Su thought that perhaps the time would soon come when a single potato would be enough to feed a family of three. Suddenly, the boy's stomach rumbled loudly. He was surprised that for some reason the group didn't say anything about snack breaks. But suddenly, the protagonist realized that he was currently in a food truck. Taking a good look around, Xiao Su tore off the blanket and found that behind it were water bottles and packs of cookies. It all looked like an incredible delicacy. You had to have great restraint not to jump on the food immediately. Soon the sun had already gone below the horizon. The group, with their headlights on, still kept moving. Suddenly, one of the fighters leaned out of the window and waved his hand and shouted that they would stop here and make camp. After getting out of the car, several military men headed toward the food truck, agreeing that they would split everything equally. As they approached the back of the car, the fighters heard a strange sound coming from the rear platform. Upon opening the locking rack, the military discovered a strange sight. Their guide was sitting next to several open boxes of cookies. One of the fighters asked Xiao Su in horror what he had done here. Chewing the last cookie and stroking his full belly, the protagonist replied that he saw no reason to panic and said he didn't do anything. A commander's car pulled up to the truck. The military men standing nearby were furious that the boy had eaten five packs of cookies. They offered to kill him on the spot, because if he kept eating like that, they wouldn't have enough food to get to the 112th wall. Yang Xiaojin stared intently at the main character. However, despite the gaze, she only felt surprised and interested. The military dragged Xiao Su to the ground, who shouted that he wanted to stay with the cookies. One of the unit heads suggested that Luo Xinya go back and get another guide. However, the girl flatly refused, explaining that according to her informant, this was the only person who would be able to guide them through Mount Zong. Instead of replacing the guide, Luo Xinyu let the military do whatever they wanted with the boy, but it should not interfere with their path. She added that when their journey is over, the military can do whatever they want with the boy. Meanwhile, the silent Yang Xiaojin continued to watch the protagonist. Xiao Su walked idly around and kicked the stones lying on the ground. He then overheard two military men discussing him. 
They were surprised that such a man knew how to lead a squad through the Zing Mountains, yet he didn't even understand how to prepare a tent. One of the soldiers said that they should place bets on how long this guide would last before dying here. Xiao Su was surprised that there was such sharp attention to his person, even though he had only eaten some cookies. These words were heard by a thug, who was furious that the boy did not consider their stock at all. He warned the boy in an angry voice that he was a common vagrant, and he should not try to break a stone with an egg. The last sentence amused the protagonist very much. He asked the military man what would break if the egg hit a rock. The man looked at the guide in bewilderment and replied that the egg would break. The protagonist sighed heavily and explained that this was wrong. The soldier looked at the boy incomprehensibly and asked what would break in that case. Xiao Su smiled and replied that a chicken's heart would be broken. This curious reply seemed to kill the fighter dead. Suddenly, the protagonist felt her concerned gaze on him. He turned around and looked at the commander's car. Xiao Su was certain that Yang Xiao Jin was looking over at him right now. The girl had already looked away by then. But she had a smile on her face, which was the first time the boy had seen it on this usually serious face. Suddenly, somewhere deep in the forest, a deafening roar sounded. The military immediately became very tense, and some of them who were on their first sortie were frightened. The protagonist thought that usually few animals could survive on the edge of the forest. However, this sound told them otherwise. Suddenly, one of the soldiers saw footprints on the ground. He explained that he had not seen anything like that the last time he had been here. Seeing the find, Xiao Su stared at it intently. One of the fighters asked what the guy was staring at for so long. The protagonist studied the outline of the animal's tracks. For a moment, he thought that these guys might be frightened even by the tracks of an ordinary deer. Xiao Su then looked around. The remains of a campfire caught his attention. It was likely that someone had already camped here not too long ago. The boy reassured himself that it is a very bad habit not to clean up his food waste in nature. He then pushed one of the military men away and walked closer to the tracks to get a better look at them. The protagonist easily determined that these were the paw prints of a bear that had been attracted by the food left behind by humans last time. The skeptical soldier standing behind ordered the guide to stop messing with their heads, because it definitely couldn't be bear claws. Xiao Su grinned and ironically said that it certainly looked more like a boar's hooves. After that, the boy got up from the ground and headed straight into the forest. The frightened military men did not immediately realize how far the boy was going to go. The protagonist explained that he wasn't given any cookies, so he would find his own food. Suddenly, one of the soldiers shouted out, that the last time their guide died was around here. He told the boy to be careful, for otherwise they would be wasting their time. Xiao Su ran off into the forest, shouting that he was just going to see where the last troublemaker had died. A few minutes later, the lad found himself in a deep grove. He had heard a story that the previous guide had gone down to the river to wash his face. As a result, something bit him and he died instantly. Picking up a stick from the ground, the boy immediately began sharpening it with his blade. In any case, he would have to be careful what he did. A short time later, he had a fine spear in his hand. After walking a little further, Xiao Su remembered that there must definitely be a water source in the habitats of large animals. Therefore, the footprints of the strange animal should lead him to the river where the guide had been bitten before. It took a little more time before the protagonist actually walked out to the body of water. He moved closer to the turbulent stream and looked around. If looking only at the water, there really wouldn't be anything unusual about it. The guide must have been attacked by some kind of fish lurking underwater. This supports the theory that, like most people, this man did not know about the existence of freshwater fish, which are carnivorous. Looking to the side, the boy saw a burrow of white ants. With this, he would be able to catch a fish. Squatting down next to the anthill, the protagonist began to strike the mound with numerous dagger strokes. Then he took a spear and forged with it the boulder that lay on top. Xiao Su deftly rushed to the core of the anthill and grabbed the huge insect. It was a pretty rare white ant queen. Such bait must be used wisely. Approaching the body of water, Xiao Su threw the insect into the water, not far away from him. Having prepared his spear, the lad assumed a comfortable stance and began to wait for the fish. A few seconds later, the protagonist saw a huge carcass next to the bait. The next instant, a huge fanged creature leapt out of the water. Xiao Su immediately hurled the improvised harpoon and pierced the fish. Pulling up the spear by the rope, the lad dragged the giant prey onto dry land. But suddenly, a strange humming sound caught the hunter's attention. 
He looked closer and saw a giant-sized silhouette in the body of water. Grabbing his prey, the guy took off at a run. The smell of blood seemed to attract something really creepy. A while later, the soldiers were sitting on the ground, sipping the aroma of fried fish coming from the fire. They looked more and more in the direction where the guide sat roasting the prey he had caught. The protagonist wanted to start eating, but suddenly the system highlighted a new task that asked the player to share his joy with the others. Xiao Su looked unhappily towards the military, who had been making fun of him all this time. The guy took a huge fish and approached the soldiers with it. They were surprised that the guide had decided to share his booty with them so unexpectedly. But suddenly, the guy turned around and headed towards his campfire, saying he just wanted to share his joy. Indeed, the task appeared to be accomplished. A unit of dexterity was added to Chiaosu's characteristics. Then he did turn around and said he could share the fish in exchange for three bottles of water. The well-stocked military men immediately agreed. Immediately, the soldiers gleefully pounced on their prey, greedily ripping it to shreds. Yang Xiaojin looked towards the departing Xiao Su with a smile. After hesitating for a moment, the girl followed him. The protagonist sat down next to the remaining half of the fish when suddenly Yang Xiaojin joined him. She looked into the guy's eyes with interest and muttered something about fish. Shifting his gaze from the girl's eyes, the boy came to a horrified halt. Yan Xiaojin pointed her M9 pistol at him and calmly looked into the guy's eyes. Xiao Su looked fearfully at the weapon. Considering Xiao Jin's skill, one should try their best not to make her angry. The protagonist offered the girl two pieces of fish. Suddenly, Mrs. Luo appeared nearby and said that she would have the same portion as her subordinate. However, Xin Yu remarked that she wasn't going to eat someone's food for nothing. The group leader held out a chocolate bar to the guide and said that he could have a couple pieces too. But suddenly, the guy grabbed the entire portion and ate it in one bite. He then held out his hand to the stunned group leader and said that the girl owed him another piece. A surprised Miss Lo said she would bring more. Meanwhile, Xiao Jin sprinkled spices on the frying fish. Xiao Su kept his eyes on the beautiful girl. He wondered if all the girls behind the wall were so attractive. Suddenly, the huntress grabbed the whole fish and started nibbling it without even separating it into pieces. The infuriated guy shouted that it was his fish and Xiao Jin as a girl could try to restrain herself. The group spent the night in makeshift tents and cars. After a while, the sun came up. Xiao Su was awakened by the first rays of light. He stood up and scratched his stiff neck. The boy didn't have a tent, and the other fighters wouldn't let him in. With tired eyes, the hunter looked around the camp. Some of the soldiers were still snoring blissfully under the canopy. Those less fortunate were on night duty, trying their best to stay awake. Xiao Su looked in the direction where he had made a fire even last night. Rising to his feet, the boy strolled over to the place. Suddenly, there was something missing. The protagonist clearly remembered discarding a fish skeleton near this tree last night. Xiao Su became wary and reached for his dagger. For a reason he didn't understand, the bones disappeared. There was a good chance that they had been carried off by ants. After all, these creatures, when mutated, can grow to the size of a finger. Besides, there was their nest nearby, to which they could easily drag the bones. Deciding that it wasn't that important, Xiao Su walked through the forest and then returned to the camp where the loading was already in full swing. One of the soldiers spotted a suitable guide. The boy had been missing all morning, and it was suspicious. However, he explained that this time, Xiao Su would get into the first car and show the road they would take. The protagonist said he was just about to talk about it. He asked the soldier to warn the others to keep the cars as far away from the river as possible. The fighter looked at the guide with incomprehension and said that they were far away from this body of water, and there were only a few fish to be feared. Then the command to disperse into vehicles was heard, and the soldiers began to prepare to leave. The protagonist got into the car leading the convoy. Suddenly, the driver stopped abruptly and stared straight ahead in horror. The people driving behind looked nervously at the first car and asked what was wrong. Xiao Su looked forward and was at a loss for words. A deer of enormous size came out of the woods onto the road. It was unclear where it had come from and why it had not disturbed their camp last night. At the same time, Soldiers poured out of the armored vehicles one by one. They pointed their machine guns at the creature. Junior Lieutenant Xu Xiangchu radioed the command to not shoot. The people now needed to act without any sudden movements so as not to provoke the monster, who for now just kept standing there looking at the people. A fighter named Chung Dunhan looked at the frightened new recruit and said that he should not be afraid because it was a herbivore and there were no predators here. But at the same time, the deer suddenly shook its head sharply from side to side. The next instant, he rushed swiftly toward the column of cars. 
The driver behind the wheel of the lead armored car was frightened, but managed to turn the steering wheel and step on the gas. A car on a countercourse left the impact. The deer ran past and slammed with all his might into the second armored car. Xiaosu looked around in horror, unable to believe his eyes. Just now he was on the verge of death. The deer cushioned the second car with its antlers and with a shake of its head, threw the armored car high into the sky. Immediately after that, the monster ran swiftly into the forest. The soldiers were ordered by radio to open fire. However, the beast still managed to escape into the woods and go unpunished. Xiao Su got out of the car and watched the shooting. He immediately thought it was strange that Xiao Jin didn't join the whole group. The girl didn't even draw her weapon and calmly watched the monster run away. The squad started pulling soldiers out of the attacked vehicle. One of the hunters remembered that Xiao Su was known as a doctor from the trading city. He immediately asked the guy to come over and help the injured. The protagonist sighed heavily and headed towards the overturned car. That's how the second day of the expedition began. The soldier sat on the ground, leaning against the armored vehicle, and tried not to touch the bruised spot. Xiao Su quickly assessed the situation and realized that it was only a scratch and his help wouldn't be of any use here. Nevertheless, the guy decided to cheeronize. He squatted down and folded his hands in an imaginary prayer, reciting a strange mantra that shocked everyone around him. A soldier standing behind him angrily asked the guide what kind of a doctor he was if he didn't heal at all. The protagonist, on his feet, said that he was not a doctor, but a witch doctor. The hunters looked at the guy contemptuously and realized that he was an idiot. One of the fighters immediately pushed the boy away, saying he was just in the way. The driver of the overturned car then asked the lieutenant if they could still repair that armored car. Xu Xianchu inspected the damage and realized that this vehicle was broken to the point where it was unlikely to be repaired. However, there might still be people sitting in the back of the trucks. This lieutenant pointed to the three fighters and told them they would have to be patient and ride in the back of a truck the rest of the way. After picking up the wounded, Xu Xiangchu ordered the soldiers to spread out in the vehicles. Two fighters who were less fortunate than the others climbed into the truck. One of them said that it was all the conductor's fault, and in general, he should drive here. Suddenly, the second soldier grabbed his neck and suddenly shouted. A second later, he fell out of the back of the truck. The people around him immediately rushed to him. The lieutenant pointed his gun at the body, but immediately realized there was nothing suspicious there. Xu Xianchu crouched down beside the suddenly fallen fighter and checked his pulse. Suddenly, a grimace of horror appeared on the junior lieutenant's face. He said that this soldier had already stopped breathing. It was a big shock to Xiao Su. The boy didn't understand what caused the death of one of the fighters, but he guessed that he could have been in the same place. Meanwhile, the rest of the group also ran up to the scene. The fighters, who had not caught the incident, asked how the guy died. The hunter next to him said he didn't see anything. As he was climbing into the car, his partner behind him screamed and fell down dead. Immediately after this phrase, the trees rustled to the side. Tension hung in the air. It was definitely clear that there was something in the forest. One of the privates suggested to the lieutenant, returned because the situation that had occurred was too strange. However, Su Qianchu, who was also frightened, said that this time they had taken a contract that was non-cancelable, so they would either die or the order would be fulfilled. But suddenly, Luo Xinyu interjected into the conversation. She ordered the soldiers to stop arguing and said that they had better get out of here. The lady added that the guide would lift the corpse of the soldier named Zuxia into the back of the truck and ride with him there. Meanwhile, Xiao Su examined the dead man's body. He found a bee sting on his neck. The situation was highly uncertain, for bee venom surely cannot kill a healthy person in a few seconds. The impatient soldiers ordered the boy to quickly load the corpse into the back of the truck. The poor man's body was packed in a special bag. Xiao Su realized that the wilderness was becoming more and more dangerous. Then, he sat in the back of the truck and took a bite of the remaining chocolate bar. Then, he wondered why these mercenaries couldn't stay at home. Along the way, the protagonist ate more and more supplies. He lamented that Jushia, who was looking for adventure, had only found his death. And because of that, Xiao Su was forced back into the body again. The fighters in the cabin were getting annoyed with this guy, who was always talking to himself. Not only did he cause a lot of trouble, but he was also sick in the head. One of the fighters in the armored vehicle radioed that it was almost winter, but it was getting hotter as we moved north. Hearing this negotiation, Xiao Su thought that the temperature was really rising even at such a long distance. Right in front of the convoy was a huge mountain slope with several active volcanoes. The boy thought that they should be even more careful because all these volcanoes were very active lately. 
Soon evening came, and the cars reached the narrow canyon at the pass. As they got out of the armored vehicle, one of the fighters noticed an inscription engraved on a large stone. This was a warning that it was best not to enter this place alive. The situation was getting even more exciting. The lieutenant asked the guide who carved the inscription. Xiao Su couldn't even guess the sneeze. The guy had been here last year, but there was no inscription yet. One of the soldiers had a nervous breakdown. He pointed his finger at the guide and said that he shouldn't be here even for hunting. The boy asked the protagonist who he really was. Many soldiers were also convinced that the boy was actually hiding his identity. Xiao Su thought again that he had to work with the latest fools for the past few days. The guy decided to joke again and said that he really wasn't telling him something. Showing his thumb, the protagonist said that he was actually a descendant of dragons. In turn, the soldiers thought they were dealing with a complete idiot. Suddenly, Xu Xiangchu's nerves couldn't stand it. He pulled out a gun and pointed it at the guide. The lieutenant explained that there was already a lot of suspicion towards the boy, so he'd better tell it like it is. The fighter accused the boy of being the one to cut the words out. Xiao Su took a few steps back and raised his hands. The protagonist denied it as the inscription was too high up. And even if the stone was lying on its side, he wouldn't be able to do it. The suspicious private flared up and reminded him that the boy hadn't answered what he was doing here last year. Xiao Su scratched the back of his head and said that he then encountered a pack of wolves that drove him here. As expected, the military did not believe what they heard. Everyone knew that a child could not survive after an attack by wolves. When asked how he managed to get away from there, Xiao Su replied that at that time, he simply wasn't the target of that pack and ended up in that place by chance. The protagonist narrated that at that moment he hurried to hide in the forest as soon as he heard the howl. But the wolves suddenly rushed after him, catching up more and more with each second. Xiao Su was unable to navigate and accidentally ran into the canyon. At the same time, the pack suddenly stopped chasing him in that place. At the end, the boy added that the monsters hovered near the entrance for a few seconds and then headed back out at a run. This story stumped even the most seasoned fighters. If even a pack of wolves didn't dare enter this place, there must be something much scarier. Xiao Su also specified that he hid here for about two days, not knowing how far the monsters had gone. Then he decided to come out, and then he didn't remember what happened. Suddenly, one of the fighters suggested that there was a high probability that the inscription was left by one of the people with superpowers. The lieutenant immediately interrupted the private sharply, ordering him to shut up as it was a military secret. Suddenly, one of the soldiers snapped at the senior officer. He explained that Xu Xianchu couldn't be anything like an officer. The other soldier was certain that even if the mission was accomplished, Ma Xin was unlikely to release them. Looking at all this, the protagonist thought that this army is so disorganized that it dares to cross its commander at will. However, their conversations assured the guy that they had a completely different purpose for the trip. Suddenly, a strange rustling sound was heard in the back of the truck. The soldiers have long turned their heads in that direction. It was clear that every one of them had heard it. The fighters immediately ducked down and cautiously approached the body. Looking around, the lieutenant ran out with his subordinate and pointed his gun at the creature. The two soldiers then fired several shots at the suddenly appeared enemy. Then, as the two mercenaries came to their senses, they took a closer look and were horrified at what they saw. In the back of the truck lay the most ordinary mouse, into which they had put several bullets at once. The lieutenant shouted that it was just a rodent that wanted to steal food. But then, after taking a closer look, Xu Xianchu became furious. He also called Xiao Su over to him. The boy walked up to the lieutenant and asked the frightened mercenary what had happened. Xu Qiangchu pointed at the body and asked where their soldier's body was. The protagonist turned his head and saw that all that was really left in the back of the truck was food and a dead rat. The rest of the fighters ran up to the truck. The paranoiac immediately pointed his finger at the guide and said that he was the one who had been sitting here all this time. Xiao Su immediately explained that he had no idea where the body of the slain fighter had gone. Indeed, a normal adult male weighing about 80 kilograms couldn't disappear without a single sound. The private again began to beg the lieutenant to return, as it was becoming even more dangerous here than in the woods. This time, Xu Xiangchu didn't object so harshly. On the contrary, the mercenary thought about curtailing the operation. After a few seconds of deliberation, he summoned the rest of the group to discuss the way forward. After everyone had gathered, Xu Xiangchu reminded them 
that there was a sign at the entrance of the gorge, clearly warning that there might be dangers in the depths that even a person with superpowers would have a hard time dealing with. On the other hand, strange events were also happening in the forest they had already traveled a day away from. Xu Xiu's mysterious death and the unexplained disappearance of his body were still unanswered. Luo Xinyu noted that although the forest was dangerous, there was a chance that their squad wouldn't die there completely. However, it was impossible to guess what dangers the gorge would hold for them. Putting all the facts together, the lieutenant thought about making a final decision. Mrs. Luo looked at Xiangchu. In her heart, she knew that any choice would be right in its own way. Nevertheless, she noticed that the lieutenant was very much concerned about his future fate should he return. The lady promised that through her influence, she would help the mercenary transfer from the private army when they returned. Xu Xianchu sharply replied that it was not what he had in mind, however, he agreed with this opinion. While the lieutenant was talking about them stopping right in the gorge to spend the night, Xiao Su heard a suspicious sound behind him. Xu Xianchu added that it was too dangerous ahead and they should turn around before it was too late. At the same moment, the protagonist climbed onto the roof of the armored car. He looked around and saw the strange creature that had been watching them from the cliff all this time. Looking closer to realize the extent of the danger, Xiao Su was horrified. A wolf watched them from above, a sense of unfathomable power emanating from it. At the same instant, the protagonist shouted that they were being attacked by wolves. Now they had no choice but to go to the gorge. Hearing this, the private asked if they all wanted to kill him. He shouted that only death awaited them ahead. But at this time, Xiao Su had already rushed into the gorge, saying that if they didn't move, they would definitely all die right here. The guy jumped into the back of the truck and grabbed the body of the dead rat first. At this moment, a pack of wolves was already running into the gorge. The unluckiest, who were at the end of the retreating column, were the first to fall into the teeth of the monsters. One of the wolves deftly jumped into the cab of the truck where Xiao Su was still sitting. The creature tried to attack him, but the boy deftly dodged and ducked under the back of the truck. Many of the soldiers did not wait for their fellow soldiers and began to break into the depths of the gorge directly on cars. Xiao Su was in the same situation. One of the fighters was mauled by a wolf right in front of his eyes. The armored car immediately quickly developed speed and began to move away from the protagonist. Seeing this, the young hunter realized that his only hope for salvation was now growing more and more distant. Xiao Su rushed after the car with his last strength. However, the driver didn't even think of stopping. Suddenly, the armored car started to slow down a lot. Taking advantage of this, the protagonist caught up with the car. Suddenly, the door opened, and he saw Xiao Jin sitting in the back seats, who held out her hand to him. Xiao Su noticed that the girl was holding the driver at gunpoint and threatening him in an attempt to save him. The guy also suddenly realized that Xiao Jin hadn't been around all this time. The boy hesitated, thinking that the car wouldn't be able to outrun the wolf on such a horrible road anyway. However, the girl as if read his thoughts and instantly dismissed all doubts, pointing a second gun at the face of the protagonist. She ordered the conductor not to hesitate, not to be stupid, and to get into the armored car faster. In the end, only a few cars managed to survive and break through the small debris. Soon, on one section of the road, a pack of wolves stopped chasing the fleeing humans. The monsters sniffed the area and turned around, heading for the exit of the gorge. People got out of the cars, still not believing that they had been miraculously saved. Indeed, the wolves did not even try to enter the gorge. The soldier who had been panicking all this time looked at the guide and realized that this tramp was indeed telling the truth. Suddenly, the soldier saw the boy standing with a rat in his hand. He asked the strange man why he wanted the corpse of the stinking creature. Xiao Su replied without a shadow of doubt that he would eat that mouse a little later. What the guide said caused a gag reflex in most of the soldiers. The boy explained that all the food was in the back of the truck. However, the provisions could not be carried into the gorge, so they would have to eat like this for the near future. Besides, the mouse had eaten the cookies, so it was much more nutritious now. Suddenly, a sharp dagger stabbed into the animal's corpse. Standing nearby, Xiao Jin said that she wanted to share in the rights of a savior. In return, she could lend Xiao Su this knife. The boy grinned and said that he would only share if he kept that blade forever. At the same moment, a spider descended on his head from above. The protagonist had time to react and pulled out a dagger from the rat's carcass, which he immediately used to cut the monster's legs. The rest of the fighters stared in horror at the unusual creature that had descended from somewhere above. 
Xiao Su immediately looked around the rocks and realized that he wouldn't be able to rest for a while yet. From above, a horde of spiders was approaching the uninvited guests at breakneck speed. There was no end to these monsters. In addition, all the people in the gorge at that moment were facing them for the first time. Xiao Su panicked and said that they better get out of here soon. But at the same instant, the system announced the start of a new mission in which the protagonist needs to help at least 10 people escape from the gorge. Such an unexpected appearance of a side quest finally pissed the guy off, and he shouted that he wasn't going to fulfill such nonsense right now. Some of the bugs suddenly began to separate from the rock and leap at the humans, planning on their wings. The lieutenant immediately gave the command for the men to disperse to the remaining vehicles. However, some in the flurry of general chaos did not hear the order and ran towards the cliffs. One of the soldiers turned around and looked in horror at the monster that was rapidly approaching him. The heavy bug hit the guy's head on the ground with all his might and stunned him. Meanwhile, the main horde in a single stream was already in the lowlands. One poor guy on his way to the car tripped over a rock and fell. In desperation, he turned around and looked at the approaching bugs. One of the monsters saw the defenseless victim and swooped straight at the helpless soldier. The man thought he was finished. But suddenly, a torrent of blood splashed right in front of him. When the soldier opened his eyes, he saw the guide in front of him, who cut the monster's neck with a single blow. Looking around, Xiao Su realized that he couldn't help anyone else. That's when the protagonist realized that the soldier he saved had passed out and was foaming at the mouth. The boy picked up the motionless body and ran away from the oncoming monsters, shouting along the way for the fighter to wake up as they badly needed a driver. The speed of the bug pack was much slower than that of the wolves. This allowed Xiao to run to the car. Opening the door, the guy threw the still-awake driver behind the wheel. After hitting his head on the steering wheel, the soldier began to regain consciousness. He gritted his teeth and clutched his forehead. The boy looked around to see what he had better do now. Suddenly, he heard the click of the safety catch behind him. Xiao Su turned around and saw Xiao Jin standing in front of him, who aimed a gun at him. Before the protagonist could realize anything, the girl immediately shot to the side. Looking to the right, the guy saw that with one shot, she had killed a beetle that was ready to claw at his head. Xiao Su exhaled and looked at the girl. Still, this Xiao Jin frightened him a bit, even though this was the second time she had saved his life. Shooter opened the car door and said it was time for them to leave. Then they both jumped into the armored car and slammed the door shut. At this time, the driver, rubbing his temples, began to regain consciousness. Once in more or less acceptable safety, Xiao Jin and Xiao Su stared at each other. The soldier turned around and saw it. The soldier turned around and saw it. The fighter and guide reacted instantly and ordered the mercenary to ride faster from here. The next instant, one of the bugs flew up to the window and poked its head inside the car. Both passengers immediately reacted and fought back against the monster. Xiao Su pierced the enemy with his spear, while Xiao Jin finished the creature off with a headshot. Then the boy and girl shouted again for the soldier to get them out of here as soon as possible. The driver started the car and put it in first gear, and they took off. The protagonist looked out the window and looked at the horde of monsters. Now they were finally breaking away. At the same moment, the soldier, who was still trying to remember what had happened, looked dazedly at the guide and thanked him for the guy helping him survive. At the same moment, the palace announced that the gratitude meter had stopped at the 74 praise mark. Xiao Su indifferently said that he only saved the soldier because he needed a driver. Nevertheless, the mercenary once again thanked the guy, saying that he regretted his prejudice towards the guide. The system counted the extra sincere thanks and the protagonist's eyes shone with happiness. He got closer to the driver and asked if he could say, thank you again. But this time, the soldier was definitely convinced that this guy was a little crazy after all. Xiao Jin also noticed this. She looked at her traveling companion suspiciously and said that he was acting strangely. The protagonist sat back in his seat and coughed, saying that he was just trying to lighten the atmosphere. Now, before the insects caught up with them, they needed to get out of the gorge and meet up with the rest of the group. It was then that Xiao Su realized that he still knew Xiao Jin too poorly. Right now, he should have kept his head down a lot and only saved up his gratitude so that his identity as a person with superpowers would not be revealed by anyone. Suddenly, the palace announced that the task of rescuing the squad had been completed. It could only say that more than 10 people had been rescued. After inspecting the rocky gorge, the protagonist thought for the first time that the decisions of this palace were getting stranger every time. Traveling farther and farther down the canyon, the squad gradually began to come across a large number of remains. It must have been the work of insects. Xiaosu recalled seeing something like human faces on the shells of some of the creatures. 
It was unclear whether they only ate flesh or even consumed the soul. Nevertheless, farther on, the road was much calmer. After a couple more minutes, the car pulled out of the gorge. A bright crescent moon lit up the sky as the remnants of the group spotted another armored vehicle break out of the canyon. Joining the survivors and counting their losses, the mercenaries were horrified. After two failed breakthroughs, only 11 men remained in their ranks. The lieutenant looked around at his subordinates and realized that as much as he wanted to make a different choice, fate had left him no way out. An alarmist soldier was also among the survivors. He shouted that he had originally warned them that they had better turn back. Everyone could see that the words about death had been written on the stone for a reason, but nevertheless, they were still here through someone else's fault. The lieutenant, tired of listening to these senseless cries, said that what was destined had already happened and could not be changed. If the private agreed, he could go back, for the spiders and wolves were waiting for him. Xu Xiangchu grabbed his head and said that any arguments were useless right now. They just needed to take a breather to figure out what to do next. Unexpectedly, Mrs. Luo, who had also survived the ordeal, asked the lieutenant what purpose his squad had come to these mountains for. Suddenly, Xiao Su realized that the internal structure of the group was not at all what he had expected. Xu Xianchu immediately looked at Xin Yu irritably, and a tense silence hung in the air. Suddenly, another mercenary repeated Madame Luo's question. The lieutenant became furious and shouted that he had the right not to answer his subordinates such questions, since they were just strangers in the company. Xiao Su jumped on the hood of the car and thought for a moment. Indeed, the guy had heard that the group was just trying to reach the other wall and decided to go along with the private mercenaries. So it was not unusual for soldiers to be reluctant to share information. But suddenly, Chung Dunan also looked angrily at his superior and asked what their role in this madness was. The private recalled that many of his friends and acquaintances had died along the way. That is why the survivors must know the purpose of this mission. Xiao Su looked into Luo Xin Yu's eyes and realized that this was also not an easy girl. One word from her provoked a conflict between the rank and file soldiers and the command. Suddenly, the guy's entire view was blocked by Xiao Jin, who approached. She calmly looked at her companion and said that she was hungry. Xiao Su irritably replied that he had no need to talk about it since they were not dating yet. After these words, the girl immediately reached for the gun. She stated that in that case, the guy should give her the knife. The frightened protagonist immediately sat the interlocutor down on a rock and said that he would bring everything right away. Xiao Su asked if there was anything she wouldn't eat. The girl replied that she was ready to eat anything right now. She also explained to her companion that he could find the mouse's corpse in the trunk of their car. The guy said he understood, paralleling his surprise that the mouse he'd thrown away while fleeing the insect horde had actually been picked up by a girl. A short while later, the rodents' paws were already roasting on the fire. At the same moment, the privates were trying to prove to the lieutenant that they were all in the same boat now. If Xu Xiangchu didn't tell them the whole truth, there was a chance that many more people would die due to their ignorance of the situation. The lieutenant replied that he had already told everything he knew. But suddenly the discussion was abruptly interrupted. There was a pleasant note of fried meat in the air. The soldiers silently turned around and saw Xiao Su and Xiao Jin roasting rat paws on the fire. The protagonist examined the remains of the prey carcass and realized that the remaining pieces were useless. Swinging around, the boy tossed the remains of the rodent aside. Suddenly, one of the privates shouted why the boy had done it. Xiao Su calmly replied that the private wasn't going to eat the rodents himself, but if he was suddenly hungry, he could go and get it himself. The mercenary sharply replied that he wasn't going to consume something so disgusting. The guide said it was because the soldier had not eaten anything more disgusting. The soldier looked at the boy with undisguised squeamishness. He couldn't imagine what could be more horrible than a dead shot rat. After that, the protagonist began thoughtfully stirring the fire with a stick. Suddenly, the guy thought about the fact that he had another basic skill copying scroll to use. Closing his eyes, Xiao Su thought that Xiao Jin must have other excellent skills besides firearms. The guy asked the palace to give him more information about the girl's abilities. However, the system replied that the user was not authorized to access this data. The guy looked questioningly at this illogical notification. He had previously copied the girl's shooting skill, so there should be permission to view it. After asking again and getting no results, Xiao Su was convinced that the palace had become more selective. The new protagonist asked what skill level Xiao Jin had. The system replied that it required an advanced rank, 
while the protagonist had an average skill level. A frustrated Xiao Su couldn't believe that he wasn't as good as this beauty. The guy looked at his companion again. He thought it was because his combat skills were simply accumulated, life experience gained from fighting people, not professionally learned combat skills. However, the protagonist was sure that the girl would never defeat him in a real fight. However, that didn't change the fact that advanced combat skills were very useful and should be learned. With that thought, Xiaosu used the cloning scroll. The system congratulated the user for randomly selecting an advanced skill called jumping rope. The protagonist was furious that he got a completely useless skill. Suddenly, his musings were interrupted by Xiao Jin saying that if the paws were overcooked, they would be unpalatable. The guy immediately took the meat off the fire. He took a look and said that it was ready. Furthermore, Xiao Su pointed out that in the wasteland, food needs to be roasted for longer. The same works with water, which needs to be boiled for more than 10 minutes before drinking. At the same time, a violent rumbling began in the stomachs of the other soldiers. The mercenaries started to see if anyone in their squad had any food left. The lieutenant shrugged and said they probably didn't. The protagonist grinned upon hearing this. He knew that no one would admit to hiding food behind their sinuses. However, there was nothing wrong with that, as there was no point in sharing something that could save your life in an instant. Unexpectedly, Xu Qianchu pointed his finger at the guide. He said that the boy knew more about survival than all of them, so it was his duty to help them survive. The system, as if listening to the stupid ideas presented by this world, activated a new task that required the user to help the team find food. Xiao Su rose from his seat, realizing that he simply had no choice now. Suddenly, he pointed his finger at Dunan and said that this guy had stolen food from the truck before entering the gorge and it must be in his bag. The task was immediately completed. The boy grinned and thought that he had been told to find food anyway, but no one was talking about honesty. Xiao's began to like the way the palace judged the completion of tasks more and more. The lieutenant looked menacingly at the private and ordered him to get food out of his bag immediately. The thug started making claims, saying that when he went to get food, the others were doing unnecessary things. So now he has the right not to share his food with anyone. Xu Xiangchu said that it would have to be done for the benefit of the entire surviving team. The private then suddenly drew his gun and pointed it at the formal superior. He asked if the lieutenant thought he still had any power. Dunnan shouted that he would not let anyone present even touch his food. The situation was starting to get out of hand. Gromala continued to keep his gun at the ready. He ordered everyone present to take care of the problem of finding food on their own. The lieutenant looked calmly into the eyes of the distraught soldat and said that he should just share now, and once it was light, they could find everyone food. Dunnan grinned and said that it was still unknown if they would be able to get out of here alive. Suddenly, Xu Xiangchu rushed down, moving out of the line of fire, which caught the private by surprise. In the next instant, the lieutenant delivered a powerful blow to the body of the bulky man, who immediately flew aside. Dunnan fell to the ground and hit his head hard. However, the gun was still in his hands. When he regained consciousness, the soldier began to rise to his feet. Immediately, he looked at the lieutenant with hatred. It seemed that now there was no way to avoid a firefight. Suddenly, the mercenary standing behind the leader's back shook, and reached a hand for his groove. Pulling out his dagger, he swiftly began to move towards the unsuspecting Su Xianchu. Hearing the stomping, the lieutenant turned around and saw that he was being attacked from behind as well. Now the situation was becoming critical for him. Xiao Su watched with his mouth hanging open, unable to do anything about it. But in the next instant, the attacker's path was suddenly blocked by a dark entity that appeared out of nowhere. A humanoid shape grabbed the arm of the uncomprehending soldier. The protagonist almost immediately assumed it was a superpower. The ghost immediately deployed the knife blade and stabbed his attacker in the stomach with it. Dunnan jumped up from his seat and fired at the matter. After finishing off one of the attackers, the ghost immediately covered Xu Xianchu with himself. All the bullets hit the ghost's body exactly. However, none of them did even the slightest damage. As the bullet slammed into the dark matter, it bounced off and fell to the ground. A sepulchral silence immediately hung in the air, broken by a barely audible ringing. Xiao Su was shocked by what had happened. He suspected that there were people with superpowers in the group, and he had only suspected Xiao Jin before. But the guy couldn't even guess that the lieutenant would be so good at hiding it. It was a pity that there was no skill copying scroll yet, so the protagonist should copy his skill when he had the chance. At the same moment, Xiao Su's attention was caught by Xiao Jin. The girl was absolutely indifferent to what was happening. 
The guy asked if it was interesting, to which the shooter replied that she was delighted. The protagonist sighed and thought that judging by her face, she didn't care about any of this at all. At the same moment, the dark matter enveloping the lieutenant dissolved. Xu Qiangchu explained that he was just trying to find a way out of the situation and didn't want to offend or traumatize anyone. The fighter sitting on the ground was writhing in pain, trying not to move. The lieutenant looked at the guide. He asked the fellow to examine the fighter's injury, since Wang Fugui had told him earlier that Xiao Su was a doctor in the city. The protagonist walked closer and took a quick look at the injury. He noted that the injury was quite serious. The frightened soldier asked the guide how long he had left to live. Xiao Su replied that the soldier had 10 minutes to live. After a brief general silence, the protagonist suddenly started counting down from the number 10, making it clear that he knew nothing about it. The lieutenant noted that he purposely avoided important places and internal organs when counterattacking. Xu Xiangchu added that according to Wang Fugui's stories, the guy had some kind of miracle cure for his wounds. Xiao Su confirmed this, but added that he was hired as a guide, not a personal physician. In addition, his medicine is very expensive. The guy asked for payment up front, but the lieutenant grabbed his head, saying he forgot the money in the lost car. The wounded soldier muttered through gritted teeth that he had money with him. While the mercenary was writhing in pain, the protagonist asked him if his money was in his right or left pocket. Unable to say anything else, the fighter pointed to his right leg. Xiao Su smiled and said that he basically didn't know how to stitch wounds. The guy added that it would depend on God whether the wound would heal after the medicine or not. Someone immediately called him a quack. Mrs. Luo said she had some thread, but she was afraid of blood. While the protagonist was counting the money he received, the lieutenant said he would stitch up the wound. At one point, Xu Xiangchu ordered the guy to stop counting the money and attend to the injured man. The protagonist said that he wouldn't take too much and 1,200 should be enough. After the wound was anointed with a special medicine, the lieutenant began to wield the thread and needle. In the process of sewing up the wound, he said that he saw no further point in hiding anything. Xu Qiangchu said that there were actually remnants of an ancient civilization that existed before the Great Catastrophe in this mountainous region. Their squad was sent by the higher-ups to map out a route to the ruins in these mountains so that the main group could come and explore later. However, the lieutenant soon discovered that this region seemed to hold mysterious powers, capable of evolving beasts and possibly aiding superhumans as well. Eventually, after looking at everything that had happened, he changed his mind and decided to go back behind the wall. It was too dangerous for such a small group. At the end, Xu Xiangchu added that he just didn't know what might be waiting for him there, so it wasn't worth taking any chances ahead of time. The lieutenant finished and straightened up. He said that after revealing his superpowers, there was no longer a road beyond the wall for him. Therefore, Xu Xianchu was going to go deeper into the mountainous region to continue his research. Then the commander looked around at the people around him. Now each of them knew the dangers of the place and could make a decision according to his desire. Unexpectedly, Xiao Jin replied almost without a second thought that she would go along with the lieutenant next. The girl explained her position by saying that the place they were in now was no less dangerous than it was there, and they had a better chance of surviving with a superhuman. After quickly conferring, the two privates decided that they would also follow their commander. Just then, the main character raised his hand and said he was joining the squad. After making sure that everyone decided to continue on their way, the lieutenant said that in that case, they would be traveling onward at dawn. Xu Xianchu also warned that by their consent, everyone around them confirmed his leadership. Anyone who disobeyed his orders could expect no mercy. In addition, the forest ahead was dense, and the squad would have to abandon the vehicles and walk. Turning around, Xu Xiangchu turned to Li Maoxian and said that he would go first, carrying the injured Wang Lei on a stretcher. Meanwhile, an idea came to Chaos. He realized that by taking the initiative, there was a chance that he would be able to complete the thank you quest even earlier. Pushing the soldier aside, the protagonist said he would carry the wounded fighter and kill anyone who tried to steal the case from him. The mercenaries looked at the guide in bewilderment, who seemed to have completely lost his temper. Wang Lei was surprised that this guy had suddenly become so kind. Meanwhile, the sun rose from behind the horizon. The third day of the expedition began. Walking ahead of the group, Zhao Su asked the injured man if he needed medicine. Wang Lei replied that he was fine and thanked the guy. From that moment on, the lieutenant watched this strange guide closely. 
It was obvious from his behavior that he did not care about anyone in principle. However, episodically, this guy for some reason worries a lot about others. While carrying the wounded fighter, the protagonist constantly pelted him with various questions and waited for the guy to say, thank you. Now, the secondary but no less important task for Xu Qianchu was to find out what this Ren Xiaosu really wanted. Meanwhile, the hunter smiled. This Wang Lei was a true nugget for collecting appreciation coins. The detachment passed through a forest so dense that there was hardly any sunlight behind the crowns of the trees. The protagonist looked around intently. The last time he had been here was a year ago, and now the trees were much taller and lush. Despite the time that had passed, the speed of their growth was astonishing and even suspicious. Suddenly, Xiao Su heard a scolding behind his back. Luo Xinyu ordered the soldier to stop touching her. However, the brazen type said that he didn't see anything wrong with it. On the contrary, it was the least he wanted to do to the girl. Feeling dominated, the mercenary said he wouldn't mind having some fun tonight. Mrs. Luo angrily said that she wouldn't let any ghoul touch her. However, from the look on the soldier's face, her words only turned him on. Suddenly, a gun was held to the mercenary's head. The soldier immediately put his hands up and stopped his harassment. Yang Xiaojin stood behind him. At the same time, the girl looked at Xiao Su and said, That bastard's gun is now his. In that very second, the protagonist forgot about the stretcher and, abandoning his duty of carrying the wounded man, ran to the soldier. Walking over to the holster, he pulled out his mercenary weapon. Immediately, the soldier began to protest, shouting that these idiots didn't even know how severe the charge was for depriving private troops of their firearms. However, Xiao Jin immediately calmed him down, telling him that if he uttered another word, he would die. Then the mercenary began to argue that there was no point, as surely this tramp wouldn't even be able to use a weapon. However, the guy figured out how to use the gun very quickly and brought the weapon to the ready. The mercenary who saw this got scared and said that they all needed to run away from here. Xiao Jin looked at Xiao Su again and noted that he was quite skillful with weapons for a mere resident of a trading city. The lieutenant who was observing what was happening was also impressed. It also confirmed his theory that this boy was not so easy. Xu Xianchu approached Xiao Su and asked if he could find food for all of them. The protagonist shrugged and said that he wasn't the almighty god and couldn't say for sure. The guy added that at least he couldn't make a wild boar appear out of nowhere and crash into a tree. But suddenly something rumbled very hard near the squad and leaves sprinkled from above. The travelers looked in the direction from which the sound was coming and could not believe their eyes. Right in front of them, a huge wild boar was lying unconscious on the ground. The privates immediately called Xiao Su a saint and a wizard. The lieutenant noted that so far, everything the protagonist was talking about had actually happened. While the soldiers were celebrating that they now finally had food at last, Xiao Su thought of his brother. The guy realized that the silly kid must have made another wish. The lieutenant plunged his dagger into the huge carcass and began to strip the boar. The main character told about the basic rules of survival in the forest. First of all, you should not leave for tomorrow food that you can't finish today. Then, you should not mess with blood for a long time, as its odor attracts wild animals. There is also a high risk of falling victim to huge ants. During the day, as long as a person is active, they cannot harm him. However, if these creatures smell blood near a person at night, they may eat the person as normal food. The guy also added that even a single bite from these ants could cause extreme pain. Xu Xiangchu said that he had heard of this fact and thanked the guide for the rest of the information. Meanwhile, Madam had been keeping her eyes on Xiao Su for a long time. She could see that this guy was quite sincere. The girl had a great plan that she wanted to implement soon. A few dozen minutes later, the boar was successfully roasted on a spit. The party sat down on the logs around the fire and began to eat their prey. Madam Luo was once again next to Xiao Su, who was focused on methodically eating his food. Suddenly, the girl said that they could have a good time in the wasteland because it looked very romantic. The protagonist looked at her incomprehensibly and said that there was nothing romantic about it because it was just ordinary survival. Unexpectedly, Xinyu moved closer to the guy and called him handsome and charming. He almost immediately realized why the situation had happened. Surely Mrs. Luo couldn't get anything out of Xu Xianchu, so she came to him. And indeed, the protagonist remembered how the girl tried to make signs of attention. However, the lieutenant rejected her in every possible way. After all, he is a mercenary and really a grown man with a strong character who knows what he wants. Apparently, that's why the girl decided to change tactics 
and switched to a younger and brainless teenager. Of course, this was typical female manipulation. However, the guy decided that he didn't need it yet. Suddenly, he called the girl his sister and told her to stay away from him. After a slight stupor, Sinyu said that there must have been some misunderstanding between them on the road. After saying that, the girl stroked Xiaosu's cheek and said that she liked him a lot. However, the guy suddenly yelled at the girl, ordering her to keep her mouth shut. Xiao Jin, who was sitting next to her, abruptly spat out water after this sentence. There was silence in the air for a few seconds. Mrs. Luo then stood up from her seat and after calling the guy a sick bastard who deserved to be alone all his life, walked towards the thicket. This is not the first time the protagonist has encountered this type of woman. They are looking for someone they can rely on in this ruined world, or who can be used as a tool. The guy has long ago decided for himself that he does not need such a girl. Meanwhile, one of the privates approached the lieutenant and said they were out of water and dry rations. Realizing that this was a serious problem, Xu Qianchu turned to Xiao's. The leader wanted the guy to tell them how to get water in the wild forest. Immediately, the palace highlighted the corresponding task, according to which the protagonist needed to teach his partners how to find water. Xiao Su gathered everyone around and said that, in order to get water in the wilderness, one must rely primarily on laths and collecting dew from leaves. He waved his head toward the tree and said they were very lucky. The juice from the pine needles could quench their thirst for a while. The system deemed the task complete and increased the boy's strength by one unit. Immediately, the protagonist snapped out of his seat with lightning speed. He made a few nimble jumps and a couple seconds later was at the very top of the pine tree. Why Xiaosu felt one of the sheets and tore it out? The surprised mercenaries who were experiencing something like this for the first time didn't understand what this guy was doing. The protagonist said that if the mercenaries didn't want to die of thirst, they would have to do as he did. The guy then pressed the leaf and squeezed a few drops of dew into his mouth. This admixture of tar and rainwater was not the tastiest. However, sometimes even extreme methods have to be taken to survive. Xu Xiangchu and Yang Xiaojin immediately followed the guy's example and climbed up the trees. The girl tore off a piece of pine needles and began chewing on it. Suddenly, the protagonist received a notification about learning an advanced skill called bomb making. Xiao Su was excited that he would finally learn something useful in battle. As it turned out, this skill also belonged to Xiao Jin. Looking at the sum total, the guy didn't understand what kind of frantic training this girl had undergone. He then asked the system if Xiao Jin had stealthy assassination skills, and the palace confirmed the existence. In addition, the system from the interesting skills found the ability singing children's songs. Combining the available facts, the protagonist got an absolute mess of skills that seemed to be completely disparate. With that thought, Xiao Su jumped to the ground. Meanwhile, the rank and file soldiers couldn't even climb a tree joking about the fact that they hadn't been monkeys for a long time. Upon hearing this, the main character said that they are not the only ones who have such problems. For example, the giraffe has problems both with defense against enemies and a trivial problem with mating. The soldiers once again felt embarrassed to learn such little-known facts. They concluded that this guy must be doing something like this on purpose to disgust people. Meanwhile, it rained heavily in the region where the band was located the main character determined almost immediately by the smell that it was acid rain. He called out to the rest of the group, shouting that they needed to take cover somewhere. All the travelers gathered close together and immediately ran for cover. At this point, the only means of defense left was an old, tattered hood. The squad moved at a quickened pace toward the nearest cliffs. At one point, the soldiers walking ahead noticed a stone canopy. It turned out to be a small cave. Here the group could wait out the bad weather for a while. One of the privates made a torch and lit it to check the situation in the cave. The guy lit up the walls, and then the group could get a good look around. Suddenly, the private cried out fearfully, and pointing his finger at one of the walls, told everyone to look there urgently. To their great horror, the traveler saw another inscription, clearly carved by a man. The message warned that its author had seen strange dark figures in the forest that were disappearing. As scripted after reading the caption, the thunder in the street multiplied. The travelers were trying to figure out what the inscriptions were and who the author was. Then someone asked if they had lost anyone on their way. The lieutenant said that only Zuxia's body had been lost. Xu Xiangchu once again looked over the record and noted that he didn't recall anyone from the 113th wall going over the mountain before. Perhaps someone from the 112th had taken shelter here and left a message. If they had a satellite phone, however, the signal would definitely reach the base. Hearing the familiar word, 
Xiao Su said that his teacher had told him a long time ago that there were phones behind the walls. However, the guy himself doesn't even realize what they are. Xiao Jin explained that thanks to these devices, people can communicate between different stations at a distance. All this is possible thanks to several satellites created before the disaster. One of the fighters immediately complained that this was the one time the higher-ups had not provided them with a satellite phone. The private suggested that they were up there trying to explore the area with human lives, and if they died here, the area would be closed to the public. The lieutenant ordered them to stop needlessly panicking. After all, they would have to get out of here anyway. Xu Xiangchu pointed out that it was getting late, so he would be the first to go on shift. The others would take turns, and the girls could stay out. The guy thought that this decision would really keep them safe from potential opponents outside. Just then, Xiao Jin approached him and said that Guy would be on duty for the first half of the night, and she for the second half. Xiao Su once again realized that they Xiao Jin had no need to feud as they still trusted each other. This girl is clearly not weaker than him, and the current situation is dangerous. Therefore, in case of danger, they will be able to protect each other. After that, the guy smiled and agreed to the proposed schedule. Xiao Jin turned around and said she was going for a walk. The protagonist asked if he should go with her, to which the girl refused. The guy realized that this beauty was too bold. He had to find out what was behind her boundless confidence. Suddenly, Miss Luo passed by the protagonist and said that she would go along with Xiao Jin, because the guy really doesn't understand girls. When the next beauty left the camp, Xiao Su thought seriously. Perhaps there was something he didn't understand about women's hints. Thus, only men were left in the temporary camp. One of the privates chuckled and said that it wouldn't be good if two girls went missing at once. A little more time passed. However, the acid rain only intensified. A short while later, both girls returned. They said that everything had gone well and without any abnormal incidents. Two privates decided in that case to also leave the base for a while to relieve themselves. The lieutenant told the mercenaries not to take too long for a smoke break. In response, the fighter told him that they would finish quickly. After that, two more people left the cave again. The protagonist stared intently at the two girls who were now chatting about something. He understood that Madame Luo, being a star, wanted to cross over to the other wall to ensure even more fame. However, Xiao Su couldn't guess what Xiao Jin's motives were. Only based on rumors could the protagonist assume that the girl was traveling in the company of a famous singer to find her relatives in the 112th wall. Eating fish together suggested that Luo Xinyu and Yang Xiao Jin's relationship was much more than just worker and employer. Xiao Su moved a little closer to hear what the girls were talking about. Miss Luo suddenly suggested that her companion should leave Mount Zing in a couple of days. The guy realized that this girl was now trying to influence Xiao Jin to recruit her to leave this place as soon as possible. As if confirming his guesses, the singer extends 10,000 to the companion in gratitude for past help. Xiao Jin takes the bundle of money, but Xin Yu does not let her go. Suddenly, she asks her companion if she will continue to help her. Shooter took the money that was due to her and said that she didn't want to help and leave Mount Zing, but she would make sure that Mrs. Luo died with dignity. Hearing this, the protagonist grinned and realized that he wasn't the only one such manipulation worked on. A barely burning fire dimly lit the evening cave. Xu Xiangchu nervously paced around the room, waiting for the privates who should have returned long ago. However, these two had already disappeared for far too long. Xiao Jin looked at her watch and said that they had been gone for almost 10 minutes. Suddenly, one of the privates shouted that he had something wet on his back. The mercenaries were wary. It was very strange, considering that this soldier had been in the cave the whole time. It was only Xiao Su who guessed to look at the ceiling. Small drops of water dripped down from a small stone ledge. The protagonist explained the situation, saying it was a false alarm. He also explained that the water flowing from the rock formations was even more filtered than that of a well. It was probably one of the cleanest water sources in the entire wasteland. The lieutenant immediately ordered his subordinates to gather some water. The pine needles were able to provide some moisture, but it was too little. The privates came under the drops and began to draw full flasks of water. However, what surprised the protagonist the most was that for the first time they didn't thank him for the information. After the privates finished collecting water, Xu Xiangchu said that he would take over the first half of the night. The mercenaries agreed, but added that they would smoke a couple of cigarettes first. The lieutenant agreed and asked the boys to be on the lookout. Xiao Su and Xiao Jin lay down to rest, 
while Xu Xianchu sat down next to another private and thought. Meanwhile, the mercenaries sat near the edge of the cave and smoked. Several times they looked around suspiciously and examined the sleeping people. Finally, after another look around, they made sure that the three men were already asleep. Then, the mercenaries got up and went to them. Quietly approaching Xiao and Xiao Jin, the soldiers took out huge knives and swung them to strike. The killers shouted for the bastards to go to hell. In the same second, the daggers rushed toward the bodies of the guide and the girl. But suddenly, Xiao Jin turned around and fired a precise shot at the assassin's chest. At the same time, Xiao Su did not use a gun and blocked the blow with his hand. The mercenary didn't immediately realize what had happened, and those few seconds were enough for the protagonist to leap to his feet and throw his opponent over his hip. The military men sitting at the other end of the cave heard the shots and turned around to see what had happened. The picture of the failed attack immediately opened up before them. One of the mercenaries was tightly clutching the chest that Xiao Jin had shot. Suddenly, the wounded soldier shouted to his third partner to act immediately. However, the mercenary was frightened and immediately raised his hands, shouting that he was not one of the conspirators. A tense silence immediately hung in the cave. Xiao Su and Xiao Jin looked hatefully at the third accomplice, who didn't dare to support his partners. At that same time, Xu Xianchu activated his skill, summoning a shadow assistant. The lieutenant silently looked at the people around him, not understanding why they couldn't all be quiet for a while. The protagonist looked suspiciously at the soldier who had attacked him and wondered what these guys wanted to accomplish. Even with the three of them in possession of their weapons, they still wouldn't be able to defeat the lieutenant. However, all these reflections did not make much sense anymore. The fact of the conspiracy was in plain sight. At the same second, the system started a new task in which it offered to give the enemy a painful death. The boy immediately clutched his opponent's neck tightly. During his years of living in the wasteland, he had learned that one should always get rid of all potential dangers because that was the law of survival. Looking at his partner's agonizing floundering, the third conspirator became very frightened. He tried to justify himself by saying that he hadn't originally planned to get involved in all of this. Xiao Jin looked at him contemptuously and said that he was nevertheless in cahoots with the other two and knew about their plan of sneak attack. Without waiting for any counter-arguments from the soldier, the girl pulled out a gun and shot him in the head. Lastly, she added that covering up a crime is tantamount to the crime itself. The protagonist admired his partner, though she frightened him a little. This girl clearly needed to be more careful. Unexpectedly, the guy was given a scroll of master-level skill copying as a reward. While pondering which ability to study, Xiaosu looked at the lieutenant who was pensively looking at the corpses. Already in the next instant, the guy realized what he wanted. A few seconds later, he learned the skill Shadow. Once inside the palace, Xiaosu saw a strange reddish haze around him. It was most likely the same shadow. Just then, the guy heard a strange sound behind him and turned around. Behind him was a dense black and purple matter that resembled his own body and shape. Xiao Su noted that this shadow looked much more massive than the lieutenant's. He immediately wondered how effective this ghost was at fighting. The boy immediately closed his eyes and mentally ordered the shadows to demonstrate themselves. A few moments later, the matter began spinning around Xiao Su at a frantic speed, showing off its speed. Suddenly, the ghost abruptly changed direction and attacked its master from the rear. The protagonist turned around and knocked out his shadow with a single blow. After the energy release passed, Xiao Su realized that this ghost was at least twice as strong and faster than his own body. The density of this creature is also high, so it's no surprise that Xu Xiangchu uses it to block shots. According to the clues provided by the palace, this shadow cannot die. However, the timing of its use is based on spiritual power. A ghost would be on the battlefield as long as the host's spiritual energy was strong. However, for now, the protagonist didn't know how to calculate something as uncertain as spiritual power. For an answer, Xiao Su turned to the palace. The guy asked the system to sound out an indicator of his spiritual power, but the palace suddenly said it was classified information to which it had no access. Looking around the dark walls once again, the boy thought he could do without the extra help. However, it was really strange that stats like strength and agility were displayed in numbers, but spiritual strength was not. However, Xiao Su concluded that it didn't matter right now, because sooner or later, by training his body, he would still be able to achieve the right numbers. From that same moment on, the protagonist could officially be considered a real person with superpowers. Meanwhile, the lieutenant sadly surveyed the bodies of the traitors. He rightly pointed out that it was the bastard's own fault for sneaking up and being killed in return. 
However, the lieutenant was still of the opinion that the third conspirator was not fully involved and therefore did not deserve to die. Hearing no contrary opinion, Xu Xiangchu said that it was too late to talk about anything now. Especially in the wasteland, there is basically no right and wrong. Both defenses said nothing in response, but mentally they were in agreement. Xiao Jin then asked Xiao Su if he had pretended to be asleep. The boy realized that the question had been asked for a reason. Life in a commercial city had instilled in him the habit of being constantly on guard, and even when he was asleep, he had to be vigilant. The protagonist realized that the girl herself pretended to be asleep. Nevertheless, she asked him about it for some reason. Xiao Su replied that he was glad his partner had figured it out, to which Xiao Jin said that it was still boring. Meanwhile, the sun had already risen outside. The fourth day of the expedition was beginning, by which time the detachment had again thinned to half its size. Examining the corpses of the traitors, the protagonist tried to figure out how Zuxia's body had disappeared earlier. Right now, the corpses of the same people lay in front of him. However, nothing had happened to them, and that was strange to say the least. The lieutenant called out to the survivors, telling them that they would soon be on their way. They did not know what dangers lay ahead, but they could not stay where they were. Moreover, a new campsite had to be found before the next nightfall. At the same time, Xu Xianchu remembered the two guys who never returned to the cave. It was likely that they were no longer alive. At least, there was no hope of their return. After looking over the remaining fighters in his charge, the lieutenant said that he hoped that no one would act alone from now on, as after all, they had all seen what happens to such people. Suddenly, Wang Lei, who was lying on the ground, asked someone to help him get up. Without a word, Xiao Su immediately approached him. His appearance somewhat frightened the mercenary. The main character immediately reached out to Wang Lei's bandages and ripped them off. The guy started panicking and screaming that he was being killed. But Xiao Su, who was pestered by these weaklings, said in a rage that the guy could already get up and walk, for his wounds had long since healed. The mercenary looked at his torso, and indeed, his deep wound had already healed. The soldier thanked the guide for giving him this magical remedy. Suddenly, a lieutenant approached Xiaos and asked if he still had the drug. The protagonist walked by and said that the ointment had run out even last time. However, Xu Xiangchu said that he would pay double the price from his pocket. Hearing the tempting monetary offer, Xiao Su stopped and said that it looked like he didn't have much medicine left. Suddenly, the protagonist reminded his interlocutor that he had mentioned earlier that he had no money left. The lieutenant explained that he had taken those bills from those three traders. Then it came to the boy that he had done an incredible stupidity not to search the corpses of the dead. Xiao Su, on the other hand, shouted that this money belonged to him, and he wanted at least half of the entire amount. Xu Qianchu replied that he wasn't interested and could give all of the available 8,000. A couple seconds later, the partners made a fair exchange. Counting the money, the protagonist looked suspiciously at the lieutenant's pockets. It was quite possible that this guy had not given away everything he had. Anticipating the question, Xu Xianchu said that his pockets were indeed empty, and he wasn't lying. Immediately, a notification popped up in front of Xiao Su's face, stating that the bearer possessed a sum of 20,000 and could purchase an initial personal vault. The protagonist immediately moved to the palace and acquired a warehouse. A tall cabinet with a beautiful door appeared in a room of the palace. The boy stared at the purchase in silence for a while. He was still pained to realize that he had to spend as much as 20000 on this storage unit. However, it was necessary to check what Xiao Su got for it. Walking to the door, the protagonist grabbed the handle with his hand and pulled it. The massive door of the warehouse opened. The space behind it, however, was disastrously small. From the looks of it, it could hold a few small items at most. In fury, Xiao Su slammed the door sharply. The guy had given such a huge amount of money and only received a mere cubic meter of space for it. It was as if this trashy palace had purposely ditched him for money. The protagonist clutched his heart. Breathing heavily, he came to the conclusion that this was still the initial vault, which would surely be upgraded during the process of upgrading. While Xiao Su was lamenting that 20 had gone to some nothing, Xiao Jin was watching him intently. The volcanoes around were still active, spewing tons of ash per second. The band of surviving travelers left the cave and headed into the forest. The protagonist asked the leader if he knew what exactly was on Mount Zing. Xu Xiangchu replied that perhaps the mountains held the secret of beast evolution. According to another version, there might be the source of a new round of development of living beings there. 
Then Xiaosu wondered if there couldn't be some ruins on the peak. Besides, it was very suspicious that the leaders didn't immediately tell the expeditioners what might be there. The lieutenant immediately rejected the ruin theory and said it was more likely that there was a mysterious city on the peak of the mountain. After these words, the protagonist became even more wary. He did not rule out that soon they would have to face a civilization that was still alive. Without looking up, the guy said that theory sounded even more plausible. He then recalled that the lieutenant had spoken of a remnant of the civilization that existed before the disaster. According to the leader's words, the secrets left there could help the superhumans. Xiao Su wondered again what the point of this mystery was. Xu Xiangchu replied that although he wasn't sure, according to legends, superhumans existed a long time ago, but only recently have they started to appear more frequently. They even have an organization that kills the governors outside the walls. They are called thugs. The lieutenant's words surprised the boy. It seemed that superhumans were not so few since they even managed to create their own organization. Xiao Su asked Xu Xianchu if they had caught the assassins. The leader replied that they were unable to do so for the reason that the individuals in question were too strong. Currently, all the fortresses are targeting superhumans, and it seems that their danger factor is still being evaluated. The leadership has not only created shelters to protect themselves from superhumans, but also wants to utilize their power. It was for this purpose that the main squad was sent into the mountains. The group continued to listen to the leader in silence. He said that it was still unknown what kind of potential Mount Zong was currently hiding. Therefore, it was not surprising when before setting off, Wang Kunyan learned that the other teams were also under on their way here. Xiao Su silently looked at Xu Xianchu. The situation was beginning to take an unpredictable turn. The boy wondered if the fortress didn't want to use the power of superhumans. And surely the lieutenant would play a big part. However, Xu Xianchu sharply rejected this assumption. To an ordinary person, superhumans were no longer considered one of their kind. The leader explained that Xiaosu couldn't even imagine what an ordinary person could do to someone who wasn't one of them. That was why Xu Xiangchu made the decision that he would not return to the fortress again. The private immediately tried to assure the leader that they were in no way going to reveal his secrets. However, Xu Xiangchu replied that out of all the people, only Liu Bu was worried about. The protagonist looked intently at the panicked man. He asked if it turned out that if Liu Bu didn't return, in that case, the lieutenant would head back to the fortress. But suddenly, Xu Qianchu looked at Xiao Su suspiciously and noted that the boy was also probably a superhuman. The group leader's insight dumbfounded the protagonist. He hesitated and looked fearfully at his interlocutor, not knowing what to say. However, the lieutenant immediately joked that the brat had awakened a gift for annoying people. Xiao Su laughed in response, realizing that this time he had been blown away. Still, he wondered how right Xu Xianchu was. The guy asked the palace if he had an annoyance skill and what level it was. The system replied that his ability was of the perfect kind. Hearing this, the main character grinned. Although this skill was not comparable to Yang Xiaojin's ability, but at least he had perfected something at such a young age. Suddenly, one of the group members stepped loudly into the water. Hearing the squelching, the guy warned everyone to avoid puddles from now on, as if you came across a leech this time of year, it could end in death. So the travelers walked some more distance through the dense forest. Suddenly, the lieutenant waved his hand sharply, ordering everyone to stop. He nodded his head to the side and told everyone to look there. Liu Bu, however, cried out in fear and asked what it was. Directly in front of them stood a tall figure dressed in white, banging his head against a tree. At first, the travelers did not think of the danger. They only wondered what this girl, and in such a light dress, had forgotten in the area. The protagonist offered to go around the stranger so they wouldn't be noticed. But at that very second, the puppet instantly disappeared from the spot, causing a commotion in the ranks of travelers. Moving quickly from side to side, she suddenly landed not far from the group. The hunters immediately drew their weapons and aimed at the enemy. It looked like they were in for a serious fight after all. Suddenly, the figure in the white dress started moving towards the group. The white-clothed figure began to move toward the group at a great speed, moving in a straight line, getting closer and closer to the people. The privates panicked and started yelling loudly. The lieutenant explained that they had nowhere to run to. Besides, if even such a monster could stop them, there would be no point in going any further. Then he shouted for the others to follow him. The protagonist prepared himself for battle. Suddenly he realized that the temperature around him had increased a lot. Xiao Su then proposed a plan to the commander. Xu Qianchu was to catch her with his shadow 
so that they would shoot the enemy with their pistols. The lieutenant shouted out that this was a great plan and immediately used his superpower. Straightening his arm in the direction of the strange girl, he released his shadow at her. The dark matter, having transformed into human form, also began to approach the enemy at high speed. Moments before the fight began, the shadow straightened his arm and thus gained an advantage. The unknown woman didn't have time to react, and immediately the dark matter tightly encircled her neck. With a mighty throw, the shadow hurled the girl in white and felled her to the ground. After looking at the result of the fight, the protagonist lowered his gun and decided that this move alone was enough. After that, the shadow approached the people and held up the strange creature. It was a very strange-looking doll. No one understood where the object had come from or to whom it belonged. The thing looked rather shabby and had clearly not been created outside the walls. Xiaosu looked around to perhaps find an answer to the questions that had formed. Under the tree that the creature was beating so diligently against, the protagonist suddenly saw something. He came closer, saying it looked like there was something here. It was a small box with a velvet covering. The boy twirled it in his hands and then opened it. From where he had gotten the strange card, which, strangely enough, only raised more questions. It had an unknown pattern painted on it. It was clear that this object had been manufactured before the disaster, and it takes hundreds of years for plastic to decompose completely. The drawing in the center looked very much like some sort of labyrinth. All members of the group stared hard at the find, but no one realized what it was. The only assumption was that it could be a map of some room. The lieutenant suggested that it might be a path leading to the city to the Xing Mountains. But immediately, Xiao Jin interrupted him, pointing her finger at the inscriptions that covered the card at the top and bottom. The explanation at the bottom said that you had to scan a QR code to pay. However, no one still did not understand what it was all about. However, Xiao Su had time to assume that in order to pass into the labyrinth, and they also needed to pay someone. Realizing that it was pointless to sort out what he didn't know, the lieutenant took the card and put it in his pocket. Xu Xiang Chu said that they had to go urgently. Still, no matter what was hiding in this Zing Mountain, they would have to take a look at it eventually. Liu Bu asked if it was necessary to take the shitty doll with him. The rest of the group looked questioningly at the soldier. Still, the lieutenant said the mercenary could take it, for no one knows if they'll need it. Meanwhile, the sun was already beginning to slowly set behind the mountains. Darkness gradually began to envelop the forest. Toward the end of the day, the group was lucky enough to find another cave. It became clear that this was where they would stop. Xu Chiangchu explained that there was a pine tree growing nearby, and those who were hungry could go up and gather some cones for themselves. Meanwhile, the main character took his dagger and slashed the trunk of one of the trees with it. Seeing that green sap had begun to flow from under the bark, the lieutenant was surprised. He came closer and asked if that was drinkable too. The guy didn't have time to answer, and the rest of the group also ran up asking questions. Everyone hoped that these trees would solve their water problems. But suddenly, Xiao Su replied that this substance was poisonous, and he was applying it to the knife. The stunned private shouted that he had no idea who he had to be to do such a thing. Meanwhile, Liu Bu sat the shabby doll down next to the rock and climbed up the pine tree himself. Seeing a lump nearby, the mercenary diligently reached for it with his hand. But suddenly, his foot slipped on the trunk and he lost his footing. Losing his balance, the guy couldn't hold on and went down. Falling to the ground, he sat down and sighed sadly, not realizing why he was going through all this torment. Liu Bu shouted in rage that they had already decided to return to the fortress, but then they ran into a pack of bloody monsters. It is not without reason that the idiom says that wolves and B.I. are the most insidious. Suddenly, the protagonist appeared out of nowhere next to the desperate soldier. He asked the mercenary if he knew what he was talking about and what the idiom meant. The guy sighed heavily and admitted that he didn't know. Xiao Su explained that a B.I. is actually also the same kind of wolf. It is a beast that can only move by leaning on the wolf with its front paws. Having said that, the protagonist threw the poor guy a lump. While the soldier looked at his current food in amazement, Xiao Su explained that wolves were capable of being absolutely loyal to their own kind. The guy then gave the mercenary a hard look and asked if humans were capable of such a thing. He then turned and walked away, leaving the dumbfounded soldier alone with his thoughts. A couple minutes later, a campfire was built. Immediately, all the travelers huddled around him in anticipation of a long night. Xiao Su examined the food he had gathered with surprise, realizing that even the cones had become much larger as they progressed through the forest. The lieutenant suggested that perhaps it was due to the high oxygen content of these places. The lieutenant suggested that it might be due to the high oxygen content of these places. 
the protagonist was once again convinced that he was not dealing with a simple military man. This guy backed up his arguments with science and common sense, which was quite impressive for a mercenary. After a brief silence, Soyasu asked if there were places like this near other fortresses. Xu Xiangchu confirmed that Mount Zong was not the only one attracting the unhealthy attention of fortresses. However, other such places are controlled by a company called Flame Source. The protagonist was surprised and said it was the first time he had heard of such an organization. Soyasu asked if the company belonged to a union. Xu Xiangchu explained that the Flame Source company was an independent consortium that controlled up to 20 fortresses. Since they were relatively far away from them, it was not surprising that the protagonist had not heard of them. Then the boy asked the lieutenant if he knew what it was like to live in a place controlled by the flame source. He just waved his head, explaining that he had no idea. But suddenly, Yang Xiaojin cut into the conversation, saying that the flame source territory was mysterious. Xiao Su looked at the girl in astonishment, hoping that she would say something else. Yang Xiaojin added that some of the people even said that they had seen huge prehistoric birds of prey in the sky above these 20 fortresses. She then stood up and said that the source of flame has tremendous power. Because of that, they were able to suppress this place, and perhaps only the main management of the company knows what is going on inside. Such an unexpected display of knowledge really surprised the guy. Yang Xiaojin seemed to know more than Xu Xianchu, and she probably belonged to some organization as well. The lieutenant turned around and asked the protagonist if he had read the book Journey to the West. After a negative answer, the mercenary explained that it said that it said that someone could lift a stick weighing over six tons that could crash mountains. At first, Xu Xianchu didn't believe it at all. But after seeing what he had seen in this forest, he thought that it was possible. And this person really existed. Xiao Su thought about the fact that such a statement sounded highly strained. The load capacity of an agricultural tractor was roughly 10 tons. It didn't seem possible for a guy to claim that a slightly overloaded tractor would be able to crush mountains twice as efficiently. Meanwhile, Liu Bu sat and chewed the cones. The seeds were very bitter and seemed to be completely inedible. The hunger wasn't going away and the anger was only growing. The mercenary looked hopefully at the protagonist. Overpowering himself, he approached Xiaos and asked if the guide could make another wish for another animal to come running to them like last time. Recalling the story of the boar crashing into the tree, the protagonist said that it was an accident. He then sharply replied that if Liu Bu wanted it that way, let him ask for it himself. The mercenary shouted out that if his wish was truly granted, they would have had an animal to eat on their doorstep a long time ago. Suddenly, at the same second, a loud roar came from the forest. The travelers jumped up and pointed their weapons at the exit of the cave. But the noise stopped as quickly as it had begun. For a moment, the fighters thought they had gotten away with it this time. But suddenly, large shadows flew past the trees at great speed. A moment later, a strange company in the form of a tiger, a monkey, a snake, and a boar appeared in front of the cave entrance. Holding clearly not safe beasts at gunpoint, Xiao Su pronounced that Liu Bu had a knack for saying his preferences right at the right moment. The protagonist then pounced on the poor guy and told him to tell the animals that they were eating vegetarian food today. The mercenary asked if that would really work, to which the guy told him that they had no choice but to try it. The animals stood in front of the cave without moving and looked at the people. Liu Bu came out to them and tearfully told them to leave. In the same second as a general surprise, the animals turned around and also quickly fled into the forest. The soldier looked at what was happening with mad eyes, not understanding how this was possible. The protagonist asked in a rage what it was all about. This was no longer like a mere coincidence. It was possible that Liu Bu had also awakened his luck like Liu Yuan had done earlier. But at the same second, the roar of the beasts was heard again in the forest, coming closer and closer to the cave. The boy saw a flock of birds that soared sharply above the trees. Now it was clear that something had brought all these animals here. Moreover, it became clear to Chiaos that this pack was not moving towards them to attack. It was possible that they were being pursued by something more terrifying. At the same moment, a light, cold breeze blew in from the thicket, followed by the sound of a chain dragging on the ground. The unknown creature was getting closer and closer to the cave. The chain jingled more and more often, occasionally making sharper sounds. But then the sound began to drift away again, as did the quick footsteps. Immediately afterward, a cold breeze blew out of the forest once again. Then a few more seconds passed and there was dead silence all around. The atmosphere became more and more tense. 
The ringing of the chain grew distant, but it did not disappear. From time to time he would appear and disappear, making people very nervous. Unable to withstand such tension, Liu Bu, in fear, suggested hiding somewhere more secure. Xiao Su stopped him, reminding him that the instinct of danger in beasts was much more developed than in humans. These animals were clearly trying to hide in their hiding place, so the cave should be relatively safe. However, the unresolved question remained as to what these beasts were hiding from. Surely there must be something in the forest that frightened even them. It was then that the protagonist first suggested to his companions that they pay attention to the strange chain of incidents that had followed them all the way. There were a large number of human remains at the canyon exit. However, there were no similar animal skeletons in the forest at all. All this on the assumption that each animal might well die of attack, old age, or disease. However, they have not yet encountered a single skeleton. In addition, Xiaosu threw the fish remains into the forest on the first night. In the morning, the bones were gone, and not even a trace of them remained. In addition, there was the incident of Shushia's body disappearing. The main character recalled that all the missing things had one thing in common. They all disappeared in the forest. Liu Bu asked in horror if it was possible that after humans evolved, plants and animals began to evolve at an accelerated pace after them. However, the hunter had no answer to this. The lieutenant said not to be unduly nervous, for since they understood all this before, they would be able to take precautions in case of anything. Wang Lei agreed with the commander, suggesting to stay out of the forest for now and be on guard. Xu Xiangchu nodded his head and added that in the future, their path would lie along ridges and hills where the number of trees would drastically decrease. Xiao Su looked at his companions with excitement, who suddenly thought that it would be so simple. Suddenly, a heartbreaking roar came from the forest. The frightened travelers stared into the darkness, trying to see something. Suddenly, just a little farther away, right near the ground, they saw two brightly glowing red eyes. The creature had huge jagged fangs. It opened its mouth and stared intently into the cave. Xiao Jin once again drew her weapon and pointed it at the strange creature. Xia Osu also drew his gun and pointed it into the forest while clicking the safety and putting the weapon into combat mode. The lieutenant prepared to use his ability. He warned that as soon as the enemy showed itself, it would immediately be fired upon and distracted while Xu Qianchu's shadow would circle the creature from the rear. Immediately after these words, the ringing of the chain increased manifold. Hearing this, the main character shouted that the monster was approaching. The blowing of the cold wind was only getting stronger. However, the enemy was still nowhere to be seen. Staring intently into the darkness, Xiaosu suddenly realized that the sound was getting farther and farther away. No one was prepared for such an outcome. Nevertheless, there was silence around the cave again. The lieutenant wondered what it was. The protagonist assumed it was a creature afraid to come out of the forest, and their cave was about ten meters away from the trees. It seemed to be where many animals hid at night. The lad assumed that there was something wrong with this forest and they had been very lucky to escape this danger. Xu Xianchu said that in that case, he would remain first on duty. After midnight, Xiao Su and Xiao Jin were to replace him. The guy and girl silently looked at each other and didn't object. Seeing their suspicious looks, the lieutenant said he couldn't help it if they didn't trust him, but he decided to go on duty first anyway. After a while, the campfire died out. A light smoke rose from the slightly smoldering embers. Liu Bu wrapped himself in his cloak and fell asleep. Meanwhile, Xiao Su and Xiao Jin sat leaning on the rocks, impressed by the previous night. The night was gradually coming to an end, and the sun peeked out from behind the mountains again. Suddenly, there was an explosion of incredible force in the distance. The blast wave scattered trees and leaves in different directions. The travelers stared stunned at the flash, not knowing how to react to it. They ran out of the cave in terror, not realizing what had happened. Looking at the smoke that formed after the explosion, the protagonist assumed that it was the volcano of Mount Zong that had begun to erupt. But suddenly the lieutenant shouted out that it looked like the other teams had already reached their destination and made their move. Immediately, he ordered his subordinates to urgently speed up, for they must get there before their rivals learned the secret. The protagonist, however, was not satisfied with this arrangement. He reminded them that even greater dangers than they had experienced that night lay ahead. Xu Xianchu looked at his interlocutor confidently and explained that they were already here, and there was no turning back. That was why the only thing they could do was to find the secret of Mount Zong as soon as possible. The protagonist gritted his teeth, but then agreed that they really had no other choice. Xiao Jin silently examined the cocky boy but did not say anything. 
At the side of the destination, the volcano continued to erupt in full force. The group moved quickly through the forest and finally came to the area of hills. Wang Lei could barely keep up with the others, stopping occasionally to wipe his forehead. The closer they got to the volcano, the higher the temperature was. Suddenly, Luo Xinyu, who had been silent for a long time before, asked why the beasts had gotten bigger, but the humans hadn't. She wondered why nature had suddenly decided to bestow superpowers on humans. The lieutenant explained that from ancient times to the present, human evolution has always been linked to mental ability. The protagonist revealed that according to his teacher Zhang, there is a gene in the human body that limits muscle development. According to this theory, smart people are more adapted to their environment, and because of this, the brain requires more energy. Therefore, muscle development should be limited to avoid competition with the brain for resources. Xiao Su added that this was the price that humanity had given to nature for the sake of intelligence. Xiao Jin immediately refuted this, saying that she had seen a superhuman with an advanced physique. Not knowing how to get out of it, the guy thought about it and said that maybe his ancestors had something to do with wild animals. However, as expected, everyone thought it was nonsense. However, Luo noted that Teacher Zhang himself was quite an intelligent person and had good information about this world. The protagonist agreed. However, he noted that the teacher quite often makes up nonsense in class if he encounters something he doesn't know. Luo suggested that perhaps Mr. Zhang reads books and stuff when he's free. But the boy immediately refuted this by saying that the teacher worked in the vegetable garden whenever he had a spare moment. The girl was disappointed to realize that things in the market town were not quite as she had thought. Suddenly, the lieutenant cautioned the rest of the group as there was something that looked like a human body up ahead. The travelers slowly approached a strange mess near a high cliff. It was incomprehensible how the corpse of a recently deceased person could appear here. Perhaps it had something to do with the Qing Consortium. While the others were looking around, Xiao Su was intently studying the body. Suddenly, the guy noticed something shiny and leaned over. It was a metal token that soldiers usually carry with them. Turning over the find, the protagonist was horrified. It was the locket that belonged to the missing Shu Xia. Xiao Su tried to collate the facts and come up with a logical version of what had happened. The mercenary had died from bee poison, and his body had strangely disappeared before entering the gorge. So how did he end up here? The only logical option was that someone had brought this body here. Examining the nibbled bones, the protagonist noted that Xuxia's organs had been eaten. But it was not at all clear who could have left such even bites. The boy realized that he didn't know whose jaw was capable of such a thing. Suddenly, Xu Xiangchu let out a curse and shouted out that it looked more like human teeth marks than anything else. The protagonist looked at his interlocutor in surprise and asked if he was sure. The lieutenant said that it was only his guess. He then told a story about how back in high school his first love bit his hand when he broke off his relationship with her. Xiao Su and Xiao Jin shouted out that they were all scared, and Xu Xiangchu are time for such strange stories. Yet the teeth marks did indeed belong to a person. But who could have done such a thing? Had someone gone mad with hunger and eaten his own kind? After a short pause, the protagonist asked the companions what they thought about the fact that it was Xu Xia's body that was dragged by the chain last night. The travelers looked at the boy in amazement, but none of them responded. Suddenly, Xiao Jin twitched the bolt of her gun and said that they needed to get out of here. She ordered the squad to line up in a three-man tactical formation. Hearing something like this for the first time, Xiao Su asked what it meant. The girl wondered if the teacher hadn't taught it to them. She explained that the guy would go to her left and watch his sector of view while shooting at any approaching target. The protagonist smiled and said he understood everything perfectly. Xiao Su was surprised that when Xiao Jin took command, no one said anything against it. Everyone seemed to have realized that she wasn't that simple. Furthermore, this girl is not afraid of the changes taking place and knows the details of the Flame Source Company. After a while, a gunfight was heard up ahead. The sounds of gunfire became stronger and more active. The lieutenant assumed that they would be getting close to the secrets of Mount Zong very soon. Looking around, Xiao Su noticed something lying under his feet. The lieutenant bent over and realized it was a shell casing. He examined the back of the picked object and read the inscription. He was now certain that this cartridge case was issued by the Qing Consortium. The mercenaries who heard this immediately realized that they would not have an easy ride. Xu Xiangchu whispered that it seemed like the consortium was also here and had already made their move. Suddenly, a wild boar ran out of the bushes straight at the group. 
It came as a complete surprise to the travelers. They did not expect to see a wild boar in the rocky terrain. The screaming beast, limping, slowly ran past the stunned group. Wang Lei pointed his gun at the animal. Licking his lips, he said that they should take the chance and kill the boar. Liu Bu supported him and said that he didn't think he would eat meat again yet. However, Xu Xiangchu managed to stop the soldiers and ordered them not to shoot. Liu Bu angrily shouted that this boar ran straight into their hands and they hadn't eaten in almost 24 hours. The main character said that the guys have brains, however, they don't apply them in the way they would like to. The lieutenant explained that these underdogs could give away their location by making a fire here. Suddenly, Liu Bu said that if there were Qing people here, the safest solution was probably to defect to them. Xiao Jin asked in surprise if the mercenary was sure that the consortium would share the secret of the mountain with them if they found it. In turn, the girl suggested the safest option, to kill the opponents when they meet and show no mercy. In her opinion, any indulgence given to the enemy is a manifestation of cruelty to oneself. The lieutenant suggested moving forward for turning back with certain death, and moving forward was the only way to survive. Wang Lei sighed and said that even if they avoided meeting the consortium fighters, they would probably just starve to death before letting Qing's men catch them. This kind of environment in the squad did not please Xiao Jin at all. Moreover, she now kept a wary eye on the ranks. The squad climbed higher and higher up the mountain, once again entering another forest thicket. Xu Xiangchu noted that there was much less shooting, and perhaps in an hour they would know what was hidden on this mountain. Along the way, the lieutenant whispered to the protagonist that if they had to do guerrilla warfare in the future, they would have to abandon the other three, who would not be able to keep up with them. The guy agreed and turned around. The mercenaries, along with Luo Xinyu, were lagging behind due to their puffiness. Xu Qianchu also turned around and suddenly noticed that Yang Xiaojin had disappeared somewhere. Everyone also began to look around for the girl. However, she was clearly not around. The protagonist understood that a person with abilities like Xiao Jin's could not disappear without warning, not unless she wanted to. Xiao Su and Xu Xianchu looked at each other and nodded. At this moment, the sound of a chain was heard nearby again. The travelers were startled, not realizing where the sound was coming from. Liu Bu almost cried. He shouted that there was no way this monster could take a girl like Xiao Jin. Looking around, the mercenary suddenly discovered that the squad leader and guide had also disappeared somewhere. He stared at the empty space in horror, not realizing what was even happening. The three poor men were alone in the forest. Suddenly, the dead silence was broken by strange sounds. It was the clinking of chains again, coming closer and closer to the mercenaries and Lo. The first to decide to retreat was Liu Bu. He shouted that everyone would now save themselves as best they could. The boy ran forward with all his might, clamoring and hoping he wouldn't be caught up. However, just a couple seconds later, he was easily overtaken by Wang Lei. Once behind the others, Panic asked his partner how he was running so fast, having only recently been injured. The boy realized that he now had a most disadvantageous position. To save himself, he had to take desperate measures. Liu Bu swung his leg with all his might and hit Wang Lei running ahead with it. The mercenary fell and hit his head hard. The panicked man apologized to his partner and shouted that someone had to be sacrificed for the others to survive. Wang Lei, who was lying on the ground, started begging for help. However, in the next second, a monster flew out of the forest towards him. Looking back, Liu Bu heard his partner's last cries. The creature very quickly latched onto the defenseless mercenary and mauled him. After shredding the soft human body with its huge claws, the monster looked again at the fleeing victims. Liu Bu clammed up and shouted that he just wanted to come back alive and didn't need to be chased after. It was then that his gaze fell on Luo Xinya running ahead who was gradually starting to run out of breath. The mercenary reached for the girl's back and shouted that you had to sacrifice something to survive. He attempted to grab the singer by her cape, but he didn't reach and missed. Suddenly, a group of military men came out from behind the trees. The officer pointed his machine gun at the strangers and asked who they were. Liu Bu shouted in panic that a monster was chasing them. The commander of the armed group ordered his subordinates to check the intruders. They were immediately ordered to kneel down and put their hands behind their heads. The military officer radioed that the escaped underexperienced had been found. Immediately afterwards, he requested support. Leaving the unidentified men in the care of a subordinate, the officer ordered the rest of the group to move in for the capture. The soldiers spread out and insisted their assault rifles on the monster that was approaching them at a tremendous speed. After letting the creature get close, the military opened heavy fire on it. 
However, the monster almost immediately moved away and disappeared into the bushes. Meanwhile, the soldiers who remained as warders tied the captives' fingers with clamps. They took the unknown men aside. Then two military men decided to search the mercenary. Under his cloak, they found a strange, shabby doll in a white dress. But still, even the soldiers didn't realize what they were dealing with. At the same time, the main character was making his way through the forest thicket at high speed. After reaching the hillock, he deftly started climbing up the cliff. Xiao Su noticed that when Xiao Jin was still around, the group held each other back, forming a short, stable team. But after she disappeared, the team collapsed as quickly as possible. The guy was glad that Xu Xianchu understood his point, and they decided to split up. The protagonist came to the conclusion that after all, they couldn't trust each other yet. However, Xiao Su wasn't going to return home empty-handed. He decided that he would definitely climb higher and take a look around. Suddenly, numerous footsteps were heard on the cliff. The guy jumped out from behind the trees and saw a crowd of people just above him. They were very well-dressed mercenaries. Xiao Su realized that they were most likely the Qing Consortium's men. He heard someone report on the radio that they had found the experimental facility. After realizing from the report that this support group, the protagonist was surprised that there were still people in such wild places doing experiments. But what amazed him the most was that even so many well-armed people couldn't kill one monster. However, it wasn't that important now. The creature had created chaos with its appearance, and Xiao Su planned to use this opportunity to act stealthily. The boy climbed up the rock and looked around. There was a valley spread out right in front of him that had a lot of buildings in it. It was here that an explosion had occurred not long ago. Going down a little lower, Xiao Su saw a man in scientist clothes sitting next to the mutant's corpse. Using a syringe, he drew blood from the monster's body. The protagonist carefully got closer to the rock. He lurched and began to gaze at everything that was happening. It looked like the Qing Consortium was capturing mutant beasts for later study. However, the hunter's attention was also drawn to the city itself. Looking around, he saw a man standing on the roof of one of the buildings. He was a tall man dressed in snow-white robes. With his hands in his pockets, he stared at the ruined buildings. His face was very wary. He seemed unhappy about something. However, Xiao Su was certain that this person was the one in charge of the entire operation. Still, the picture was very strange. On a normal day, if he saw a man in a white suit wandering around the wilderness, the protagonist would have written him off as a retard. However, this leader at the top of the building felt very confident. Surely this was largely due to the fact that he would not have to go into battle because of his status. The surrounding area was heavily defended, and the number of fighters could reach up to a thousand. It seems that the Qing Consortium intends to find the secret of the mountain that Xu Xianchu was talking about. Either way, the protagonist was confident that as things stood, he was unlikely to be able to fight for what was being unearthed here. He thought there was no point in risking his life for an unknown secret, and it was better to leave things as they were. The guy decided to take a walk around the city and have a good look around. The household items lying around hinted that there had been life here not long ago. A huge city collapsed overnight. Although all the buildings were smashed to pieces, the basic structure was still intact. Xiao Su climbed up on a pile of trash and looked around the streets. One could only imagine how beautiful this city used to be. The main character's attention was drawn to the inscription on the banner. Based on the advertisement, this place used to be called Xiao Yu Kang. Xiao Su thought it sounded a bit mysterious. There were many buildings around it, as if referring back to a once carefree life. There were beauty salons, fast food outlets, a health center, and other places. Still, Xiao Su was a little disappointed that he had risked his life coming all this way to find a strange doll, a QR code, a crappy sign, and this strange city. But suddenly, a very interesting spot caught the eye on the lad. He immediately ran forward and rolled down the rubble below. There was a tobacco shop directly across from it. In the current times, cigarettes and alcohol were rare, scarce resources. Xiao Su realized that if he could find something here, he could become the richest person in the trading city. Rubbing his hands together, he mentally apologized to the consortium for only being interested in mutant beasts and secrets. Walking around the ruins, the protagonist headed for the entrance. Protected by plastic packaging, the tobacco and alcohol should be in good condition. But after getting closer and looking through the broken window, Xiao Su was convinced that all the cigarettes and alcohol inside had already turned to dust. The boy clutched his heart in despair. His dream of becoming the richest man in the world was shattered. He stared embitteredly at this strange city. Xiao Su didn't want to leave this place for nothing. 
If he wasn't meant to take the secret away, he needed to bring something else with him. With these thoughts, the protagonist decided to walk the streets to find something interesting. On the way, he found a store with dolls just like the one they found in the forest. Xiaosu still didn't understand what the thing was for. For a while, he stood beside the doll and stared at it intently. Then the guy grabbed it by the neck and realized that the thing was filled with air inside. The doll also reminded him of Xiao Jin for some reason. He squeezed the scarecrow's neck and her head puffed up. The pressure was too much for the old rubber. A second later, the doll's forehead burst and air rushed out. Exhaling, the protagonist wiped away the sweat and finally realized what these things were for. Then he slowly wove through the streets again, looking for something interesting. The next stop on the way was the pharmacy. Into his hands came a dusty jar labeled Old White Gold. Unscrewing the lid, Xiao Su turned the jar upside down but only strange white rounds sprinkled out. Seeing this, he threw the package on the floor in fury. The boy didn't understand why the people of the old world were such liars. Why write on the jar that there is gold inside when there is nothing there? Suddenly, a great idea popped into the protagonist's head. He remembered Wang Fugui saying that there were stores selling gold behind the wall. This city was very large. Xiao Su decided that it would be the greatest disappointment if there wasn't a store like this here. In the present time, gold is a very weighty currency that does not deteriorate. Therefore, anyone who finds such a store is doomed to be a millionaire for the rest of his days. Meanwhile, in the slums of the trading city, night was also falling. Liu Yuan entered the room with a lantern. He thanked Xiao Yu for taking care of him all this time. The girl replied that it was no problem and asked if his temperature was okay. The boy replied that there was no problem with that. Xiao Yu then sighed and said that she would be curious how Ren Xiaosu was doing now. Liu said that he was confident that his brother was safe. The boy looked at the girl with great respect. He had a fever the other day because of a wish, and Xiao Yu could have taken the money and just left him. However, she didn't do that, and instead helped him just like a real mother. The girl turned around and said that since Liu Yuan had already recovered from his illness, he would have to sit out class tomorrow to make up for the missed homework. The boy squirmed and reminded Xiao Yu that she could keep an eye on him while his brother wasn't home. The girl smiled and said that still the child would do as he was told. Liu Yuan sighed sadly and wished Xiao Yu a good night. It was deep night outside. A large, luminous crescent moon brightly illuminated the sky. Suddenly, footsteps were heard in the yard. Several people climbed over the fence and approached the house. Liu Yuan and Xiao Yu immediately woke up after hearing that there was someone outside. The boy realized by the number of footsteps that there was clearly more than one person there. The girl picked up the dagger and asked Yuan to stay put with a trembling voice. She approached the door warily, holding the knife in front of her. At that moment, the footsteps were already quite close near the entrance. Suddenly, a huge man kicked the door with his foot. The bandit saw the girl with the knife in front of them, who stared at them in amazement and didn't move. Suddenly, she held out her dagger in front of her and ran forward, screaming. One of the bastards tried to hold the girl's arms back, but the blade still partially entered his chest. Seeing this, he shouted and stared angrily at his opponent. The bandits effortlessly fell Xiao Yu to the ground and grabbed her neck. While the girl was screaming and begging for help, a third man with a knife attacked Yuan, who was sitting in the bed. He tried to hit the child, but the child jumped to the side and fell off the bed. Guy does a somersault and lands a leg kick. Liu Yuan remembered these people. These three were just ordinary, idle people in the trading town. But he didn't expect them to actually attack this house next to the school. The boy guessed that because of his recent illness, Xiao Yu had targeted them when she went to buy meat for him to gain some strength. Another bandit kicked the neighboring door, behind which was Teacher Zhang's room. When the old man heard the noise, he got up and got dressed. However, he was still taken by surprise. The robber pulled a knife on him and said that he hadn't liked this guy for a long time. The bandits were sure that the teacher must have a lot of valuable things. Deciding that the pleasantries were over, the raider attacked the child with a knife. Yuan realized that these bastards were even willing to kill the teacher so that no one would know who did it. The next instant, a shot suddenly rang out in the house. The bandit who ran at Yuan looked at his stomach in amazement. There was a red hole gaping in his stomach just above his chest. Then another shot rang out and the bulky man fell dead. The other bandits looked at the child fearfully, not realizing where he had gotten the weapon from. They immediately jumped to their feet and rushed to run. Liu Yuan turned around and realized that he didn't have much time. The boy immediately began shooting the fleeing raiders in the back. One shot each was enough for both thugs to fall to the ground. The robbers, who were in the next room, 
saw the body of their accomplice fall through the doorway. Immediately after that, a child appeared on the street with a gun in his hands. Seeing that the enemy was armed, the bandits immediately began to run away in different directions. Without wasting any time, Yuan opened fire at the backs of the fleeing people. The remaining two assassins also fell to the ground. The stunned teacher looked at all of this, not knowing how to react. He knew that Xiao Su was quite a ruthless person, but he didn't think that Liu Yuan would be like his brother. Plus, it was the first time he'd ever seen a kid kill someone in a market town, and with a gun too. Afterward, he saw the boy's hands convulsively clutching the gun. The disembodied child was trembling. He was still standing in the same position in which he had killed the last two people, and couldn't believe what he had done. Only the screams of the frightened Xiao Yu made him slowly start to come to his senses. The girl hugged Yuan and began to comfort him, telling him that it was already over. Then a teacher approached the frightened boys. He asked if it was really Ren Xiaosu who had left the gun. After that, Mr. Zhang understood why his young disciple was going into the wilderness. Yuan nodded and said that he wanted to make sure that no one would find the gun. However, he didn't even think about what would happen right after he picked up the gun. The child promised the teacher that they would leave town right away so as not to inconvenience the neighbor. However, Mr. Zhang reminded them that there was nowhere else for them to go now, as the wolves had returned and the outer lands were not safe. Then he suddenly asked the neighbors not to worry and promised that he would fix everything. Yuan looked at the teacher incredulously. He didn't understand how something like this could be settled. Some time passed, and a group of several armed men were heading towards Ren Xiaosu's house with quick steps. Wang Kunyan, who was leading the detention squad, was certain that this particular boy was the only one in this trading town who had the ability and courage to touch a weapon. The mercenaries were almost immediately caught up by Wang Fugui. He asked the commander that there must have been some misunderstanding. However, the group leader said that this place already smelled of crime. He was certain that Wang Dongyang had been killed by Ren Xiaoshu. The merchant tried to justify himself by saying that Mr. Military Man was also not on good terms with the factory manager. But suddenly, the mercenary stopped being nice to the old man. He put a gun to Wang Fugui's head and ordered him to get out. Wang Dongyang shouted that he was not as corrupt as the other people outside the wall. After that, the mercenary pointed his subordinates to the building and ordered them to arrest the killer's relatives. He really wanted to see how Ren Xiaosu would explain himself when he returned. But suddenly, a teacher came out to meet the mercenaries. He calmly stood in the doorway and calmly asked the mercenaries to stop. Then he suddenly took out a letter from his pocket and held it out to the officer, saying that this errand should be taken to the fortress and told Fatty Luo to come here. The soldiers stood silently and did nothing. Mr. Zhang asked Wang Dongyang to hurry up and said that this was no longer something an officer could handle. The military was very much surprised that some slum school teacher called Mr. Lo a fat man. Wang Dongyang, still holding the merchant at gunpoint, asked what Zhang wanted to accomplish by this. As he came closer, he asked Jinling in a friendly manner, did he really think that some card would help him get rid of them? The old man remained silent, and Wang Dongyang disdainfully snatched the sheet from him. The officer held the card up to his face. It turned out to be an ID card in the name of a teacher. But the strangest thing was that his place of residence was the 178th Fortress. Wang Dongyang, that same person, was horrified when he saw this information. He ordered the soldiers to keep an eye on the teacher and immediately ran towards the exit. The officer jumped into the car and started it. Then, jerking the lever frantically, he pressed the pedal. The car moved abruptly and sped toward the wall. The military ordered the arrestees to stand still and not move and then decided to search them. They took Yuan in their sights and asked where his gun was. However, the boy only looked angrily at the military and refused to say anything. Xiao Yu asked Mr. Zhang if he would be all right. The teacher said that the girls shouldn't worry and everything would be fine. At least they wouldn't dare to do anything to them now. The child apologized to the teacher for the inconvenience they had caused him. Jinling replied that it was the problem of the world they lived in, and he, on the contrary, should thank his student for saving them. Suddenly, Yuan asked what Mr. Zhang did before teaching. The old man replied that at one time he had been a military man. Then the boy asked why the gentleman had ceased to be. Jinling sadly looked straight in front of him and said that war couldn't save humanity. He originally chose Xiao Su as his successor as teacher because he was preparing to leave this city. Jinlin said he still wanted to return to Saibei. The child remembered that this was the northwestern part of the country that they had talked about in class not too long ago.
The teacher explained that the snow and ice had not yet melted in that part of the country. In those places among the vast white expanse, it may seem that the people there are very lonely. Yuan asked Mr. Zhang why he suddenly wanted to return to Saibei. Jinling said the world is starting to change and he needs to be with those he cares so much about. The teacher sat down and reassured the student, saying that nothing would be done to him. He said the most the military could do was to send him back to the 178th fortress. Meanwhile, Wang Dongyang had already arrived at the rich area of the fortress. He handed the teacher's ID card to his boss, who took a long look at the card. Suddenly the fat man asked where this old man lived and ordered him to take him there. After a short while, Wang Dongyang and his boss rode through the gate together in an armored car. Fatty Luo sitting in the back seat picked up the phone and called someone. After the other party picked up the phone, he said that Zhang Jinling was here. He explained that he wasn't completely sure yet, but asked if he should kill this teacher. The fat man still didn't believe that this old man had decided to hide at his place. The interlocutor was very surprised at Mr. Lo's zeal. The interlocutor was very surprised at Mr. Lo's zeal, but he argued that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The guy in the white suit asked the fat man if he was sure that after killing Jinling, the soldiers of the 178th Fortress would leave him alone. Lo explained that he could do it a little more stealthily. However, the interlocutor reminded him that there were no impenetrable walls in this world. He suggested sending the old man back to the 178th Fortress. The guy in the white shirt explained that this Jinling would die anyway, however, he should in no way suffer at the hands of the Qing family. In the meantime, let someone else have a headache. Suddenly, the interlocutor asked the fat man if a vagrant named Ren Xiao Su lived in his neighborhood. Mr. Luo realized that he was talking about the guy selling medicine. He said he had a healer by that name. Then the fat man asked if his interlocutor had found something in the mountains. The fat man then asked if he had found anything in the mountains. The guy in the white suit that they now have Ren Xiao Su selling medicine, a singer named Luo Xinyu. The only thing left is to find out who Yang Xiao Jin is. The fat man replied that he didn't know a girl with that name. The interlocutor then asked him how long Luo Xinyu had been a singer in the fortress and whether Ren Xiao Su had any relatives. The boss replied that his girl has been a local celebrity for like two years now. Suddenly, Wang Dongyang interjected into the conversation, saying that Xiao Su has a brother named Yuan, and also Zhang Jinling is his friend and teacher. The guy in white was surprised that such a coincidence could happen. He then said that the fat man could do as he knew, except for this healer, Xiao Su's brother. The call ended. Taking the phone away from his ear, the guy took a deep breath and looked up at the stars with a smile. He then turned around and introduced himself as King Zhen, Luolan's younger brother and a member of the Qing family consortium. He grinned and said he was very happy to meet his captives. Luo Xinyu glared angrily at the strange type. She realized that there was no easy way out of this situation. Moving closer, Zhen asked the captives to tell more about the other three people. He was interested in Ren Xiaosu, Yang Xiaojin, and Xu Xiangchu. In addition, he noted that all of these names sounded quite similar. So he was interested in all the connections between the members of the squad. Liu Bu shouted that they all had nothing to do with each other. The mercenary immediately put out the information that Xu Xianchu was a superhuman with the ability to release a shadow from his body. At the same time, this matter could even stop a bullet. He also said that he didn't know much about Yang Xiaojin. However, the soldier then added that the thing they should fear the most was Ren Xiaosu. King Zhen was surprised by this information. He had assumed that the superhuman would have the most problems. The boss asked why that was the case. Luo Xinyu asked if it was all because that boy could make anyone angry. However, the alarmist replied that this was not the case and explained that Ren Xiaosu was stronger than they thought. Liu Bu recalled the moment when they were fleeing from the swarm of bugs in the canyon. However, this guy was the only one who turned around and ran in the opposite direction. The mercenary paused to see if the madman would return, and he actually succeeded in doing so. Xiao Su ran away, taking the wounded man with him. Liu Bu argued that based on the fact that this guide ran so fast with a human on his arm, it could also be said that he was also superhuman. However, no one was convinced by these arguments. King Zhen sighed and asked if there was any more information. The mercenary said that was all for now, however, he would tell him later if he remembered anything. After that, the boss ordered the subordinate to write everything down in a notebook. Xu Xiangchu, a not fully developed superhuman, has a risk factor of Si Ren Xiao Su, 
a suspected superhuman with enhanced physical strength. Risk factor F. Afterward, other soldiers took the captives under their arms. The mercenaries started shouting that they were just ordinary people who were up to nothing and posed no threat. However, King Zhen smiled and said that he knew that, and it had nothing to do with them. Liu Bu fearfully asked what they were going to do with them. The boss said he wanted to take the captives with him, but those should try not to be surprised. The ringleader and the others climbed down from the tall building below. Here, the guards were already waiting for them. King Zhen ordered a commander named Shu Man to gather a group to find Ren Xiao Su, Yang Xiao Jin, and Shu Xianchu. The order had to be carried out before 12 o'clock at night. After that, the small detachment separated from the main group. A frightened Liu Bu kept asking where they were going. However, the boss didn't turn around, saying that they would find out for themselves now. Sometime later, they reached a car near which the military were standing. The head ordered his subordinates to remove the cloth from the cage. What the captives saw made their whole bodies shudder. A huge monster with gray skin lay before them. It didn't look like any other creature. However, its teeth were very similar to human teeth. The mercenary who noticed this began to mutter that Shu's body bore the same teeth marks. King Zhen realized that these people were also familiar with this monster. He asked if they had seen this monster in action. The girl stared fearfully at the creature, not believing what was happening. The group boss explained that this monster was a product of the pre-catastrophic period. They had only recently learned of its existence. Within the ranks of his group, the creature should be referred to as a test subject. Luo Xinyu asked what this meant. King Zhen suggested that the monster in question had most likely recently escaped from the walls of some laboratory. They greatly wondered how these specimens had survived to the present day, for it is a living specimen. The singer asked if they came here for this sample to find the lab that once held these test subjects captive. The boss said he didn't know if the captives knew or not, but multicellular organisms, such as humans, use cell division as the basis for growth and reproduction. If everything in this world were normal, one would assume that cell division should be endless. But the strange thing is that human cells stop at an average of 50 divisions, after which there is irreversible decay. That is why man's life is limited. Eventually, he grows old and dies. However, this does not mean that this law of nature cannot be changed. Their consortium suspected that this lab was developing technology to force cells to divide indefinitely, thereby increasing the body's metabolic cycle and longevity. However, the local scientists did not expect that by doing this, they would create monstrous and inhuman creatures. These human-modified test subjects have completely lost their sanity as human beings. However, their physical strength and agility are far superior to ordinary humans. With those words, he threw the monster a gun. The creature immediately grabbed the weapon and shredded it with its powerful teeth. King Jen explained that they had to use five battle groups and sacrifice many of their men to capture at least one object alive. Immediately, he ordered the secretary to record that the monster's teeth were developed. Its pupils were narrow. The creature had a habit of moving on all fours and was no longer human. The Qing Consortium has suspicions that the subject is the product of genetic modification. The laboratory is believed to have been a secret experimental facility of the Flame Source Company before the disaster. Hearing the familiar name, Luo Xinyu thought that this strange company was somehow involved here again. It looked like there was no one to stop the Qing Consortium now. The only thing left to do was to wait to see if they could get hold of this technology. The bloody monster had a habit of leaning very heavily on the ground. He glared angrily at the people and growled. The boss ordered a subordinate to shine flashlights on the creature. The officer gave the command, and the man on the roof turned on the searchlight. Unfolding the device, he aimed a powerful beam of light at the cage. Once caught in the lighting, the monster immediately began to close its hand. The way he squinted and diligently shielded himself from the light supported the theory that he hunted at night. The farther the spotlight beam traveled across the cage, the farther away the monster crawled. King Zhen frustratedly stated that the subject had photophobia. The military man said there were two possible causes of photophobia. First, it could have been a weakness in the personality that was once human, and it was now reflected in what it is now. Second, it could have been a gene-edited model of the beast. The boss immediately ordered that the assault teams should quietly shoot off the remaining monsters without casualties, as they only needed one specimen to study. But what Ching Zhen didn't understand the most was why this monster, with its light fear, was recently active during the daytime. Perhaps the subject was evolving, or perhaps something had attracted him and made him come out in broad daylight. 
and it was quite likely that it had something to do with those three hunters. Meanwhile, the first group was actively moving around the city. Shu Man was warily looking around when he was suddenly called over the radio. The boss was interested in the results of the ongoing operation. The leader of the group explained that so far, there were no leads, and some were actively searching. Meanwhile, Ren Xiao Su came to one of the city's best stores. The guy stood near the entrance and couldn't believe that once upon a time, people could build something so grand just to buy food here. Judging from the inscription, this place was called Lu Wang's Department Store. Xiao Su thought it was likely that there was a gold store nearby. Once inside, all he could see were huge shelves of clutter. Suddenly, the main character accidentally touches something with his cloak. They were children's toys. Underneath them was a plaque that read, Journey to the West. The boy realized that this was the title of the book that Xu Xianchu was talking about. However, this still didn't solve the problem of finding a gold store either. After passing by several useless shops, Xiao Su finally found what he was looking for. It was Cho Xiu Fuk's jewelry store. Once inside, he saw glass display cases, behind which lay an array of jewelry. However, a great many of them were black. The protagonist remembered that silver usually changes color during oxidation. With that thought, he tossed the bracelet away. That trinket wouldn't be worth anything anyway. After wandering around the store, he finally found the gold bars. There were so many jewels here that thanks to them, he and his loved ones could live for several more decades. However, now we had to think about how to carry it all home. The main character looked at the jewelry in his hands and a great idea came to him. He took some bracelets and rings and started squeezing them. After a minute of labor, he already had a lump of gold jewelry in his hand. Now it could be put into the palace vault. There was so little room, however, that the door had trouble closing. The rest of the jewels had to be thrown into the cloak, turning it into a makeshift sack. Suddenly, Xiao Su heard many quick footsteps outside. The guy just thought about the fact that he was no longer in any danger. Past the jewelry store, a column of men armed with assault rifles marched down the street. Xiao Su hid behind the wall and began to watch the military closely. If they suddenly decided to cordon off the area, he wouldn't be able to escape. However, it was doubly strange, for surely the Qing fighters didn't need to launch a patrol here. Their main area of operation was in a completely different direction. In addition, the squad was very large in number. This could well indicate that some danger was present nearby. Shu Man and a few fighters went inside to check out the department store. His attention was almost immediately drawn to the children's toys. At first, he only stared blankly in the direction of the objects without giving them much thought. But then the commander's gaze changed, and he realized he was on the right track. Lurking behind the wall, the protagonist watched the squad move off to the side. There was silence outside, and the group of military men gradually began to leave the department store. However, all of this was a showy cover. In reality, Shu Man led some of the fighters behind him and did not completely leave the store. The military man asked the suspicious commander in a whisper what was wrong. Shu Man explained that he had searched this store back in the middle of the previous day. That was also when he had memorized those toys for no reason. But last time, the monk had been riding a white horse with a monkey standing next to him. Now someone had switched them around. The officer was sure there was someone inside this department store. Perhaps this unknown person was still hiding here. Not wanting to take any chances, he immediately ordered reinforcements to surround the area. Shu Man then ordered the assault team to move forward. Several small squads cordoned off the main exits from the room. The main character, who was still in the department store, realized that he was locked inside. The Qing soldiers stood near the exits in large, dense groups. Xiao Su could hear this quietly. The guy was starting to panic badly. He couldn't understand why those bastards had decided to turn back. The protagonist leaned against the wall. At this moment, the realization came to him that Liu Bu and the others must have revealed his existence to the Qing Consortium. And if that was the case, then this entire large group had not come for some monster, but for him. Contemplating what to do next, Xiao Su looked down dejectedly. He realized there was no way he was going to get out of here with such a huge bag. Pet the cat! <coughs> Oh, <laughs>